Council Member Newsom. Present. Council Member Brown is currently absent. Uh, Watkins is absent. Bruner? Present. Calentari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Having established a quorum, uh, we will move on to... Recording in progress. All good. Pleased to hear. Uh, we will uh, move to public comment concerning our closed session agenda. For folks who are unfamiliar with that, we will be going into closed session to discuss matters that could be related to personnel, litigation, that kind of thing. And uh, we will be then coming back out of closed session, making any reports that are necessary by our city attorney. But this would be the opportunity for anyone to uh, who is with us either in chambers or online uh, to make comment on our closed session agenda. The items we will be discussing are enumerated in the council's agenda, both online and uh, in written format. Let me ask anyone with us in chambers, seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Nobody online, no. No one online. So we will bring a close to the public comment. Uh, what we will be doing now is we will be adjourning into that closed session that I mentioned. We will come out and be back in regular session, open session, at 12.30 or later, no earlier than 12.30. We now stand in to uh, recess into closed session. <laughs> the hour of 1230 having arrived, Santa Cruz City Council will be back in session and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Councilmember Watkins is currently absent. Bruner? Present. Helen Terry Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. This quorum having been established, we will proceed to oral communications. This will be the opportunity for anyone to address the City Council on a matter not on our agenda today, but under our jurisdiction, generally speaking. And we will recognize speakers for up to two minutes. We will alternate in the event that there are folks online who wish, wish to participate in oral communications. We'll alternate back and forth by between folks here in the council chambers and folks online. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Sibley Simon from New Way Homes and Workbench. And sometimes some of you have asked for suggestions on uh, what the city could do around housing and housing crisis. And I have one I wanted to share, which is, uh, you know, it's one of the first times in a long time that there are multiple big construction projects going on in Santa Cruz. And based on applications, we'd expect that's going to continue for quite some time. And it's come to my attention that um, the building department staff doesn't have enough capacity to do inspections at the rate really required when this is going on. Um, so some of our staff who have managed large construction projects in other parts of the Bay Area um, have experienced where, you know, if you're building 200 units, there might be a period in construction uh, toward the height of it where you've got a city inspector on site six hours a day, five days a week, because there's so many things to check off. And it's my understanding, for example, one of the larger projects in Santa Cruz today, the developer says that there's going to be about two months longer time frame to the completion of that construction project because of need for more uh, rapid inspections by the city. And, and my point of bringing this up now is that it's, we're going to be going into budget season. And also, that um, the other thing I would say is that uh, projects pay for this. You pay for staff time with inspections. So I don't think it's necessarily a huge uh, ask. And it's something maybe you want to get ahead on planning, if the building department isn't already doing it, I just thought of this one to come share it, that, um, you know, that's really expensive for projects to take any number of weeks longer in construction, huge cost. So they'd be happy to pay for, you know, inspectors to spend more time more frequently on site and move projects forward. So I just want to think, I think that's a part of uh, building department planning that's needed because there just hasn't needed to be a lot of staff in the past in Santa Cruz who had multifamily inspection experience. Thanks a lot. Thank, 
Thank you very much, and thank you for all the good work you do to increase housing affordability in the city. We appreciate it, sir. Do we have anyone online? Why don't we take the next person online? Good afternoon, and welcome to the city council. Yeah, oh yeah, hey, this is Garrett. After last meeting, I felt really bad for the council. While I have given the council myself some attitude my, you know, over the last five years, going on six, I have never witnessed such organized, outrageous behavior as I witnessed last meeting by that mob who employed intimidation and suggested others should fear and acted in violent fashion toward a council and others who gave everyone beyond words more than time to express their free speech rights, no matter how one-sided or illogical or senseless their aims, considering the reality is the council is powerless to do anything of substance in the Israeli-Hamas conflict. They wanted to us usurp the council authority to promote their ideological aims, and those, in my opinion, have little to do with children bombed, but to hijack any issue to raise the level of chaos in our city and to make it unstable while destroying Western values. I commend the council on their actions. Well, maybe not the one-sided original ceasefire resolution, but the patience, the open forum, and the promotion of peace, the majority of you thoroughly and finally expressed. You deserve a shorter meeting. I condemn the DSA and all who support them by those means, the USC woke, uh, UCSC woke, indoctrinated, and their groomers and any others who supported or perpetrated that disgraceful display last meeting. Perhaps those rude people holding up fake dead babies and bodies in effigy thought they were at a Halloween party or an addition for weekend dead Bernies, or perhaps they were just acting out the usual so-called social justice adoptive grievance mongering ugly scene du jour, but it was purposely shocking and nowhere near civilized. I feel sorry for you and all who are offended, afraid, threatened, or terrified by it that had no place here. I wish you a productive, peaceful meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address us under oral communications? The former mayor, city council member, and all around civic <laughs> engagement. As today is I'm, I'm going to need just, just as unfamiliar as you are with this. <laughs> you would, yes, thank you. I was looking for it. <laughs> um, the hat today is as a member of the committee for a safe, healthy Santa Cruz .com, and that, as you all know, is the combined campaign between the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz to pass revenue measures that will sustain and improve the essential services that we need. And I have very exciting news for you. Um, we have just received our yard signs, <laughs> and <laughs> we have 400 of them. And as you also know, Getting a campaign going, early campaign season, ballots will drop in two weeks. A lot of people don't even know there's an election, and they don't know how important this is for both the city and the county. So I'm hoping that each of you will, I believe you've all supported this, um, find a way to grab a bunch of these, get them around your neighborhood, promote them to your friends. I know some of you are already doing this. You know how to get a hold of me, but for those of you who are seeing this and don't, it's safehealthysantacruz.com. Um, log on, endorse, grab a yard sign, support walk districts. Okay, thank you all. Well, thank you so much. You, your leadership over the years on so many issues and this in particular, we greatly appreciate it. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone else online? Let's take the next person online. Person online? Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, I would like to express my concern about California State Assembly Bill 873, which requires California students to engage in a potentially problematic curriculum in media literacy. I, I'm attentive, I, I, I believe, to the question of jurisdiction, and I know that you guys already have tons some stuff on your plate and uh, in the email that i've sent to mayor keely i've uh, sent it just a couple things i found online about the importance of collaboration between city councils and school boards and how that can be something very positive and collaborative for for the community I, i'm concerned um and i'm i'm just a 
retired person with a lot of time on my hands to follow the news and a former educator, but I also have um, some expertise in the fake news. It's something I've published in my, on my, in my scholarly work. And I'm concerned with uh, California Assembly Bill 873 sponsored by Mark Berman, because as I've read in the LA Times, which I've included in the email, there's a specific reference to um, uh, treating issues around uh, vaccine conspiracies or the events of January. Mm -hmm. Sixth, um, as as um, misinformation or dangerous malinformation, and I realize these are contentious issues, but I think that these are always um, in times like these where things have yet to be adjudicated. It's a it's a teaching moment, and there's a, a great danger in treating something in a in a doctrinaire way. And you know, every day we find uh, news that comes up. The CDC has it's published today in the Epoch Times as reported things as misinformation, which were factual. And there is basically what Matt Taibbi, the journalist, has called a censorship industrial complex. And so as this comes up in the future, I, I hope that you'll be attentive to maybe giving a view to the dangers here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else who's with us in chambers wish to provide comment under oral communication? This would be your opportunity to do so. Do we have anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No. Sir, do you wish to address us under oral communication? This would be your opportunity. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As you remember, I was here a week ago. And I said, you who sit here, you are the ones that have to fine tune what it is in Santa Cruz to take on one block in one neighborhood. So between that two minutes and today, did anybody do research on what it would be like in that particular invitation? And if not, I haven't sent you emails, but I do know, Fred, I saw you on stage, and you know what Sentinel said. We got to all come together. So those that know me know I don't get paid. I live on 16000 a year. But if you come to my house where I have an office, and we sit down, and I'll give you Starbucks coffee, promise. I'm Richard Lewis, for you who don't know me, and I won't mention who she is, but I believe in her, and I know everybody's running to be elected. We've got to change what it is, starting with the rainbow vets, to serve vets. So I know someday, please put on the agenda a revisit to the kind of youth commission that only the city of Santa Cruz could make with empowerment. And I appreciate what it is that it, it's going to come from family. And those who don't know me know my brothers, Bob and Jack, and Jack's in Brazil. If we can all come together, if you write down Victory Outreach, you'll see a pastor from Watsonville. Don't reinvent the wheel, because they can take, I saw the chief and the assistant out there, they take kids that have been on probation and parole, and they changed their lives. So I didn't know if there's still time left. Aha, I did good. <laughs> and Fred, now you remember my first name. Yes. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. We appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? OK, anyone else who's in council? Chambers today wish to address us under oral communication. Last call. Thank you very much. We are finished with oral communication. We are on to agenda item number three. This is a age-friendly city designation. Uh, Kelly Mercer Leboff, uh, the recreation coordinator, will make a presentation. Good afternoon and welcome. Hello. And thank you for your good work. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Mercer Lebov. I'm the Senior Programs Coordinator for the City of Santa Cruz, and I have the privilege each day to design programming for the senior population over at the London Nelson Community Center and to partner with agencies throughout the, the county to support our seniors. 
I wanted to provide a brief update on the activities of the Aging Committee since I last presented in May. Now, as a reminder, by 2030, 10.8 million Californians will be an older adult, making up one in four of the state's population. Right here in Santa Cruz County, that estimate is one in three. And by 2034, in just 10 years, the United States will, for the first time ever, be a country comprised of more older adults than children. Now, we have a rapidly growing senior population that we need to start preparing for. The sooner we start com uh, community planning with an age-friendly lens, the sooner people of all ages will benefit from the adoption of policies and programs that make neighborhoods walkable, that featured key transportation options, that enable access to key services, and provide opportunities to participate in community activities and support housing that's affordable and adaptable. So today we're gonna to be reviewing the local policy initiatives that are creating these opportunities to assess the landscape of aging right here in our region. I'll update you on the City of Santa Cruz's Aging Committee activities, the Master Plan on Aging Governance Group, and the AgeWell Santa Cruz County Survey, so without further ado, let's get started. So because of these anticipated surges in the senior population, there are two parallel aging initiatives. In 2020, Governor Newsom launched the California's Master Plan on Aging with five goals for 2030. The Master Plan on Aging has mobilized our region, the County of Santa Cruz, um, City of Capitola, Watsonville, Scotts Valley, to come up, and the Seniors Council and the Area Agency on Aging to work together to come up with a localized playbook. And meanwhile, the Age-Friendly Network designation is actually the U.S. affiliate of the World Health Organization's Global Network for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities, and it's a public commitment to a five-year program cycle that can be entered at any time. And now once in the network, there's a plethora of resources to help you create and implement an action plan. Now many of the jurisdictions that are working together for the master plan on aging are also applying for the age-friendly designation. And I'm happy to share that as of August 30th, uh, 2023, the city of Santa Cruz has become an age-friendly designated city. <laughs> So I just want to acknowledge the City of Santa Cruz's Aging Committee for their contributions to our successful application and now designation. <laughs> yeah, we can do a round of applause. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> okay, but as you might have anticipated, this is where the real work begins. We have now entered the five-year program cycle. We're just past the enrollment phase. We formed a citywide committee. Uh, uh, committee, which will in, be including older adults in all stages of the age-friendly planning and implementation process. And now that we're enrolled in the network, a community has up to two years to complete a community needs assessment and develop an action plan based on the assessment results and the needs identified that influence the health and quality of life of older adults. Now, since both the master plan on aging and the age-friendly network both have a community needs assessment. Um, the county has hired Clarity Social Research Group to conduct this community needs assessment. Since June 12th, they have been working with a steering committee of Santa Cruz County residents with diverse backgrounds who have a deep knowledge of community needs and resources, either through service or lived experience, to help guide and shape the survey. They have also conducted free, three focus groups to help inform the strategy. So you might be wondering, well, what is that survey going to be covering? Well, there's a survey and a flyer coming your way right now. But in addition to collecting, oh yeah, do you want to switch the slide? In addition to collecting basic demographic information, our areas of investigation include housing. What are the types available? How suitable is the housing? How affordable is the housing? And the challenges of maintaining houses. Uh, transportation. What kind is being used? What is the cost, the accessibility, reliability, and frequency? What are the need for help and services of our residents? What type of help do people need? What existing services do they use? And do they have to go outside of Santa Cruz to get those services? Caregiving. How, what is their access to caregivers? What types of care is needed? The degree of difficulty in caring? The quantity and quality of caregivers in our community? 
Ratings of health. How easy is it to make an appointment with your doctor? How would they rate their quality of health? And what is the degree of health challenges that they face? Um, community resources and social engagement. What is the amount of social contact they have with someone? Do they know who their neighbors are? And how would they rate their community overall? Safety preparedness and emergency preparedness. How prepared are our residents in the face of elder and financial abuse, natural disasters, and area crimes? What is their overall satisfaction with their community, and how are they planning their future right here in Santa Cruz? So the Age Well Santa Cruz County Survey is currently live uh, through the end of March. It's available in English, Spanish, large, and large font, both online and paper versions. It only takes about 10 to 12 minutes to complete. Now, residents of Santa Cruz County who are at least 40 years of age will be surveyed. And that younger age point allows us to better understand the needs of caregivers, as well as our residents' plan for aging in our community. And while there have been other efforts to gather information about aging, the California Department of Aging survey, this survey is much more localized. And it really focuses on the steering committees, areas of investigations, and the needs expressed in a series of focus groups. And in order to get the broadest representation of residents possible, we're pursuing a boots on the ground approach. Uh, steering committee members have created a survey outreach and recruitment plan, and they're recruiting community partners to host the survey, businesses and other partners to publicize the survey. And this approach allows us to include a diversity of voices so that a broader palette of needs is uh, gathered. So you're probably like, all right, Kelly, I get it. How can I help? Well. <laughs> Um, first off, if you are over 40 and you live within the county of Santa Cruz, you can complete the survey. You can also help um, hang one of those flyers up. Um, and in some locations, such as cafes and laundromats, doctors and dentist offices, there'll be posted flyers with those QR codes or the survey links or a request for a paper survey to be mailed to you. In other locations, we'll have a sign, a stack of papers, and a return box like this one. And in more loca engaged locations, we'll have all the above materials and someone like me helping people complete the survey. Um, we have a robust list of 150 partners, including community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, local businesses, and of course, government agencies for survey outreach. And if you have a location that you want to make sure is on our list, please let me know. And so if you see the Age Well Santa Cruz County survey out in the world between now and March 31st, please encourage responses. We'll have access to the information specific to the city of Santa Cruz, which will help us create our citywide action plan. So we look forward to keeping you updated in the age-friendly designation process for the city of Santa Cruz, and we invite you to join in on these efforts. And if you'd like to learn more about this process and all the amazing ways we're can currently keeping our seniors active, engaged, and connected to their community through recreation, education, and technology over at the London Nelson Community Center, please don't hesitate to contact me or go to our website, cityofsantacruz.com forward slash seniors. Do you have any questions for me? Well, thank you so very much. Very comprehensive, good plan going forward. Thank you for coming here to publicize this. I suspect that those council members who, like myself, who are approaching middle age, uh, will, uh, <laughs> it's a good thing to think about our future. So thank you very much. Let me ask if there are more serious conversations or comments here. Ms. Bruner. I just have a quick comment. And um, thank you for providing the uh, survey in print form and in electronic form in Spanish. and across um, some of the questions that really dive into demographics. Mm -hmm. That data is very important in how we inform and shape our policies and how we can um, know how to best support our community, our residents, and um, our aging population. And I'm so excited for this. And this is great work. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Other comments? Ms. Brown? Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation and for all of your work uh, to move us through, uh, as a city, the application process and um, really develop those networks 
to think about how we're going to use the information that comes out of the survey. I really, it's, it's a great tool. I've, I've seen it, I've been working um, with it and with the uh, folks at the county and as your representative to the Area Agency on Aging, um, you know, obviously this is something we've been promoting for a long time. Um, so, just want to thank you for that. It's it's great to um, think about the way this tool can be the ways this tool can be used. Um, I want to also just thank Supervisor McPherson in this case uh, for really jumpstarting the effort to get some resources at the county level to be able to um, support other jurisdictions and network us so that we really are moving forward together. It's a, it's a great time to be thinking about, um, you know, funding, you know, how we're going to use funding for and, and what kinds of programs are needed for serving uh, the senior population, our aging population. And I don't know if I've said this before, but it, one of the conversations we've had in the at the AAA has been um, that you know we've seen a real change in the at the legislative level um, in terms of the the willingness to really make progress on resources through the master plan for aging, and we talk about it um, in the sense that you know we have this this whole uh, cadre of legislators who who are dealing with this with their parents right now. And so often the, you know, those um, legislators who are like my age are, um, are really pushing this forward and there's so much enthusiasm and even in the face of uh, significant uh, budget troubles this year, we are gonna hold pretty steady with this funding and I'm just so thrilled that we have uh, a, a community, we have a space to do this and the resources or some of the resources we need. Um, we'll be having a solution summit to talk through the, a lot of this in May of this year. So look for an announcement about that. Um, and thank you again. Sorry, I went a little long, but I'm just so excited about this. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Thank you so much for being here. Very best wishes to you on this project. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Thank you. We, uh, we are now on item number four. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring February 2nd, 2024 as Rosemary Menard Day in the city of Santa Cruz. I'm so happy they're doing that aging thing because unlike you, Mayor, I'm not middle-aged. <laughs> Exactly. There will be a day. There will <laughs> be a right. day. Uh, Ms. Menard, uh, we're going to do something a little different, which is you and I have had about a year together experience. I'm asking, I'm asking Vice Mayor Golder to actually make this presentation, who's been with you a lot longer, <laughs> through your director work at the Water Department, your interim work as a city manager, work again. I, I will say this very briefly, that uh, I was so happy that by the time I got elected as mayor, the city council and you had laid out all the tracks, all the policies for how it is we have a sustainable water future. That is a remarkable accomplishment and thank you for that. And with that, let me turn it over to the vice mayor. Thank you. And I'm going to be reading parts of this proclamation written by the mayor and, and on behalf of all of us up here. I also just want to thank you for your tremendous contributions to this community. I don't think people realize when they turn on the faucet all of um, what goes into that, right. including being up in the middle of the night when the the landslide takes out the pipeline or making sure that the water's uh, potable and treated, making sure that the electricity is running down at Neary Lagoon so it can get treated. The, your innovation with the um, repumping of the wastewater back into the aquifers was mind blowing to me. And I just really can't thank you enough on behalf of the citizens of this community that you've um, contributed so many years here working for, for us. And so with that, I'll read not all, but parts of this proclamation. So, whereas on January 27th, Rosemary Menard arrived in, I'm sorry, January 27th, 2014, Rosemary Menard arrived in Santa Cruz to assume the role of water director 
following a decades-long career in the water industry with stints in Seattle, Portland, Washoe, Washoe, <laughs> and Reno. Um, whereas Rosemary's commitment to exploring all possibilities in water resources, including recycled water, earned her the character characterization of Rosemary Poppins by a local cartoonist. <laughs> And whereas Rosemary Menard's unique ability to identify and weave together technical policy and community issues allowed for the robust development, prioritization, and implementation of work to meet the water de department and city goals. Rosemary um, is also celebrated for her baking skills that led to the water department throughout through, is that, did I read this right? Baking skills led the water department through the water supply advisory committee process. <laughs> I haven't tasted your baking, but maybe someday. Um, <laughs> successfully achieving the green card vote, adding several pounds to committee members' waistline, <laughs> and establishing a course for water supply reliability for Santa Cruz. And whereas Rosemary brought valued experience to financing utilities to develop long-range financial plan and conduct a cost of service analysis um, and rate setting design that led to the transition and operating budget from 20 million to 40 million and a capital budget that went from 70 million to 360 million. Rosemary never met a process that she did not want to improve <laughs> and a sentence that she could not turn into a paragraph or a concept <laughs> that she could not convert to a confusing chart or graph. <laughs> um, whereas Rosemary led the water department throughout the historic drought, storms, plague, locusts, <laughs> earning Santa Cruz national recognition at one of the most, as one of the most water conserving communities in the world. Now, therefore, I, Renee Golder, on behalf of Mayor Keeley and the council do Hereby proclaim February 2nd, 2024, as Rosemary Renard Day in the city of Santa Cruz, and I encourage all citizens to join me in honoring her, recognizing her contributions of her work to ensure public health and safety, providing clean and safe, reliable supply of water to our community, and wishing her well in her retirement. much and I you know it's, it's great when I've written several of these in my time so having a little fun thing in there uh, is is really <laughs> great and I appreciate the part about uh, short was never my long suit in terms of uh, writing anything so um, I always uh, yeah <laughs> go on and on maybe um, I wanted to say a couple of things uh, one is this has been a really happy arrangement for me I've been here 10 years now and it's been uh, I remember meeting um, uh, Dick Wilson on the street one day after I'd been here, I don't know, a year or so, and uh, him telling me that he'd heard good things about what I was doing. And I said, you know, this was a match made in heaven, was sort of meant to be. It was like bringing the right skills to the, you know, with the right mix of things, of problems and issues. And for me, that's just been, you know, the perfect way to bake a really nice cake and frankly, all the recognition that's been sort of coming my way in the last uh, few months and years has really, you know, been really tasty icing on that lovely cake. So that's been, uh, you know, just really a, a really wonderful way for me to sort of close out a long career where I've had, I think, uh, some really wonderful opportunities to make a difference in communities, which from my point of view is like, that's that's the gold standard, right? You can't have anything better than that. So uh, I really appreciate the people in the water department. They're fabulous. They work so hard. They work behind the scenes. The water comes out under every kind of imaginable circumstance <laughs> that we've had over the last uh, you know, decade that I've been here. And I think that uh, you are really lucky. We are really lucky to have those folks working for us. 
uh, I said in a meeting with them a couple of days ago that, um, you know, I they didn't work for me. I worked for them, and that's really how I feel. So I want to say thank you. I worked for you also, and um, I'm thrilled to be going out on this high note. So thank you. I don't I think there may be other comments. Okay. <laughs> Let me recognize others for comments. Ms. Brown. Um, thank you, Rosemary, for all of your, all of the years you've invested in us, in this city, in our community, um, and for doing it so brilliantly uh, and so with so much care and, um, and understanding, too. Uh, I feel like I'm in a little denial here <laughs> that you're going. It's made a little easier uh, knowing that Heidi Luckenbach is going to carry on in your uh, tradition. Um, but you just the way that you've approached the work, the way you have worked with council members, with your water uh, supply advisory committee and the, and the water commission, um, and uh, to help us understand what, you know, a very complex system. And I, I could say a lot of things about that, but I think folks know what I'm talking about here, um, and, and also to um, so, so competently um, help us understand enough to um, believe that we really are securing our water future. I, that is not just a slogan. Um, what you have done and, and where we're headed is, you know, ecologically sound, sustainable, resilient, and um, just can't tell you how much we'll miss you, um, but really uh, such a well-deserved uh, time for you to uh, take a break. And thank you. Yeah, Appreciate thank it. You. Ms. Kalantari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, yeah, Council Member Brown said it well. You make what's really complex and technical and intricate look as easy as turning on the faucet and having water come out. So That's how it's supposed to be. Right. right? <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, but I also just want to um, thank you for when I, when you were interim um, city manager, I was fairly new to the council. And I want to thank you for really holding down the fort here at the city and with us council members. I just have a memory of calling you at one of my kids' soccer games. Something had come up, and it was a weekend, and I texted and said, it seemed really urgent at the time. I can't even remember what, what the issue was. And I texted you, and you said, I'm, I'm available right now. And so you just you really held us together. You held the city together. And um, you do this all just so gracefully. We will really miss you. And um, just, just thank you for your commitment. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. Councilmember Brunner. Thank you so much, and I um, just want to also acknowledge what stands out most for me is onboarding in 2020 and how um, comprehensive your, your slide presentation and information was and how you were able to break down everything about the water department into bite-sized pieces to really understand the work, the great work that your department um, has done, is doing, the, the historical context and where we're at and going forward in our future and that secure future slogan. Um, so just understanding the, the needs and the, pro the projects that and what it takes um, to have sustainable water. Thank you for your financial uh, wisdom around a long-term plan and the whole rate change that um, happened. And um, also, um, I think uh, the national uh, water recognition was, was mentioned, but also little things like the Work Trades Day that you led and really opening up to the community and to our youth and high school students to really um, connect and get closer to city job opportunities in different fields. 
And um, I think it just speaks volumes about how you think of things holistically and how you're able to articulate it all for us to understand, for the public to understand. Your team is so wonderful. Thank you, Heidi, for taking on and leading forward. Uh, Rosemary, you will be missed, but we are so happy you were here, and I'm honored to have had the, the privilege to, to work with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Ms. Menard, Godspeed, and thank you so much. Great. Thank you. I'll be back. I'll, I'll be, I, I told the, the city manager a while ago that I'll be one of those people calling in on the oral <laughs> communication. So just you wait. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are on item uh, presiding officer announcements. I have no presiding officer announcements. Statements of disqualification. This will be the opportunity for a council member to make a statement if there's an item that you will not be participating in because of a conflict of interest. Do we have any? Seeing and hearing none. We will move to additions and deletions. Ms. Bush, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? We do not. We do not. We are on city attorney report on closed session. Mr. Condotti, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the city council. Uh, this morning, the council met in closed session in the courtyard conference room, convening at 10 a.m. with council member Watkins absent. There were seven items of real property negotiations on this morning's closed session agenda. First two involved uh, potential acquisitions by the water department in connection with some water infrastructure projects. Property addresses are 6,000 La Madrona Drive, Scotts Valley, and 175 Sims Road, um, Santa Cruz. Uh, on those two items, uh, property owners are uh, Scotts Valley Fire Protection District and the Yates Family Trust, respectively. The council received a report from and gave direction to its negotiator on those items. Items three through seven involve uh, city of Santa Cruz owned property, uh, owned properties, and um, specifically uh, negotiations between the city as landlord and uh, different commercial uh, enterprises as tenants. Those properties are 17D Municipal Wharf, uh, tenant Santa Cruz Bay Company, 17A Municipal Wharf, tenant name Surf Life. A property at 501 Upper Park Road in the city of Santa Cruz, tenant name Santa Cruz Shakespeare. Real property at 307 Church Street, also known as the Civic Auditorium. Uh, negotiating parties are the city and the Santa Cruz Symphony. And property at 1020 Cedar Street, uh, city and the negotiating parties are, parties are the city and Atlantis Fantasy World. Uh, there was no reportable action on any of those items. Council also received a report from uh, legal counsel on two potential initiation of litigation uh, items, uh, received a report, gave direction. There was no reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. Uh, we are on council meeting calendar. Ms. Bush, anything you would like to draw to our attention? No changes, no. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we are on the consent agenda. For those of you might be unfamiliar with this, we will be taking up items 6 through 20 on one vote. And so this would be the opportunity. We will start with, uh, we're going to give council members the opportunity to comment or pull an item. Let me start on my left. Ms. Bruner, any items? I had a comment on item nine and 10. Please provide that comment. And- um, Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, go Sorry. <laughs> and 17. And 17, why don't you proceed with those comments? Uh, let's see, let me go to the title, item nine, authorization for application and acceptance of California Interagency Council on homelessness grant funds for encampment resolution funding program round three and um, that I just wanted to say thank you for uh, to city staff for um, seeking out funding opportunities and grants and um, that can help in this area and, of, and 
really help support some of the work and collaborating with the county on this, so thank you. Um, item 10 is severe weather shelter pilot program. And um, this one, I also just wanted to say thank you for um, uh, working to facilitate uh, the operation of a severe weather shelter program for um, our community and people who need it rather than one off something a little more consistent and, and also in collaboration with county services, health and human services. So, um, item 17 this is the Murray Street Bridge seismic retrofit and barrier replacement. Um, and this one is to um, the Murray Street Bridge. This project as was already in um, process way before, I don't know how many years, way before I came on to council. But um, my understanding is that um, because of federal funding and other funding opportunities, um, that we have an opportunity to send out to get uh, another bid that's um, not so high. So I know this work is important, but it's also important to be uh, fiscally responsible in, in this as well. So um, thank you. Mr. Colton, Jari Johnson. Got a few. Um, just quick on 9 and 10, thank you for pointing that out. I just want to point out that we've come so far in our city's response to um, those who are unsheltered and the impacts of having unsheltered um, community members in our community. So just an acknowledgement and a thank you uh, for all the great work. Um, item 11, which is um, state legislation on rental application. I want to thank my colleagues, Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom, who I served on the Housing Element Subcommittee um, for signing on to this. Um, and just a note on this, we, we've been working with COPA and they brought to our attention that there's real disproportionate high fees that are imposed on renters um, during the application process. So I'm hoping the council will support this item and that we can continue to work with our state legislators on bringing something forward. Um, item 15, the tobacco grant award. Um, so I worked in the public health field, and I still do, but I worked on um, uh, education and awareness of youth and use of tobacco and other substances, and, and these have tremendous outcomes. So just want to acknowledge the past work and thank SCPD for their continued commitment to um, divert youth and young adults from use of substances, including harmful substances, including tobacco. And last item that I wanted to comment on is 18. I'm going to butcher this, but it's the um, Anadromous Salmonoid Habitat Conservation Plan. Hopefully I didn't butcher it too much, um, or the HCP. And I think it's fitting, um, we just recognized our water director, Rosemary Menard, um, that this item is here. Just a couple of things. Um, the, the, a tremendous amount of work that's gone into bringing this forward and the regional collaboration that had to take, that that had to um, uh, be part of bringing this work forward. I wanna call out some of those regional partners and give them a thanks. Their resource, Conservation District of Santa Cruz County, the County of Santa Cruz, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the National Marine Fisheries Service, Caltrout, uh, the Monterey Bay Salmon and Trout Project, and I think there are many others. Um, and it's this type of collaboration that is really what contributes to our ability for long-term sustainability outcomes, um, including our city's commitment to a sustainable water resource um, management program and our, and our stewardship uh, of our watersheds. Um, Again, I want to thank the leadership of Rosemary Menard and the entire water department on this huge accomplishment and huge milestone and your continued work on watershed protection and the restoration of watersheds and, and ensuring that the when we turn the faucet, we have high quality water that comes out and that we're protecting the wildlife in our community. Um, like Council Member Brown said, um, securing our water future isn't just the tagline. It really, and everything that we do, including this, um, HCP, it's embodied there. So thank you for your work. You. Madam Vice Mayor, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. 
I um, I want to make a, a quick comment on is was it item 11? Yes. So I thank my council colleagues for uh, bringing this. I too have been having conversations with COPA and others uh, in the who are working with tenants in some of the projects that um, where they're experiencing a, a real high burden uh, related to these rental application fees. And so I, um, I just want to say that we're um, also at the county, there is a conversation about trying to work with our state legislators. So I'm hoping to connect um, with you all or some of you uh, so we can make sure we coordinate those efforts. Uh, thank you for addressing this. It's a, it's a serious problem for low income tenants. Uh, and uh, I mostly wanted to take the time to also speak to item 18, which is the um, recommendation to approve the negative declaration for the uh, anadromous salmonid habitat uh, conservation plan. I live in that world a little, so <laughs> I, um, I just want to say a couple of things. I think it's really appropriate to take a moment, even though it's on our consent agenda, to comment about this, um, and I won't repeat what Councilmember Kalantari Johnson has shared, but also want to add that um, this is a plan that has been more than 20 years in the making. Um, and uh, it really positions the city, um, now that we've, we've made it to this point, to obtain long-term permits, um, providing for long-term regulatory certainty uh, for the operations and maintenance of our water system, um, and for other city functions related to public works and, and the flood control channel from uh, both the Federal National Marine Fisheries Service and the California De Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is, um, I, I can't say how critical this is. Um, having experienced uh, the challenges over the years as a an agricultural water user in my previous life uh, <laughs> to working here at the city, um, <clears throat> also want to point out that Water Department staff uh, member Chris Berry has uh, just really call out the work that he has done. He's led the city's effort to develop and implement uh, a sustainable plan for managing water supply and demonstrating that the city is committed to economic stewardship. It's part of the reason I included that ecologically sound uh, comment earlier when I, we were speaking to Rosemary's retirement. Um, this is really, um, you know, if through a 30 year career, Chris Berry, um, you know, served the city and really deserves a thanks and for his work on this as well. And, and to the whole team, thank you. Um, it, it's, I'm, I'm not always, uh, I'm, I'm often critical of negative declarations off of a CEQA document, but in this case, I'm, I'm just so pleased that we've uh, accomplished this. Um, and I really believe in the, what we're, how we're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Newsom is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I want to uh, very quickly just associate myself with the comments on uh, item number 11 and thank my colleagues, especially Council Member Collatari Johnson, uh, for bringing this forward and uh, for letting us support this and for signing on to this. Uh, I also want to um, very quickly uh, just make a comment on item number 12. I want to thank uh, Director Lipscomb and Housing and Community Development uh, DeWitt for bringing this item forward. Uh, this item will help facilitate the construction of 128 uh, units of much needed affordable housing in our community and will help make the PAC Station North project a reality. Uh, and I'm just really excited to see it. And thank you. Thank you. This will be the opportunity for anyone who is with us at, uh, in our chambers or online to make a comment up to two minutes on all items you may wish to comment upon. So let me ask if there's anyone with us who wishes to comment on any item on the consent agenda. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We'll take the first person online. First person online, good afternoon and welcome to the council meeting. Uh, yes, this is Garrett again. Oh, seriously, Mayor, you're going to cut the uh, comments on uh, like 20 items down to two minutes, please. Anyway, as to item nine, while it is true, you originally set up an expensive three-year homeless response plan without all the money to see it through regardless of that fact. Also true, the state recently has promised additional big dollars will go to the homeless issue and okay, maybe you should get your hands on some of that. However, this item casually mentions hiring someone to write the grant at unknown cost to us without any actual details of the grant presented suggest hiring when not stated here the actual additional numbers of other new personnel at what unknown cost 
and hired only presumably paid for by the grant. It really doesn't say. Also, in an effort not just to continue or address pan, uh, past planned uh, fi financial shortfalls, but to expand homeless services once again without any means to sustain these when uh, this kind of money runs out once again. You should not be so sure the people of Santa Cruz want it turned into an expensive, ever burgeoning cesspool of homeless government dependents, but some the lesser level of support does exist to prevent large homeless encamp encampments, which would be the consensus, I, I think. Uh, it would seem our current response could become more efficient and still continue to do that without the unattainable lofty goals of ending homelessness for the county taking on future larger commitments that are currently unfunded. This is another example of making future expense commitments without knowing uh, future fund availability long term, which is a core fiscal problem resulting in the city's unsustainable fiscal position, resulting constantly in going to the public with initiatives to grow the government bigger and more expensive, despite being told last election that people don't want higher taxes. Where do I get a no on L yard sign? Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Nobody with their hand raised. Last call, please. This will be your opportunity. Good afternoon and welcome. For this opportunity, uh, my name is Merle Craig. I am homeless, um, but um, that's not really why I'm here. I'm here because um, uh, regarding to when I was in custody, there was a civil case. Uh, 26 unlimited real properties, uh, a summons, a minute order stating that I was there when in fact I was incarcerated, okay? I'm not going to have enough time, but uh, in doing let, that... Let me uh, ask you a question. Yes, please. Question. Thank you. So is this, does this address item, one of the items 6 yes, it does. 20, which one? Well, I, I think it does because I'm not going to tell you which one. I don't know, but I, I know that it has to... And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Okay, no problem. Very good. So there's an address. I'll give an example. So civil case, uh, a, a minute order saying I was there when I wasn't. There's the red flag. Sounds outlandish, I know. But um, uh, in my research at the recorder's office, the assessor's office, and the civil uh, uh, department there, um, I found a document stating Merle Craig, the grantee of California Street. When I did that, I went down to the assessor's office. I hid in California Street as a name. Up came uh, uh, 808 uh, River Street, okay? Co connects to 809 Center Street. That's the mailing address. So my concern is, who owns that land? How come I was never summoned? I, I don't know. I have a connection to it somehow, and I need some help. And I, I get a lot of resistance in this town because look who owns it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Ms. Bush, and we still don't have somebody else online, correct? Okay. Last call if anybody would like to address us on the consent agenda. Seen hearing none, a motion to approve items 6 through 20 inclusive would be in order. Councilmember Newsom moves. Is there a second? Count the vice mayor seconds under debate and discussion. Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins is absent. Brenner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Next mayor, up. Mayor, we'll can be... I just ask yes, a quick please, question? Please. I just don't know in process. Uh, normally, we have public comment. The last speaker who spoke, it seemed more of an oral communications um, comment. I wasn't sure what it was relating to on public comment. But I'm wondering if there is somewhere we can direct that person because they're asking for help and they're not understanding of the process. So I'd just like to, just if there's a minute, if someone can help direct where we can direct that person. Is the gentleman still here? Yes. Sir? Yeah. Uh, let me ask uh, the person, I think, either in front of you is Lisa Murphy, an assistant city manager. Perhaps you could have a discussion with her. Ms. Bruner, thank you for bringing that to our attention. We are on items thank 21 you. through 25 inclusive. This is the consent agenda public hearing item. This would be the opportunity to take up uh, for a council member to uh, comment on these items. 
Let me ask council members, do you wish to comment on, and we'll start now on my right with council member Newsom. Items 21 through 25, any comments, sir? Ms. Brown. Nope. Vice Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor. Ms. Colantari Johnson. Ms. Bruner. Is there anyone with us who wishes to comment on one of these public hearing items? Seeing hearing none, let's uh, yes. take the first person online. First person online. Good afternoon. Yes, um, I don't know if this is the time to oh. up, but I wanted to make a comment about the removal of the redwood tree on the corner of Walnut and Lincoln where they intersect and that um, I'm sorry. this is this, oh. we're not on that if, item. If, excuse me. If, if I could ask you be kind enough, uh, we'll be on that item in a matter of minutes, but that's not where we are right now. So if you would just stay online, we'll get back to you uh, in a few minutes when we're on that agenda item. Thank you for your forbearance. Let me ask if there's anyone else who wishes to comment on one of the items on the consent agenda public hearing. This is for item 24, right? Good afternoon. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, council members, my name is Kirsten Paulson with Unite Here Local 19, which represents hotel and food service workers here in Santa Cruz. This LCP amendment paves the way for the development of a high-end hotel on Front Street, the developer of which has written to the Coastal Commission arguing that it should not provide either low-cost accommodations nor pay an in-lieu fee for such. That is inconsistent with the Coastal Act's mandate to protect, encourage, and provide lower-cost accommodations. Rather than increase opportunities for housing, this LCP amendment proposes a meager in-lieu fee for building higher than 50 feet at the hotel project site. <clears throat> and when asked by Coastal Commissioners how this $5 per square foot fee was calculated, the city had little to say. $5 is too low, and we would not be discussing this change today if the Coastal Commission had thought it was adequate. At this extremely low rate, the project would only contribute around $220,000 to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is not enough to build even one unit of the affordable housing the project would claim to fund. Yet, if you had not removed the housing requirement, this project would have required several units of affordable housing. Removing the housing requirement and setting the fee so low drastically reduces the future availability of affordable housing. Even from housing to leisure, Santa Cruz remains wholly unaffordable. Santa Cruz has a higher median rent than San Francisco, and affordable visitor accommodations are extremely hard to come by. Our members who work in Santa Cruz find that they are unable to live where they work, and our members who work, live and work throughout this region find that visiting Santa Cruz is prohibitively expensive. After you approve this LCP amendment today, please carefully consider the cost of allowing a hotel development that provides neither affordable housing nor lower cost visitor accommodations in the face of such unaffordability. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, please say thank you also to uh, Enrique, uh, who I serve on a board with, and uh, for all the advocacy that HERE does for folks at the low end of the wage scale. Thank you very much. Appreciate participation. Let me ask if there's anyone else who wishes to make comment. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone else online? Nobody with their hand up, no. Okay, very good. That completes public comment. A motion to approve the consent public hearing agenda item would be in order and the vice mayor makes such a motion. Do we have a second? Ms. Brown makes a second. Is there debate or discussion on any of these items? Ms. Brown, you are recognized. Just want to make a quick comment and uh, recognize the concerns that were expressed related to one of, uh, mm -hmm. in direct, indirectly related, but um, related to uh, the ordinance change that we've made and the LCP related LCP. Um, I agree that uh, we are not asking enough of uh, the developer in this case in return for um, offering the ability to use density bonus uh, to for commercial purposes. Um, however, I have I supported the uh, change because of the inclusion of uh, the possibility of negotiating uh, some uh, affordable housing contribution, and I support the Coastal Commission's move to uh, change that language to state that the $5 uh, per square foot uh, is a minimum and that uh, future councils on future projects can uh, and, and I believe should negotiate more um, for, for those kinds of um, <laughs> accommodations, let's say. Uh, so in this case, I'm, I'm going to support that, but I, I absolutely support the, the Coastal Commission's response uh, and um, look forward to talking about the particulars of projects in the future. 
Thank you for the comment. Seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins is absent. Bruner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. With Mayor a no Keeley? vote on oh. 22. Is that okay? What? No on 22, but oh, aye on all the rest. And Mayor Kelly. Aye. Your vote is so noted. <laughs> uh, we are on item 26. This is an appeal of a uh, tree removal permit. Uh, as we begin this, uh, we we'll set some ground rules here. Uh, the uh, the matter that is before us has been in front of us on a previous occasion. And when we sit in this capacity, oftentimes the city council sits in kind of three capacities in a single meeting. Those of you that uh, remember the three branches of government, we will sometimes be a legislative body when we adopt an ordinance. Sometimes we're an executive body when we approve a contract. Uh, this is where we sit in our quasi-judicial capacity, is in these kinds of appeals. We have limits on us uh, that are imposed uh, because of the nature of an appeal. Uh, we are bound more by rules of evidence and that kind of thing than we are, generally speaking, uh, when we address an issue. So I know that both the applicant and the appellant are clear about that. I also want to make sure that the public is clear about that as well. So how we will proceed this afternoon, having this item before us on previous occasion, uh, we are going to ask the appellant Mr. Franzen, to open up uh, after a staff presentation in terms of the public participation. You will have up to five, up to five minutes to speak. Uh, we will then provide Ms. Johnson with five minutes as the applicant to speak. We will then, council members will ask questions. We will take public comment at that point for up to three minutes per person matter will be back before the city council and we will take an action so everybody's clear about how we're going to proceed tonight excuse me this afternoon i will recognize uh, both mr condotti and Ms. keady for any opening comments and good afternoon yes thank you mayor keely members of the city council um and I also appreciate the introduction. This is, as you pointed out, a quasi-judicial proceeding in which the council is required to listen to the evidence and make a decision based on the evidence that's presented to you today. Um, there is a standard by which you are, uh, well, first of all, let me say that um, we have a heritage tree ordinance which allows the removal of a tree under our ordinance that's found to pose a threat to other trees or to the community in general pursuant to the criteria and standards that are adopted by the city council by resolution. And under the resolution that the city has adopted uh, containing those criteria and standards and relevant to today's proceedings is the following. Um, excuse me. Uh, heritage tree or shrub, shrub uh, may be altered or removed if uh, it has or is likely to have an adverse effect upon the structural integrity of a building, utility, or public or private right of way. So that's the question that's before the council today. And, and there is the possibility, based on the decision that you make, that a legal challenge could be brought by either the appellants or the uh, applicants uh, based upon that decision. And in the event of such a challenge, the standard of review or the lens through which a court would be required to examine that challenge is called the substantial evidence test. And essentially, the court must find, in order to uphold the decision, that there is substantial evidence in the record to support the council's decision, notwithstanding the fact that there may be a contrary or competing evidence. Um, so the council has the both the uh, ability and the duty to base its decision on substantial evidence. Now, what is substantial evidence? Um, that may be found in staff reports, 
in expert opinions, of which there are several in your packet, and hopefully you've had a chance to review. Also may be found in comments of staff with expertise on the subject. We have today Leslie Keedy, our urban forester, who has several decades of experience in uh, the air, this area. And it also can be based on statements of lay witnesses, individuals who have made personal observations, uh, but only on non-technical issues. You cannot rely on a lay opinion to make a decision that requires expert opinion, like whether or not there's a substantial evidence of a threat to the structural integrity of a building is an issue that requires expert opinion, and a layperson's observation about that does not constitute substantial evidence. Um, let me just point out briefly, you're going to hear from our urban forester who has a lot of information for you to evaluate, and then, of course, from the appellant and the applicant. Um, but what is not relevant to today's discussion are issues that do not go to the heart of the question whether or not there's evidence substantial evidence that the tree, in this case, uh, poses a threat to the structural integrity, primarily of the building. It is obvious to everyone involved that the sidewalk has been severely compromised by this tree. But the recommendation of the staff is based on the, the uh, 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 issue of the structural integrity of the building and, and the roots uh, causing damage to that. What is not at issue is, for instance, the relative worth of the tree compared to the building as an asset to the community. That's not a relevant inquiry for today's purposes. Um, the value of the tree versus the replacement trees required by the city's adopted mitigation requirements in terms of carbon sequestration. That's not a question that's before you. Whether or not the trees that might be used to mitigate the impacts should you grant this uh, application would um, sequester as much carbon as the existing tree. Uh, the salvage value of the lumber that could be recovered from the tree if it is removed, uh, or which came first, the building or the tree. Um, I think there's evidence in the record that fairly conclusively establishes that the building was constructed sometime in, by 1963, meaning that, and the tree was clearly not present at that time, meaning that the tree is probably not older than me. Um, but that's not a relevant inquiry as to whether or not the tree existed before the building was constructed or vice versa. Um, in summary, there's a large amount of information in the record and under the standards that you've established for evaluating tree removals, the question is whether there is substantial evidence that this particular tree uh, has or is likely to have an adverse effect on the structural integrity of the building. Um, again, there's several uh, expert witness reports in your packet and I would also encourage the council after you've, after you've heard the evidence, if you have any questions or need clarifications to look to staff uh, and particularly our urban forester to who can answer those questions. With that, I will turn it over to Ms. Keedy. Thank you, sir. Ms. Keedy, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Leslie Keedy, urban forester. And um, Ms. Bush, do we need to figure out how to do this share on Zoom on the bottom of the screen here? Would you like us to share the presentation on Zoom? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Parks and Recreation Department oversees the Heritage Tree Ordinance, and I, the urban forester, am the inspector for that. Uh, this is not right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, this is the appeal of the Parks and Recreation Commission approval of application 230089 to remove one Coast Redwood. This is the Redwood, looking at it, it sits at the corner of Lincoln and Walnut at 339 Walnut. It is a co-dominant um, or a, a two-stem tree uh, that shares one individual root ball. Findings. The Redwood tree is healthy, vigorous, and of normal size and color. The trunk is sound and solid. Two-stem tree carry, or sharing one root system, no insects or disease present. 
additional findings. The tree has cracked the public sidewalk, curb, gutter, street. The tree has cracked the sidewalk around the fire hydrant, which could possibly impact associated water lines needed for reliable fire response. Uh, sidewalk repair is not the staff rationale for tree removal per, uh, permit issuance. Um, the sidewalk area concerns can be addressed, but it's possible they would reoccur. This is the, on the left, it's the Lincoln Street frontage, and on the right is the actual intersection uh, damage at um, Lincoln and Walnut. This is the Walnut area frontage, and over the last uh, approximately 10 months or so that this discussion's been going on, uh, the sidewalk damage along the Walnut frontage has actually gotten worse. Uh, largely because of the volume of rain last winter. Trees are growing very quickly still. And um, once the water gets into the cracks, then the roots exploit those defects and grow larger and more robust with um, more moisture getting to them. This is the street damage and the curb area. Findings, tree roots are in contact with the building foundation and brick veneer, causing cracks and damage to both. Roots are causing sewer and utility damage. Roots have cracked the wood framing and lifted the mud sill off of the foundation of the apartment. There is past evidence of a sewer leak under the home caused from the tree. The building damage, in my opinion, cannot be mitigated through root pruning. This is not the brick veneer on the outside. This is looking at the corner of the building from the Lincoln frontage, and you can see exterior cracks in the foundation. I climbed under the home or the apartment into the narrow crawl space and was able to personally view the cracks in the foundation from the interior of the building. And so you can see there's two notable cracks in that area and small associated cracks that are adjacent to those major cracks. This is uh, the wood framing. You can see that pressure from the root collar of the tree is pressing on these wood structural members, cracking and pushing them slightly out of alignment. And in your right image, the mud sill, which is the wood uh, framing on top of the foundation that's concrete, is lifted. This is evidence of a sewer leak that has stained the foundation of the building as viewed from the interior. You can see the cracks at my arrows, the staining from the septic leak, or, or I'm sorry, the sewer leak, and also, which is difficult to see in this image, but the wall is uh, also bowed slightly on the underside of the foundation from the interior as well as the exterior. And in your right image, you can see again, uh, relative to that crack, the mud sill is being lifted from the foundation. This is an image where they had cut a small hole on the back side of the brick veneer adjacent to the sewer uh, pipe. Uh, probably to do some sewer repair, and you can see how the roots have gotten in between the grout areas of this brick area and are uh, damaging that area, which is attached to the foundation. There are roots, and granted, these are feeder roots, so there's two types of roots. There's anchoring stability roots that are larger diameter that anchor the tree, and then you uh, have all of these small diameter feeder roots, and in redwoods, these matting, um, or these roots create a matting, and then they also exploit cracks and build um, kind of a denser mat. And obviously, these roots are tiny, and they are, they're not ones that can crumble or damage a foundation. But as these roots uh, mass upon themselves, they can do something called root wedging, which also exacerbates any cracks or defects or uh, weaknesses in the foundation. Again, uh, from under the house, uh, I'm sorry, apartment, you can see there are a number of surface roots. Um, one of the reports says that tree roots don't like it under foundations, but um, it's quite obvious that in this circumstance, um, and also partly associated to the species of tree, there are roots under the foundation. There's another picture of roots in the area up against the foundation. 
And uh, this is a picture of the exterior to show the proximity of the tree to the brick veneer. Another image showing that the brick veneer is separating from the building. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that, um, again, there's, there's roots that are in all of these cracks. And um, I, I think I pointed those out in the slides. So a uh, report from a structural engineer has been submitted by the applicant. Uh, we had that structural engineer define structural integrity and also confirm that the tree has damaged the structural integrity of the building. Um, additional engineering reviews were submitted by the property owner on 12-13-23. Um, after the request for additional information. And then uh, yesterday, um, another um, report came in um, on that. Um, the trees cause minor structural damage and is likely to get worse as the tree grows larger. Uh, this tree is obviously a gen uh, genetically predisposed to get quite large um, and is, again, uh, fairly young in its age. Um, the brick veneer is attached to the foundation. Both are damaged. Foundations cracked in two locations. Floor joists are rotting where the soil is higher adjacent to the tree. Root growth is evident in the crawl space. This is uh, shown from uh, the engineer for the property owner, uh, her images of the foundation cracks. Findings of uh, uh, continued a report from a private arborist has been submitted as a second opinion to support the city staff arborist opinion that the tree requires removal. And um, in request uh, by the council at the last meeting, um, this arborist, uh, Mr. Don Cox, did some additional air spade uh, work where he blew dirt away from the uh, roots of the tree near the foundation to clearly make the nexus that it is roots that are bowing the foundation and causing these cracks. And then a second private arborist also reviewed the information for the property owner. Um, that person didn't actually visually see the site, but um, talked to the owner about proximity of the tree, the species of the tree, and um, from the images that they saw stated that the trees cause damage and will continue to grow, leading to more damage. Um, the International Society of Arboriculture, uh, their guidelines or their formula for root pruning is that at a minimum you want to root prune three times the diameter uh, out from the tree trunk because pruning more closely can reduce tree stability. Uh, the best management practices for root pruning reference that severe loss of stability is common when cuts are made at a distance that are less than 1 to 1.5 times the trunk diameter. So the cuts um, that could be proposed by the appellant's arborist uh, are um, not exactly in line with the best management practices as written. Um, the tree is too close to the foundation to perform this root pruning work to industry standard or to protect the building foundation. And that's um, my arborist opinion. Um, there was also a report that I hand delivered to you today from another arborist named Mr. Uh, Mr. Nigel Belton, who also believes that root pruning would not be a solution in this case. There's limited space to do that and decay will set in and it'll potentially lead to tree instability. Um, and then there's really no, um, in my opinion, and also uh, um, the arborists that have worked been with the uh, applicant, um, there's no reasonable option to save the tree or prevent ongoing damage to the structural integrity of the building. Uh, additionally, a root barrier cannot be installed to protect the foundation without significant root loss and tree instability concerns. Uh, since the last meeting uh, that we had, the arborist, Mr. Don Cox, uh, after doing the air spade work and some probe work, confirmed there is definite contact with the wall of the building by expanding root crown of the tree, as further evidenced by the appearance of a bow inward curvature on the brick siding at the points of contact. And then also I saw that same uh, bowing when I was under the home. Um, this is Don Cox uh, performing his air spade work where he eliminated a little bit of the uh, dry material and soil that was between the tree and the wall. And you can see that um, it's in contact um, for the most part uh, with the building. And what you can't see here was confirmed with the probe. I also personally got in there with a shovel and um, knocked around a little bit in this same area where he probed, and uh, the shovel was in contact with wood, in contact with the brick veneer. Uh, 
Uh, this is Mr. Cox probing the area, confirming that wood is in contact with the veneer of the building attached to the foundation. Um, new information from the report I hand delivered today from Nigel Belton, dated um, 12224, recommends that the subject tree be removed to prevent more significant damage concerning the adjacent building and sidewalk. Um, he believes that shaving the root collar at the base of the tree is not viable management option in this situation, um, and that's largely because of the confined area between the building foundation and the trunk. Um, new information from Jody Collins um, came in on 12, 13, 23, and tree roots and trunk are already in contact with the building. The foundation wall is cracked and bowed. Replacing foundation with alternative types of foundations is not possible while maintaining the same building footprint. So um, further, she looked at this and uh, made the assertions that uh, for the tree to remain and lessen further damage potential to the building while anticipating future tree growth, the building would have to be moved approximately 10 feet or more from the tree. This would eliminate two apartments, require design engineering performed to current codes, requiring new wall bracing framing, floor joists, and a first and second floor framing, and this proposal would be very costly and result in loss of income for the units that um, would be vacated and also uh, theoretically or hypothetically eliminated. Uh, more information from Ms. Collins, the engineer, uh, which would be a third review, were submitted today and I hand delivered those to you folks. Uh, she reviewed the three foundation and retaining wall options, excuse me, from Cascadia Engineering which was prepared for the appellant's report on 1824. She concludes that each of these three options would allow for no growth of the redwood tree in the direction of the building and would require portions of the tree's root system to be removed. Um, more additional new information came in um, after the last meeting. Um, there's a leak in the septic area. I keep saying septic sewer area, and um, it's a $14,000 uh, sewer bill to dig up and replace where roots have intruded into the sewer lines and um, how they would go about uh, doing that repair uh, to a cost of $14,000. And then I did want to just kind of bring in a little tree biology. Um, this is from UC Davis Arboretum. And these um, redwood trees have shallow roots, and, and they uh, have these roots that extend approximately 50 feet out, um, in some cases, on either side of the tree for anchoring. They drink, they breathe, they stabilize the tree. And um, as you probably notice, redwood leaves are flat, and they wick fog out of the air and drip that water down into their root area. And that is one of the ways that they drink and um, they have a lot of these um, roots that obviously anchor in addition to small matting feeder roots, which you saw that were invading the cracks of the uh, foundation area. <clears throat> when you root prune a redwood so close to its root collar or root flare, and this is an image of root pruning that I worked with a contractor to do on chestnut, when you cut into this wood, you end up getting decay, wood decay organisms. You can see the rot and, and uh, how the roots are dying back here and termite activity. Um, another um, slides, set of slides here that show the sidewalk was repaired in 2011. And um, you can see um, it looks great in 2011. By uh, 2017, you can see, which was obviously six years, the sidewalk is beginning to be damaged from tree expansion. Also just shows that um, the tree is still growing very vigorously. Granted, that root repair may or may not have been reinforced. It's still damaging that sidewalk area. Uh, the sidewalk, when the appeal um, discussion began in 2022, uh, you can obviously, if you're out there today, you can see that within that year point of time, uh, everything has gotten significantly uh, more damaged. Um, the sidewalk repair estimate, uh, as council had requested, the public works engineering 
came up with a detail and a price on what it would cost to move the sidewalk out into the street area, and um, this would require uh, new ADA areas and um, moving hydrants and street lights and those um, amenities uh, that are there in the sidewalk be 127,940 approximately. And again, as this tree continues to grow, this design will not prevent further building damage. Um, this is the design that they came up with, and um, we do have public works staff here to answer any questions on this design. Um, in one of the reports that the appellant submitted, they talk about different sidewalk materials, um, but they are not adopted by our public works department as being our standards um, for safe, passable sidewalks. Um, so um, we don't uh, do anything other than concrete, and that is why we came up with this single detail in response to the City Council's request for more information. If the tree were to be removed, then the sidewalk repair estimate is at 8,900, for which the property owner would be responsible, versus the 128, approximately thousand dollars for moving that out into the street. There was a lot of discussion and um, uh, conjecture, so to speak, on the tree's age. And uh, there was one uh, that said it was 100 to 150 or 200 years old. Um, this is an image from 1950 that shows in the red circle that no tree was there before the building was built. Um, I found this in a yearbook photo for Santa Cruz High School from 1959, again in the red circle, no tree, and another aerial image from 1963 that you can see in the red circle, there was no tree, which obviously indicates the tree has uh, very quickly expanded. It has very good soil in that area, on the, um, lots of... Um, organic nutrients, and then a good amount of water that uh, is in the area um, that is making this tree grow quite rapidly. Staff recommendation that the City Council upholds the Parks and Recreation Commission decision to approve Heritage Tree Removal Permit Application 230089 and deny the appeal. Uh, professional findings have satisfied the City Council resolution criteria and standards that Mr. Condotti referenced for tree removal. And again, how I do my job, the standard that the commission is, weighs the evidence on, uh, Title uh, 9.56 Municipal Code Resolution. The heritage tree has or is likely to have an adverse effect upon the structural integrity of a building, utility, public or private right of way, or the physical condition of the tree, health uh, or disease or infestation warrants, alteration or removal, or a construction project design cannot be altered to accommodate heritage trees. And it's my opinion that the property owner has submitted enough information to defend that the tree requires removal. Thank you very much. Ms. Keedy, thank you very much. How we'll proceed from here is we'll hear from the appellant, then the applicant, then what we'll do is council members will have the opportunity to ask questions. We'll then take public comment. Then the matter will be back before the body. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I have a PowerPoint. All right, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I feel very grateful that this tree has gotten time in front of the Council. Its immense size and ecological value demands respect of us all. We have used the last 90 days, 90 days to reach out to legitimate experts asking the question of how to preserve this magnificent tree. We've also started a fundraising effort where we raise over $2,900 from local citizens who care. If this tree gets protected, these funds will be available for any work that gets done. In our, finding, we, in our finding, we have detailed reports from two certified arborists. Their expert, expert opinion is that there are indeed remedial efforts that can be done. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah.
Um, yeah, uh, basically, uh, can you put the uh, last slide up in the meantime? Is that possible? Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, uh, the last slide has uh, the accreditations of our two arborists and the um, two engineers that um, came and gave their expert opinions on this. Um, in the video, uh, Monica, one of the arborists, uh, says her um, qualifications where she, she works in tree risk assessment. Um, um, this ex like exact um, specific thing, and her opinion is that there is a uh, you know, work that can be done um, in our reports. Uh, one of the challenges for uh, what we've been trying to do is we did not get permission from the property owners for um, to go on to their property. So all of our um, uh, expert opinions have been what they can see from the street. Uh, if we were would have been given permission, we could have had an arborist and an engineer look at it at the same time, which would uh, constitute a uh, phase three um, sorry, I'm forgetting the word, uh, uh, inspection, uh, which is where um, actual information can be found because both arborists and engineers need to work together on any sort of work like this. Um, uh, it is, in my opinion, the tree should not have to pay the price for lack of proper maintenance and lack of any preventative measures in the decades prior, but it is not too late. Engineer Mark Ritson's report states the damage is minor and there's likely other elements at play rather than just roots. Um, Dave Bolcher's engineer reports discusses legitimate methods to reinforce the building without removal of the tree or any of the bu building's units. Mayor, council members. Good afternoon, um, sir. My name is David Bolger. I am a structural engineer and I'm licensed in California and Oregon. And I'm here because Keelan Franzen hired me to visit 339 Walnut to see if they were, I, I believe it's in response to the um, Jody Collins letter that said that there were simply no structural um, paths forward. And I went out there and did a visit. And um, in my opinion, there are th at least three paths forward from a structural engineering standpoint. Um, I can go through them very briefly here. Uh, the first one is a concrete pier and grade beam system. That is just fancy engineer talk for uh, putting in a concrete beam and then supporting the beam at both ends by a concrete column that would extend into the grade. This would mean that the floor joists of the building are no longer dependent on what's happening in the soil beneath them. In a similar vein, uh, item two is a cantilevered joist system where the existing joists run horizontally. They have a foundation on each end. In that one, we would remove the foundation that's closest to the tree and pour a new foundation someplace at mid-span and again, that means that the floor joists and the interior space are no longer dependent on the interactions of the redwood tree with the soil. The third option is a concrete retaining wall, which is just what it sounds like, a big retaining wall with a big footing anchored into the um, upslope side to keep uh, the tree on the outside of the, uh, of the building. And um, I think the other two things I wanted to share is that on my uh, visit, uh, it was clear that the existing foundation needs work. It was also clear that it did not appear to need emergency foundation intervention. And so we do have time to consider these and other options. Um, and the last thing I want to share is in response to the letter by Jody Collins from today, um, the first thing I noticed from her letter is that we appear to substantially agree that my three proposed methods are legitimate and worthy of consideration from an engineering standpoint. Uh, beyond that, she has some conclusions in there that are really uh, about what, uh, what an arborist or a licensed contractor would think, and I encourage us to view her letter in the light of the expertise conferred to her by the stamp that she has on that, which is simply structural engineering and not um, project cost or tree behavior. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dave. It is fundamentally true that if this tree is protected by the choice of the city council today, these solutions will be implemented. If Santa Cruz City cares about its awe-inspiring trees, it will put in the work needed to protect them. We know that it is possible. It is important to think of the future, where this sequoia sempervirens still stands above our city hundreds of years from now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will now hear from Ms. Johnson or her representative, Barter. 
Good afternoon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we uh, can. I'm going to be trying to read from my computer. Oh, don't move that. Now I'm not sure we can. You need okay. to move the. There we go. How Thank about you. That? Is that good? Okay, there we let go. me try to bring this up. <laughs> I was I was told I only had three minutes, so I wished I had I, I wished I had known that I had more because I have not prepared well, more. Okay. Well, let let me for the record say that I advised everyone via email on Friday and on Monday exactly how much time everybody would have. But okay. That's, Sorry. It, that. It's okay. Take such time as you need. Well, you have up to five minutes. <laughs> Okay. Hello. <laughs> nice to be here. I'm Mary Barter, the owner of 339 Walnut Avenue, an 18-unit apartment building that has damage from redwood tree roots. This damage has been previously documented by Donald Cox, Master Arborist, Jody Collins, Henry, <clears throat> Henry Structural Engineer, Les, um, Leslie Keedy, Arborist and Urban Forester, and more recently Nigel Belton, also an Arborist here in Santa Cruz. Photos from Ms. Collins' July 17th report, which you should have, show most of what we are talking about, not including the sidewalk. Um, but I think Ms. Keedy got um, even closer and under the building and has more pictures, um, which you saw. Um, refer to photos. Uh, so the cracking of the brick. You, you know, I don't need even really need to read this because you've seen a lot of that. The the wall of the building does have a slight inward bow, and now we know that it's you can see it from the inside as well as it's obvious from the outside. It's hard to believe that that was constructed that way, and it's right at the tree. Um, the soil elevation adjacent to the building was higher due to the roadward tree roots had have raised it up and it's blocking two foundation vents adjacent to the tree. Um, the brick veneer and the separation of the veneer of the building is shown at the top. Uh, you can see that at the top, right at the tree. The, um, the floor joist ends are starting to experience rot at the ends where exterior soil elevation was higher adjacent to the tree in photo eight. There were also Two cracks we noticed initially in the stem wall of foundation adjacent to the tree where the tree is closest to the building in photos six and seven. See one vertical, one quarter inch wide crack and the other crack is a Y shape, one, one half inch wide and those were also seen on the inside. Um, oh, my computer just did a strange thing. Um, Nigel Belt, Belton's report is recent. Um, I don't really have his key findings. Um, I think he um, helped um, talking about uh, the feasibility of the root pruning um, being so close to the building. I mean, you've seen in the pictures, it's literally like that between the building and the tree. We've needed to fix the sidewalk for almost a year now. Whatever we do, the tree is huge now and will continue to grow in any direction it can. Um, these trees, as Leslie t talked about, they like to send their roots out in all directions so that they can create a mat of stability, which they're adapted to do in the forest because in the forest they'll meet up with other roots and they don't just mesh, they actually, the tree roots ent entwine with each other to provide stability. Those shallow roots will not do that. And this tree is encumbered in a space about like this. Um, just between the sidewalk and the building is a very, very small space for them to be able to grow. Um, the rotting joist shown in Ms. Collins Henry's photos would require excavation to repair and that damaged shallow roots. Um, the reason, oh boy, I think I get to <laughs> um, Okay, I'm gonna not, just skip that. Um, so we, we can't really do those repairs um, very easily that I know of because the tree is right there where we need to repair. The tree has damaged the joist, which we need to take out and repair, and the tree is right there. Um, I think we've already had that. The appellants have floated numerous ideas to save the tree from knocking down two apartments and rebuilding as two separate buildings to make space for the tree. Um, they were going to be able to gain 
10 feet on either side uh, of, the of the building for the tree, but that wouldn't really be sufficient down the road because the tree wa would want to grow further than that. Um, okay, the two, um, let's see, and another uh, idea that they had is um, to raise up the entire two-story 18-unit building that is presently supported by steel beams and posts, 18 unit building and 18 um, space parking garage under, underground. And that parking garage is presently supported by steel beams and posts and holding up the two story apartment building. So they wanna, they wanna raise up the entire two story 18 unit building. Also now um, about root cutting, um, so selective so, so here's what we're going to do. Okay, sorry. Um, the uh, appellant uh, went over by about a minute and a half or so, which is just okay. fine. Not a problem. All right. You take another minute Thank and a you. half and wrap up. Thank also, you. Also, root cutting, selective root cutting of roots at the building. Root cutting is known to cause physiological stress even when done well. Um, Actually, Monica Buxo, the consulting arborist hired from Pennsylvania by the appellant, says that if any roots are cut, removed, or shaved, a plant health care management plan should be developed to ensure the redwood's survival, structural integrity, and health. The, red the redwood should be monitored for at least five years. So it's serious business um, with potential for destabilization, as mentioned by Donald Cox toppling. Um, I wish I had more. Um, but that's what I've got, and I think that um, I, I, I want this. Um, I, I guess the tree root cutting, I, I, I don't know why it's not on this page, but the tree root cutting is a very risky procedure because what Leslie said about you can't cut within 1.5 uh, times the diameter of the tree. This would be required to be much closer cutting because how the tree root, the tree and the building are so close together, you can't even get that far apart. So this is not what's, what's being um, proposed by the um, arborist of the appellant is not to industry standards. It's not advisable and it, and it subjects us, the owner, if we were to do that to considerable liability and perhaps other people to liability also. It's something that we find unacceptable. And we would like um, the city of Santa, Santa Cruz to honor um, its, its rules and standards um, and um, to find in our interests. Thank you so much. What we're going to do now is we're going to see if council members have questions of staff before we take public comment when the matter is back before the council after taking public comment we can still ask some questions based on on what we receive so let me see if there are questions ms brown thank you um i guess i'm trying to understand the question I don't believe that I have the information I need to understand the question of slope stabilization. I really focused on this um, in my in the previous round, and um, you know it was raised in Mr. Bolger's uh, letter. Um, so I want to ask about it here. Um, what is the? I mean the 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 difference in elevation between the the street and where the apartment is located reflects there there it, it's built on a cut and it, it I, that was what it looked like to me right so um and and i'm concerned that without that tree <laughs> the slope the stability of that slope is in serious jeopardy and and i worry that there could be significantly more damage uh due to slope failure without those roots in place to stabilize the slope i mean I, I'm not. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. I'm not trying to, um, you know, sidetrack the question. Um, but 
that is a very significant concern for me. And so I'd like to just better understand what the, and Leslie, I'm looking at you, but it's not your wheelhouse because you're talking about the tree and, you know, and, and the bigger uh, kind of qu picture questions related to the property, but I'm talking about city liability um, and city work that's going to be required to stabilize that slope. What are, um, so anyone who could try to help me better understand this, um, I, I'd, I'd really like to, I'd really like to understand this. <laughs> Leslie Keedy, Urban Forester. So obviously my discipline is arboriculture, but I've been a certified arborist for, um, got going on 30 years now. And so there are some engineering questions and these types of things come up and because obviously roots do drink a lot of water and anchor soil. Um, if the tree theoretically were removed, then the st there's two options. You can either leave the stump intact and do a topical herbicide treatment to that fresh cut and leave those roots intact, um, which they would slowly degrade over time. And as they degrade and the moisture comes out of those roots as they rot, they turn into some degree of soil and take the place of the roots. If the roots are at depth where it's anaerobic and there's no oxygen to decay those roots, then those roots would largely stay in place. Um, so whatever... Uh, retreat or volume reduction you might have from roots would be something that wouldn't be immediate. It would be over time. The other thing is, is between all the buildings and the surface there is all paved. So it's designed to convey water out into the drains and along the street. So as that settles, you still have water conveyance on the surface. Um, the other option is to do a cursory stump grinding, which would probably be only to 10 inches, which would leave those roots in place to gradually decay. So th that's how it works from a tree standpoint. Now, I don't want to um, belittle that argument, but um, neither the engineers for public works, because we did discuss this, or myself feel that that would be something that the city would um, wouldn't be able to manage, and it would be something we would, over time, be able to see change that we could address through backfilling or repair those types of things. Thank you. Just another quick question, since you mentioned um, having time to consider the potential unintended consequences of, um, you know, the the slope, uh, and and it, you know, just if you look hydrologically, the I, I just would say that. The, it's not all runoff, right? I mean, there is water moving underneath, <laughs> down that um, slope underground as well. So um, I just want to, I wanted to say that, but also just ask the question, you know, what I've also heard is that we have some years to figure out how to manage the tree. And um, so I guess it's not really a question, it's a, a comment. Um, if we've got time to figure out uh, the engineering solution to potential slope failure, um, what needs to be, what infrastructure needs to be put in place. Um, we also have time to identify ways to manage the tree. I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if you think that might be the case. Uh, well, I think there's two different issues that you're discussing. One is the engineering of the slope and how to address that, and then the um, structural integrity of the building. And obviously, there's differing opinions as to what that damage is, the extent of that damage. But um, now that we have cracks in the foundation with roots that are invading those cracks, those roots are going to continue to make that foundation damage worse, which is more costly, which could then create further in structural integrity issues with the building. So um, it, 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 that's my response. Thank you. I have one last question. Um, how, uh, because we're talking about, there's been kind of projections, but nothing specific about how rapidly this tree will grow and how quickly its root system will grow. How, like on average per year, how, what kind of expansion are we looking at over the next five years? Say? Yeah. So. The imagery that I found on the internet uh, dates the tree at being about 60 years old. So if you have a tree of that size now, then it's growing at a very quick rate. In 60 years, it has become a very, very large tree. 
And I think that that growth rate will continue. Now, of course, we just discussed the amount of water that comes down the slope, that whole area. If anybody who walks the top of Lincoln Street constantly sees water coming down the hill. So th there is that. Um, I think also we're going to be mitigating and putting in more trees that are going to re-knit that slope together to some degree in that vicinity. Now, granted, we're not planting trees of this volume or magnitude because we have to pick trees that are going to fit in that confined growth space between the sidewalk and the building. But um, we will be adding new trees. Young trees take in much more moisture as they grow. They'll, they're going to be uh, drinking a lot of that water that's there. Um, the questions by council members at this point before we take public comment. Ms. Kalantari Question. Johnson has recognized. Thank you um, for the presentation and the work, Ms. Keedy, and to the appellants and the applicants. Um, the appellants, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but the appellants engineer was speaking about the, Dave, uh, three options, um, uh, three options and three paths to move forward. I wonder if you could just speak um, to those three options. I, I didn't get, it was really technical, so I didn't get it all down, but what if you could speak to that and it's probably hard to tell, but what the cost of those would be, and I would assume that would be a cost to the applicants, the owners of the building. Yeah, so again, I'm an arborist, not an engineer, but I work with the planning department on pretty much any plan that they present on any building in the city. Um, these foundation types, you are looking at some degree of root severance to retrofit with either retaining wall, bridge beam foundation, or the um, uh, cantilever. So you'll have some degree of roots. You do, so some degree of root severance. You don't have a lot of room to work with because the tree's already in contact with that. So um, hypothetically, if you do a pier and grade beam, then you're pushing out to some degree, um, not only for your trenching but for the installation of that new foundation type it's much more difficult to retrofit a building than it is to do new construction. And so when we as arborists work with the planning department to do new construction, it's absolutely typical that we look at these measures and we do these types of um, alternative foundation, especially if we're in 10 feet of a tree. But um, these are very difficult to retrofit an existing large apartment building that has a lot of steel in it. Um, it, it just doesn't seem reasonable. Um, and then of course, uh, our findings are our charter here as to is the building damaged or not, that's um, what I'm looking for. Um, these would be very expensive compared to the modest repairs that are required at this time. I would say hundreds of thousands of dollars possibly to retrofit this foundation with these designs in tandem with other uh, professionals to make sure it was done properly. Um, wherever you submit the piers for your bridge beam or your grade beam foundation, uh, you have the tree very close to the corner of the building. So inevitably, if you sink a pier there to span that root zone, you're still very close to the trunk and the root collar. You'll have to probably shave the root collar as their uh, arborist has already suggested you sh should or could do. Um, and then as that tree continues to grow, it's gotten this big in 60 years and another 40 years or 20 years or whatever, it probably will be in contact with any of these proposed foundation alternatives. Um, not to demean them at all. They're very functional, but to retrofit a building rather than new construction is a different can of worms, so to speak. For the questions, comments by council members before we take public comment. Mr. Kandani, maybe I could go back to you for a moment. Uh, you uh, showed us a uh, or you spoke to the issue about substantial evidence and so on. Let me ask a couple of questions. So when an applicant comes in, applies for a permit to remove a heritage tree, uh, under our ordinance as it exists today, uh, if they, let's say they show damage and there's a causal relationship between tree and foundation, for example, and That's right. I, want to, I want to take this up to a slightly larger view of, of this without respect to this issue for a moment. So applicant comes in, there's a tree. They show a causal relationship between tree 
Damage Foundation. Under our ordinance, is there, before applying for a tree removal permit, is there a legal requirement that the applicant do something to try to mitigate that damage before they apply for a tree removal permit? Um, it's not a requirement as a prerequisite for applying for a tree removal permit. Um, the city has the ability to uh, condition approval or to deny an, uh, an application if it finds that there are reasonably feasible mitigation measures that could be uh, implemented in lieu of removing the tree removal permit or uh, removing the tree. Um, I would just offer that uh, as Ms. Keedy has been here uh, almost 30 years and I have been here for the past 30 years, mm -hmm. um, I'm very familiar with the process by which this occurs, and it is typical for a person, um, and I've done this myself, to call the urban forester out and say, can you take a look at this tree, and it looks like it's causing damage to the foundation, and I'm wondering if I should apply for a tree removal permit. And what typically happens in that situation, and more often than not, um, the conclusion will be there are plenty of measures that you can take to protect your building uh, and your tree, so don't bother applying because I'm likely to deny your, your application. Um, if uh, it looks like there's a substantial issue, as occurred in this case, the city would typically require a report from an expert hired by the applicant to support the, um, the statement that the tree is causing damage to the structural integrity of the building. And then if Ms. Keedy evaluates that and, uh, and agrees with it, then an application could be brought forward and with her recommendation to grant the permit as, as occurred here. Um, if the evidence is questionable or if contrary evidence is produced, then there's a process that we go through and that's what we have here tonight or this afternoon whereby um, the council is called to weigh the evidence and make a decision based on that evidence. But I think the key is um, you know, alternative mitigation measures can be imposed if they are reasonable and feasible in light of, you know, the costs involved um, in, in that sort of thing. I'd also point out that we have standards for uh, removal of sidewalks uh, if a person applies to, or if a, a sidewalk becomes damaged under our uh, city ordinance, the adjacent property owner is responsible for the cost of repairing that sidewalk, and if a, if a damaged sidewalk causes injury to a person, they are also liable for the injury if it's due to the, the creation of a dangerous condition caused by their failure to maintain the sidewalk. If, however, they've applied for a permit to repair and it's been denied by the city, then that liability transfers to the city. Um, I also think that there's an issue of fairness here uh, in terms of the cost of repairing the sidewalk. Um, if the cost to repair with the tree in place is orders of magnitude higher than the cost to repair in a normal sidewalk replacement scenario, then the question is who should bear that cost? Is it fair to put that burden on the adjacent property owner when the city is essentially saying that the value of this tree to the community is greater than the cost? of uh, implementing an expensive repair. So those are some factors for you to take into account. Thank you. Ms. Key, do you look like you might want to add on on that? I do. Okay. So, of course, uh, there's a lot of things written in our ordinance. <laughs> there's a lot of things that are in this resolution. Um, is, is the tree has or likely to cause damage to the structural integrity of a foundation, a public right-of-way, or utility. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, you could look at it and say, gosh, you know, over time, almost every single tree in our city could result in some degree of damage. And there's a lot of people that say, Leslie, that tree is lifting the sidewalk, and I need that tree permit. And I say, you know, you're going to work with us on the Heritage Tree Grant. We're going to do some modest root pruning at a good distance from the tree, or we're going to uncover everything and look and see what we can and can't do. We may end up doing a combination of leaving some roots, reinforcing the sidewalk, pruning some roots. Um, but it, there is no guarantee that they're going to get a permit, even though the language in the resolution says that, yes, it's damaged their sidewalk, they get a permit. We would work on the grant to repair it because it's a reason reasonable action and we save trees that way and that happens in every community everywhere um, and in addition to that um, the utility now um, 
trees grow into power lines all the time. I don't give tree permits for those. Trees grow and break old clay pipes and cause uh, lots of different sewer backups and uh, defects and health issues and those types of things uh, with leaks. Uh, what I would suggest in that case, even though the ordinance says we give a tree permit if it's likely to or has damaged the structural integrity of a utility, we just do an ABS, collarless pipe, we install something. So even though things are written a certain way, I try and use that reasonable person mentality. But I think in this case, the mitigation measures not only leave a lot of people subject to liability if the trees to topple, hypothetically, if we force them to root prune in a situation where the tree is this close to the foundation, foundation and in contact with that foundation and the tree falls and somebody dies, then the city gets brought in. Everybody who's touched it is then uh, at least asked questions in this scenario. So I, I feel that um, it's very expensive. I think with the best engineers and the best designers and everything and best arborists, sometimes you can do these types of measures, but what is the reasonability of that? And then um, if it's... It, it just feels like in this case, it is onerous for this property owner to have sustained cracks in their foundation that are this large, leaks already that have occurred in their septic or their sewer system. Um, just the, the type of damage and the expense to repair, I think, warrants a permit. Thank you, Ms. Keedy. Let the record reflect that Councilmember Watkins has arrived at the hour of 2.36. Please do. Welcome. Uh, thank you. I apologize for being late today. I had a work conflict, but I wanted to, after um, consulting our city attorney, let the community as well as my colleagues know I was listening to this item on my drive from Monterey to here, and um, he suggested that that is considered rehabilitation enough to be able to participate in this item. So I've been paying attention to all that has been said, and I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in. That's correct. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mayor. Well, thank you for dialing into the right radio station. Yes. Good for you. <laughs> appreciate that. Um, uh, thank you for the answer to the question. I appreciate it both, Mr. Condotti and Ms. Keedy. Unless there are other questions before we go to public comment, other questions before we go? Okay, let's open this up for public comment. Anyone who wishes to address the council on this matter, this would be your opportunity to do so. And in the event that we have folks online, we're going to toggle back and forth. Mr. Myberg, we'll take you first, and then we'll take someone online. We'll toggle back and forth. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, council people. Um, I hope I can get this in in three minutes. I lived um, on California Street across from the high school, so I want to talk about hydrology. I try to put in a gate post and at 18 inches depth, I hit water, a running stream. That stream continues through the high school and leaches out the high school wall. A lot of it's subterranean and continues down exactly where this tree is. So if you look at what's happened to the sidewalk there, it's not only been lifted, it subsides in areas. That has never been addressed in anything that I've heard why the sidewalk subsides. I know what a sidewalk looks like when it's lifted. This is also partially subsiding, indicating there's something going on under there that is removing a mess. So, um, so I would introduce this as a major new introduction of um, information uh, that Condotti, uh, city attorney, was saying was a condition. The second one was, in the time that I lived there for 25 years, there were two major car crashes into the building, exactly where this curve is, where the tree is. The one required rentals to be um, temporarily suspended. I think there were people in the building when the car crashed into it. Um, so as far as the warping on the inside of the wall showing pressure, um, yeah, could have been the car crash. It was substantial. So that brings me back to, the st to some of the benefits uh, that of this tree over here. One of the benefits is it protects that building because that is a very difficult curve to negotiate. People go too fast, especially when it, rain, when it rains. Uh, that tree, in addition to that, and I think this point comes up, is stabilizing that area. The amount of effort that'll have to go in once this tree is removed 
will be enormous. I've done a lot of retrofitting construction, and I have to say with all due respect, I have a lot of regard for um, Leslie and her opinion. She doesn't know construction. So that takes me back to the information we got from David Bolger over here. Um, to do those remedial actions of cantilever or bridging are not that onerous. And for Leslie to come up with figures like a couple of hundred thousand, I think Mr. Condotti said that unless you have expertise in an area, it doesn't count as evidence. I think that counts. Um, now, in terms of st besides stabilization, a benefit is a tree of that magnitude is a self-sustaining... <laughs> Let's go finish this one. Um, it's, it's a self-sustaining, self-inventing production plant. It turns carbon dioxide into oxygen. There's an enormous amount of traffic there. There's a high school there. So in terms of a community benefit, sure, it's just a tree, but it's more than that. It's a production plant. So please do everything because our heritage ordinance states we should do everything. Do everything in favor of it. Also, do not you. make a decision Thank today Thank until you. hydrology has been Thank done. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who want to provide testimony, uh, it's two minutes. It's not two and a half minutes. It's two minutes. If you get to your two minutes and you need to wrap up, take another five, ten seconds, that's all good. Please don't abuse the... Uh, the rule on this. We have someone online. I do, but I also just want to clarify. I would. I gave him three minutes. Three do you want minutes. three or two? Excuse okay. me. Three minutes. Keep your comments inside three minutes. Let's take the person online. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Shalom Dreampeace Compost. I have a couple comments to make. Uh, I would like to refer the uh, the uh, the city council to pages one seventy four to. 175, 26, 174, 26, 175, and also to 2635 and 2636. Uh, Mary Barter has stated that she is the owner of the property. In August, she stated that uh, she, her and her husband co owned this uh, property with uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan and Karen Fielding. Uh, and said they were involved with a group that uh, advocates for trees. I don't know the exact words. So I just, uh, I went to the assessor's office. I looked up uh, the ownership. The ownership is Barfield uh, LLC, which I assume stands for Barter and Fielding. Um, and then I note that the Fieldings are members of the board of Tree People, treepeople.org. And when I look at, uh, you can look at their website, and you see that they're members of the board of directors. And then the web page about us for tree people says our work. And I bolded some stuff when I put it into the agenda packet or I emailed it. Our work, trees need people, people need trees. Born in 1973 from the hopes and dreams of a teenager, Tree People is now one of the largest environmental organizations headquartered in Southern California. We have inspired, engaged, and supported more than 3 million people, and I bolded here, to take action for our environment by planting and caring for trees, unbold, in forests, mountains, parks, and I bolded our neighborhood. Our unique, engaging, and proven model empowers communities to plant a more resilient future and to take personal responsibility for greening these neighborhoods. What I would like to hear is that the that I'd like to hear from the fieldings. The fieldings have a specific, um, um, do I say agenda, when we talk about reasonability of the conditions for removing the tree. I think the fieldings are sitting in a whole different plane than, uh, than um, Ms. Keedy of the city council, uh, uh, Mary Barter. I appreciate everybody's work, but I would like to see the fieldings uh, speak up to get something in writing from the fieldings to say whether they want this tree removed or not. Um, I know I want to make sure the fieldings get the four reports that the appellants submitted because um, they were talked to. I think that's all I need to say. Thank you, Shalom. Good afternoon. Welcome. 
Hi there, my name is Annika. Um, I'm cutting my, my speech a little bit so I can keep to three minutes. Um, firstly, I want to say that when making the decision on whether or not to cut down this tree, I want to try to encourage you to set aside the politics and look at the facts. Um, the facts being that mitigation solutions here are possible and might even be possible without damaging the tree. Uh, we'd have to look further into uh, David's evidence he brought up. Um, it's been stated by multiple professionals and the community is asking something of you here today and we hope that you listen. Um, we don't want this to turn into a he said, she said. We know there are multiple professional opinions stating different things on the appellant and applicant side. Um, there has yet to be an arborist and a structural engineer working directly in conjunction together, which is typically what might be recommended for um, this kind of situation. And we ask for your consideration of collaboration between these professionals and city staff to find a true um, solution. After thoroughly reading all of the agenda reports submitted by city staff and the property management, I believe that mitigation solutions have been ignored in order to retain the status quo. I believe that mitigation, so, oh, read that already. The motion to proceed made on September 26 directed staff to conduct additional analysis exploring alternatives to tree removal. But the report written by Parks and Recreation didn't even mention any of these potential mitigation measures or budget adjustments to support those measures. Um, I don't really think there is a question of if there's evidence of damage. It's clear that there might be potential damage. Uh, the question is of time. Uh, how much time do we have? And the question is of how do we find out how to mitigate it? Um, for this report by the Parks and Recreation to successfully explore mitigation options, there should have been independently hired professionals explicitly given the task of finding solutions. But all of the reports quoted are from professionals specifically hired by Santa Cruz Property Management, making them inherently biased. The main report quoted by Jody Collins even states that the property management specifically asked her to quote, draft a letter stating facts that there is no way to keep the building the same size and build alternative foundation types. So that was her directive, just by the way. Um, after a few emails with Leslie Keedy, who I do really appreciate, what I have realized is that staff members choose to rely on standards written 20 plus years ago, 1998 Tree Heritage Ordinance, without questioning them or attempting to diverge from code written when society was still using dial-up. The unfortunate reality may be that time and resources have gone to waste in the last three months in the collection of data for this meeting, which was indeed just to set it up for failure. We did our due diligence to hire professionals with the exact directive of finding mitigation measures, and even with limited access, we were able to collect viable op options for mitigation which do not impact the footprint of the building and support an ADA-compliant sidewalk. Hopefully you've thoroughly read our submitted reports and suggested mitigation measures that demonstrate proceeding with the protection of this redwood tree truly is possible. I personally quite enjoy seeing these redwood trees on our city skyline and the protection of these large specimens is extremely important and the thoughtfulness before removing them. If there is a systems place to aid people, Santa Cruz would be better in 100 years than it is now. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Do, do we have anyone else online? We do. We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon and welcome to the city council meeting. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you all taking the time to hear this issue. Um, I would like to share some things from the EPA's website. Um, they actually recommend green infrastructure as one of the biggest ways to mitigate the flooding that's occurring from um, a lack of rainwater retention um, due to higher UV index and also soil erosion. Um, so what they recommend is actually um, auditing city codes. Um, they say that anything, as of 2023, anything with the words roof, curb, edge, or tree needs to be audited in city codes. And the reason they recommend for this is because local codes are not in accordance with their recommendations for green infrastructure. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has historically done a really wonderful job of preserving green infrastructure. But I think there are some concerns um, that potentially that that's not going to be maintained in the future. Um, so as of right now, what was brought up was that young trees can actually take in more water. That's actually not accurate, unfortunately. Um, old growth trees, which this tree is not an old growth tree, but it is 50 years old. Um, older trees actually take in more water during heavy rains. Um, on their website with green infrastructure, the EPA 
suggests that pavement is a huge barrier to groundwater. Um, all of the asphalt there that's being suggested as being repaired, as well as the concrete, is not going to halt rainwater runoff. So some of the water damage that's causing, potentially causing those roots to grow under the foundation is not going to be mitigated. However, Public Works has graciously put forward a really beautiful crosswork, uh, crosswalk design, pardon me, um, that actually matches the design that the EPA has on their page for low impact development and green infrastructure. Um, there are ways to reroute the sidewalk. The question is whether or not the city is willing to look at public works, whether or not our lovely city manager, Matt, is willing to look at ways to negotiate those funds, whether or not we're willing to take the time to look a little closer. And so far during this meeting, unfortunately, we haven't heard any strategies put forward um, by the council, by the arborist, or by anyone directly being paid by city funds. Um, I so appreciate you know, the efforts that the council makes to hear a lot of really important issues, but in the age of climate change, whether or not it's legally accessible for us to talk about carbon or for us to talk about the longevity of a tree's life, it is very important for us to think about. Um, the EPA suggests that we can save $31,000 a year or more by navigating this and creating green space. So thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Laura Tate. Uh, I moved to Santa Cruz when I was 12 years old from LA and I was just astounded by the natural beauty here. Not just up in the mountains where I lived in Brookdale, but also throughout the whole county. And I have come to know Santa Cruz as a place where the community and the government protected its natural environment. However, over the past several decades, I have seen more and more development and more and more trees cut down, including redwoods and heritage trees. It is important to protect our natural environment, to protect habitat for our wildlife and overall life, and to protect the legacy of our, the Santa Cruz legacy of, as stewards of our natural environment. And this is why I support um, the effort to save the redwood tree located at 339 Walnut Avenue. As to what came first, the building or the tree, I submitted photos to the council from the UC Library archi archives that d are dated from the 1920s, and it shows the corner where the tree is and several other trees, but not the building. The photo shown earlier by the city shows the wrong corner. Also, a letter submitted by Jillian Greensight, a member of the Sierra Club Conservation Committee, um, in her letter, she noted that she was out on a walk at the UC campus, campus and came upon researchers who are measuring growth of, of redwood trees. Um, they've been measuring these big trees for f a five-year period. And she wrote, I asked about the results. Over five years, the big trees had grown in circumference from a low of one millimeter to a high of eight millimeters. One millimeter equals 0.1 centimeter. In other words, a very slow growth. And at that rate, this redwood tree in 20 years will have increased in circumference at the high end by 32 millimeters, which is one and a half inches. Um, so that's the letter she wrote. It's submitted with the packet. So while it was noted that the tree's environmental value should not be taken into consideration for your decision, I want to note the red. The reason redwood trees are so critical to their environment is they capture more carbon emissions than any other trees in the world, including in the Amazon, and it's because of their longevity. Sadly, 96% of Santa Cruz's old growth trees are lost to logging and development. It is critical to save trees that are so important, and there are alternative solutions proposed that will save this tree and protect the building. It is possible if the city and this community are willing to take a stand in support of our natural environment. The Pellants have held fundraisers to hire a structural engineer and arborists and to propose these viable solutions and the community has stood behind them. The appellants and the community are committing to holding more fundraisers to help pay for these viable alternative solutions and the community is there to support them. I urge the city council to take the lead and show the world that we are stewards of our environment and we will do what is necessary to protect it when humanly possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have someone else online? We'll take that person online. Good afternoon and welcome to the city council meeting. Hello. Hi, this is Jacob Pollock. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, this is Jacob Pollock. 
I'm on the Parks and Rec Commission, um, but I'm not here on official uh, commission business. Just a second, let me do something over here on my other phone. It's destroying my concentration. Okay. Uh, so I think the Santa Cruz community is better with trees. I mean, it's part of what makes this Santa Cruz and part of why people live here. It seems to me that the basic question we're looking at is whether we value the tree enough to try to save it more than the profit that can be made from a rental business. Um, the tree, I mean, sorry, the building under its footprint can be modified to accommodate the tree. It will cost money and it will cut into the profit, but it can be done. If someone wants to make a business profit in our community, from our community, they should respect the norms of our community. Trees are one of our norms. We have an ordinance per to protect them. This ordinance should not be seen as like a technical nuisance to development or a piece of red tape to overcome when it's desired. Uh, for, those, for the above reasons and all the reasons put forth, and both because the tree and the tree ordinance were there, when the property was purchased, I don't care about when it was developed or built, it was purchased with the tree there. The business owners should have to conform to the norm of our city's lovers love for trees and absorb the cost of protecting the tree as part of their business plan and part of the protecting the community they have chosen to do business with. I believe we can preserve the tree. I also believe it's in the city's best interest to accommodate the tree through paying for sidewalk repair. Finally, I, I fear that uh, allowing this tree to be destroyed for the reasons stated will imply that every redwood tree in Santa Cruz should be destroyed. I don't believe this is in the city's best interest. Um, please, please accept the appeal and save the tree. And just as an aside, I feel like the city has gone to a, quite a lot of expense and trouble to make the case for the applicant. I would like to have, I would like to have seen the city go to a lot of trouble to make the case for protecting the tree as well. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Hi, I'm Joseph Schultz. Um, a lot of stuff has been said here that's been to the point. Um, I'm glad that it's difficult to cut trees at all, and I'm proud that Santa Cruz has a heritage tree ordinance to make it somewhat difficult. It wasn't difficult enough for the tree in front of my uh, former house, and it went down with very little. Uh, and so I feel especially guilty for not working hard enough to protect trees. Um, I think it's important for us to see that the intent of this uh, heritage tree ordinance was to slow down the, the slaughter of trees around the county. But anyone with a cursory knowledge of uh, history in Santa Cruz recently knows that we've lost a lot of very precious trees. Um, the specifics of this particular case obviously are important, but staff has, has gone to a great uh, lengths to make sure that we do not look at the larger picture here, but only at whether this particular tree caused a specific kind of particular damage. I think it's important that we go back and see what are our larger societal goals here. We need to be thinking about the common good as well as uh, an individual property owner's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Someone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take that person online. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Council meeting. Yeah, this is Garrett again. A real quick one here. In reference to the first speaker's lay opinion as to there being an underground river causing sidewalk uh, subsistence, I guess it is, uh, since mention was made of a broken sewer line, I can say for sure in those cases a bit of soil falls into those cracks, those sewer cracks, when it rains over time and, and it's washed into the sewer system, which undermines the sidewalk or street and is a more likely explanation for, you know, the sidewalk uh, falling in, right, as well as the streets. And you see that all over town. Also, when extraordinarily heavy trees put their increasing weight over time on sewer pipes, if they happen to be, you know, located next to them and the tree grows over them, yeah, it can break them, but it can also... Uh, uh, push the whole sewer uh, lateral down, creating slope problems and flow clogging problems. And also, it can even, uh, if enough of that goes on, it can even then pull the lateral out of the main sewer connection, causing uh, similar uh, subsistence effects in the center of the street. Um, uh, this, I suppose, can happen over and over and over as the tree goes heavier, you know, even if you replace the sewer in the same spot somehow. Thanks. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. So this is a little bit unusual. I am a tree talker. I'm a tree just, whisperer. Just pull up. There we go. Now Thank we you. can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Andrea, and uh, I'm really happy to live here in Santa Cruz. This is a little bit unusual. I have um, channeled information from Tom. I spoke to him. I'm a tree whisperer and a tree talker. And I'm here to give you his message. Um, esteemed mayor and city council members, my name is Andrea and I um, am a tree talker. I'm here to represent Tom, um, the tree in question whom the landlord and the city wish to remove based upon a complaint you received or complaints. I'm here to tell you that I spoke to Tom directly. People videotaped me. And it was in regards to um, a fundraising event that happened on January 9th on Walnut in 2024. Tom is precisely 254 years old, he told me personally. He's six years older than the founding of this country. He is greatly appreciative of having a chance to be heard, and these are his words. Hello, I am Tom, a 254-year-old California redwood. The city of Santa Cruz was literally built around the surviving trees, my brothers, that were not cut down during the clearing that took place before the city structures were built. I have, been, I have seen many changes in what is now the city of Santa Cruz. I'm one of the few remaining redwoods of the city. I'm a guardian of the city, as are the other redwoods that still exist in the area. We look after the city energetically, bringing forth energies of protection and love to Santa Cruz and all of its residents. I have happily been in my spot until now. Andrea has been very kind in helping me to speak to all of you city council members. I ask you now to please do not remove me from my home. This has been my home, my place, since birth 254 years ago. There's no need to remove me. I pose no threat. My roots are very strong, and I pose no threat to anyone. The city council needs only to please fix the sidewalk. There is running water underneath the sidewalk that loosens the cement, erodes it from, the under, uh, erodes it from underneath the apartment building. Your city council arborist and you as council members are invited to hear what I have to say directly uh, to you through Andrea. She's my official representative in this matter. I again urge you to not cut me down as it would upset the balance of the trees in Santa Cruz because guardian trees are not as plentiful anymore. Not as plentiful as they used to be. I urge you to come speak to me directly with Andrea as my representative and translator. Hear me out first before making your decision. If you do decide to cut me down, the trees in the area will not recover, and a sickness will take hold among the trees, and they will choose to perish. Leaving an opening. Just let me finish this. About leaving an opening. Seconds. Take about five seconds. Leaving an opening for many negative things to be in the area of Santa Cruz. Ari Andrea will concur on a time and meeting. Space Thank you very much. And directly, well, just let me finish. No, I'm not going to let you finish. You had your time. Thank you very much. You're 22 seconds over. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We're going to take the next person online. Is there someone else online? Thank you. We'll take that person. Good afternoon. All right. Well, will I, well, okay. Let me, before I, I leave, will you all meet with me? No. To speak but, with Tom. Your comment, your, your opportunity is finished now. It, it's not an opportunity. I'm asking, I'm no, actually you, extending an invitation. We don't engage you in a conversation. Your time is over. I know my time is over, but I would and like to know if- please step away from the dais. I just need to know if you are willing. No, we're not, we're not engaging you in the conversation you want to engage in. Please it's just step away. It's a question to all of you, your members. We're not doing that with you. I, I just please need to know away. if you would meet with me with Please Tom. step away. Look, I just need to know, would uh, the council members be willing okay. to Cut meet Cut off with the Tom? microphone. We stand in recess. We're not going to do this all day. City council.
City Council is back in session. We are on item 26. We are under public comment. And before we resume that, Council is back in session following a brief recess. I am going to repeat myself for the sake of the people online. You have three minutes to make your comment. You do not have three minutes and one second, three minutes and 15 seconds, three minutes and 30 seconds, three minutes and 42 seconds. You have three minutes. At the end of three minutes, stop your testimony. That is how much time you have. If you don't stop your testimony, your microphone will be cut off. Good afternoon. Please proceed. <coughs> Hi, my name is Emily Love, and I've been here for uh, the last meeting and the meeting with Parks and Recreation as well regarding this issue. And um, I agree that it seems like not all the options were really considered before approving the application to remove the tree. Um, I think going in forward in the future, there should be more due diligence when considering removing a heritage tree which is why they have that designation in the first, first place. And uh, 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 it shouldn't be based off of the uh, appellants and community members that are going to the effort of trying to um, find alternative options. Um, I think that the local government should be responsible for finding um, all the options and not just coming to a quick conclusion of remove the tree. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that um, there has been a lot of community support shown through public comments previously and today and all the funds that were raised for this issue. So I think that there is a lot of um, evidence that this is an important issue. And also, it seems like removing the tree isn't the perfect solution. Um, uh, there is that river running underground, and it could, could cause a lot of problems. So I think that there should be um, all those is issues should be considered going forward. Thank you. We have someone online. We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Veronica Elzey, and just in case anyone was not at the September meeting, I am the blind person who complained about the sidewalk and how challenging it has gotten. And I just want to say that I love this tree. I love this town. I'm a longtime resident of Santa Cruz. I'm not a tree expert. I don't know anything about the geology, I really don't know the answers, but I do know that, please remember that part of this discussion is pedestrian safety. I kind of cringed when I heard Ralph Myberg describe the intersection, you know, and how scary it was, you know, as I go walk out in the street and then guess at some random point to get back up in the sidewalk. 
and I don't know how far it is to a driveway. I just know my dog now takes me to some random spot and we step up on the curb, but I don't know what that's like for someone who's using a mobility device, how far out of the way they have to go. And I just, at some point during my lifetime would really like to be able to just cross straight and have a nice sidewalk, however it looks. And I, like I said, I, I love these trees, but even just since it's been cordoned off, everybody's telling me how much messier it's getting. And like I said, I really don't know the answer and I appreciate everything I've heard today and what I've learned. And I'm glad that the discussion came up again about the Hill, but please remember it's not just a community versus a profit center, it's pedestrian safety and someone who really wants to be able to safely enjoy this wonderful town we live in. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Anyone with us in council chambers wish to provide further testimony? Seeing and hearing none, do we have anyone else left online? How many? Uh, one. one. We'll take that person. Good afternoon and welcome to the council meeting. Hi, uh, my name's Connell Wilson. I lived in Santa Cruz all my life. I lived downtown just by the clock tower uh, for several years. And I remember when the when the willow tree on Squid Row was cut down. I know that that was certainly a, a sad event for a lot of the community. And from what I understand, this tree being cut down will again be another tragedy kind of for the community and a major loss in terms of our kind of culture and um, community of being definitely a, a forest area and a, a very nature loving community. Um, I just wanted to take the, the opportunity to say that I remember growing up with that tree. I loved having it there as I had my youth in downtown Santa Cruz. And I hope that it's still there when I get a chance to move back. I'm actually calling in from Denver, Colorado right now. But this is such a, a part of the community. I've heard about it even being out of state now. And I hope that I'll have the opportunity to still see that tree when I come back to Santa Cruz to visit. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All testimony having ceased, the matter is back before the council. Are you trying to get my attention? You good? Okay. All right. All public testimony having ceased, the matter is back before the council. Recognize the council member for an action. Anybody offering a motion here? Mr. Newsom is recognized. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. I'll, um, I'll make a motion. Uh, uh, I'll make a motion to approve uh, the staff recommendation to deny the appeal and uphold the Parks and Recreation Commission's approval of uh, tree removal permit TR 23-0089. Uh, but I do want to also, uh, with the added direction uh, that's presented here on the screen, uh, one, uh, I'm sorry, I th I'm through y'all. I reformatted it to be consistent with our motion language. Okay. The first part is the staff recommendation, and then two and three are your ads. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, with the added direction, or I'd like to uh, place the added direction, uh, in addition to planning of three required mitigation trees, direct staff to plant an additional six trees in the city by the end of 2024, and if necessary, make the budget adjustments to do so. Uh, and the appellant may work with the Parks and Recreation uh, Director and Urban Forester to help choose the six additional mitigation trees, uh, and to direct staff to bring forward a budget item providing an additional uh, full-time assistant urban forester in the Parks and Recreation Department during fiscal year 2025 budget hearings for a council consideration. There is a motion, is there a second? Second by the vice mayor. Under discussion, Mr. Newsom, please open on your motion. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, yeah, I, I first want to appreciate the appellants uh, and their concerns for this beautiful, majestic redwood tree. Uh, and I want to thank them for the, all of the work that they've done on this appeal and for bringing a, or on this appeal and for bringing attention to this tree. Uh, this is not a decision I like to make or particularly enjoy. Uh, however, we now have. Uh, several reports that show that the tree is having an adverse effect on the building. Three arbors reports, uh, two reports by a structural engineer, 
a report by a, by a plumber, and we um, one of the structural engineering reports that was provided by the appellant shows that it is having some effect on the building. Uh, so I do support um, uh, the staff recommendation. Uh, I do, though, think that the mitigation requirements for removal of this beautiful tree should be increased substantially, or at least by threefold. Uh, and I want to invite the appellants to have a say in the trees that will re replace these trees in our community and for our Parks and Recreation Department to work with them on this matter. Uh, and I also want to point out um, that the city has started working on a goal of planting 3,000 new trees by 2030 um, through our Street Tree Master Plan and through our Climate Action 2030 Plan. Yet there's only one urban forester in the Parks and Recreation Department to try to, um, to oversee this monumental task. Uh, so I think we should explore adding an additional full-time urban forester to our urban forest department during the fiscal year 2025 budget talks. Uh, and I will be advocating to accept this budget item at those talks as well. For the debate or discussion, Madam Vice Mayor. Thank you. I appreciate these uh, this additional language that you brought forward before us today, and I will be supporting um, this motion. This isn't a decision that any of us, I think, take lightly. And I think uh, last time we were really persuaded by the testimony of the public, but when taking the time to understand the direction before us to consider within our ordinance the expert testimony, um, it's clear to me that the tree needs to be removed um, at this point in time, and um, it's unfortunate. It is a beautiful tree, but given the evidence presented before us, this is what I feel like we need to do. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Brown, are you? Ms. Brown. So, okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple of comments I want to make here. Um, I'm not going to support the motion. Um, I appreciate it, the um, spirit in which it was brought forward, and I, I do think that um, our uh, very excellent and knowledgeable uh, urban forester could use some help. So I'm, I'm not opposed to that, and we'll look forward to considering that in, in the at budget time, um, and and I'm not uh, I'm not making this decision lightly, and it's not out of any uh, questioning of your expertise. Um, I understand the confines in which the decision is being made. I don't think we need to contain ourselves as a council to those confines. Um, I don't believe there is substantial evidence to make the findings today. We have conflicting expert reports, uh, made more challenging by the lack of access. Uh, to the site. I'm, I'm disappointed the property owner would not allow access, um, particularly now that I understand that one of the partners has a very high profile and very public commitment to urban trees. Um, that's disappointing. Um, the, the best practice of that uh, three phase three inspection would, um, I believe, have given us uh, some additional information that could be useful to us in making this decision and in um, acknowledging that the, the mitigations offered uh, are indeed reasonable. Um, I don't believe that mitigation measures were considered at all, really, by the city. Um, I'm disappointed the city spent, seemed to have spent more time uh, working to affirm the justification for cutting this tree. Uh, then looking at uh, the, the space and the circumstances more holistically, that location um, and, and what the dynamics there that go beyond the tree and um, property rights. Um, and I don't believe that um, those alternative approaches were seriously considered. Um, to deny this appeal is doing the expedient thing. And we don't have to do that. We, the, the Heritage Tree Ordinance does not require us to do that. Um, that is a choice that we can make, and I'm not willing to uh, vote to do the expedient thing because it's going to be cheaper, and in the distribution of risk, it's going to help the city. Um, I believe there are other reasons to be um, concerned about this, and I don't believe we have the information that we could have had we um, been more... Uh, committed to doing so, and what I had hoped that my original motion would, uh, that I made back in October, would elicit. It didn't, um, but here we are. Um, <clears throat> you know, I just want to say really quickly, um, I would challenge <laughs> any of you to find uh, a building that was built around this time or earlier, 
um, that doesn't have some cracks in the foundation and, and it, certainly the facade of the foundation. This is not um, a situation where um, there is is great risk aside from consideration of legal risk. That's what's happening here. Um, so um, the mayor mentioned on an earlier agenda item, and I just have been thinking about this. Um, uh, what, you know, what is it like to when we're making these decisions play checkers or chess? This is a checkers move. Um, it's an expedient move. I, I can't support it. Um, I wish we had a little bit more uh, will to consider how to move forward in a way that I think we, you know we could find with with these property owners. So I'll be voting no. Councilmember Brenner. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I had a quick question regarding the motion, um, and that was on the, the uh, additional direction for full-time arborists, and I'm wondering if anybody at Parks and Rec can just briefly speak to that. Is that something that has been discussed or is in process already? I really don't know, um, and I was just curious um, that that was put in. Thank you for that question, Councilmember Brenner. Travis Beck, Superintendent of Parks. Uh, the Urban Forestry Department in the past had more robust staffing. We had an urban forester, a field crew leader, and supporting parks maintenance workers and administrative staff. All of those staff were lost during several rounds of budget cuts. Um, we brought before the council in 2021 the Street Tree Master Plan. One of the recommendations of that plan was to uh, restore uh, necessary staffing to the urban forestry office and uh, the assistant urban forester position was one of the positions called out um, in that report which was adopted by council additionally it's something that uh, we have included as a possible item in our uh, budget and budget narrative for the um, urban forestry grant we've received from the forest service so there may be opportunities um, to get that at least partially funded through that grant. Thank you. I, I do remember the tree master plan and, and now that you mention it, there was um, um, talk of that. So um, thank you for that. Um, a couple of things I remember at our last hearing on this item, um, you know, we have the determination to make on this on this tree, and I didn't feel there was enough data to really support making a judgment and making a decision on this tree. Um, so I appreciate uh, the additional information and the additional data that has been presented. Um, I kind of found it interesting to learn um, and read um, on the engineers' uh, peer and beam grade, uh, peer and grade beam foundation, the Catavillier floor system, the retaining wall system. It's pretty fascinating. Um, although I think the, you know, despite how everyone feels about the tree, and despite um, uh, some of the opinions or the statements said, we have to go with the expert data. And really, it has been clear that the, the root ball is responsible for the foundation to the structure, to this building, to these 18 homes where, where our residents live. And there is a huge safety component, a public safety issue here that's very concerning. And, um, you know, another thing I learned, too, is that there are many heritage tree removal requests that come forward that are resolved at a staff level and we don't even see those because they are denied at a staff level because I was curious how often what how often does this come up and um, so thank you for speaking to you know some of the the process and how when these requests do come up there are mitigation measures explored um, and not just an immediate acceptance of a heritage tree removal and in this case as the city attorney has laid out I um, um, will be supporting the motion because it does clearly um, define that this there is structural integrity due to the tree so thank you 
Ms. Watkins is recognized. Thank you. Um, I too want to thank our community members and my colleagues for the thoughtful discussion. I mentioned this at the last time. I don't like these items. Nobody wants to cut down the trees in our community. They're extraordinary. They're beautiful. We all love them. And we are stuck in situations like today where they don't interface with our environment and our neighborhoods. And I was reminded by the woman who came forward who had tripped because she was visually impaired and we're weighing all of those considerations. I wanna thank uh, my colleague for the additional recommendation. I wanna thank our um, urban forester, um, Ms. Keeley. I think I've sat here in uh, a number of these and I know uh, confidently that as a professional in this field, you do your fine work to assess it, to make sure that we aren't um, unnecessarily brought these decisions before us, because nobody wants to do that. Um, so I, I, I wanted to make those comments. I did have uh, either a suggested uh, addition or just consideration is what I've heard also is when these trees are removed that there leaves a void. And I was wondering if we ever track that after removal to understand the impact and that could be a consideration that we have in place or how that's factored into mm -hmm. the science um, for a, a lay person's kind of language associated with that. So maybe that's um, just a potential suggestion. I don't know if it needs to be a formal uh, addition but I wanted to bring that up and I'm seeing. Uh, I think that's a great suggestion, but I think it can be just a. Okay, a consideration. Formally given to staff. I don't think it needs to be part of the motion. Perfect, okay, great. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, anyways, so in, in understanding the challenging um, components of these types of, of decisions, I, I too plan to support the motion before us. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Collins, Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I'll keep it brief. Um, I will also be supporting this motion. Um, it's really difficult to vote in this way. I think we've heard that across the dais. Um, we, if, if, I'm glad that we took the pause. Um, I'm glad that we went in the direction that we did um, because several months ago when we looked at this, I didn't feel that I had enough information and I really appreciate the work that went into providing us with that information and I don't see a feasible path forward. Um, I don't think we are um, responding blindly. We've done our due diligence and unfortunately, I don't see a way for us to be able to maintain this building um, and move forward. So I'll be supporting, um, sadly, but I think it's the right decision. I'll be supporting this um, motion and I do wanna thank Councilmember Newsom for the additions. So the debate or discussion, uh, Councilmember Newsom, uh, Ms. Bush, if we could put the motion back up. Thank you. Under your third item there, would you accept the following addition? It's one word between, uh, it would be direct staff to bring forward a proposed budget item in that we don't make, we don't predetermine budget items. Second item is where it says fiscal year 2025. The actual budget is the fiscal year 2425 fiscal year. If you would take those two as minor technical amendments, that'd be appreciated. Would that work for you? Yes, accepted. Would that work for the second? Okay, thank you. Um, there's a hit, there's an issue in your head and an issue in your heart, <laughs> I think for most people here right now. And I think the issue in our heart is, we love this redwood tree too. Uh, the issue in our head is that we have this quasi-judicial function that we have to perform here. Uh, I had the great privilege of serving for 12 years on the board of directors of the Semper Firens Fund, which is the state's oldest uh, forest conservation uh, nonprofit organization founded in 1906. And uh, the sole purpose of that foundation then and today is to preserve redwood habitat, redwood trees and redwood habitat because it is in such a narrow a band where it can grow, which has now with climate change, things are even more challenging. The redwood really, really uh, depends upon a, a regular 
twice a day, fog coming in and out so that the evapotranspiration, which is to say watering the tree through its limbs and its leaves, uh, that that's a very big part of how it survives. And as climate change moves along, uh, that band of where redwoods can grow is getting narrower and narrower. So I think that the, the notion of saving redwoods and their habitat, what we can do on the climate change side, what we can do elsewhere is very, very important. Um, also, when I was in the legislature, I authored the two largest park and environmental protection bonds in the nation's history. And we set aside, that was a $5.3 billion. And in that, we set aside a half a billion dollars for redwood forest conservation, preservation, and enhancement. The reason I say all that is to say I don't think there's a lack on this city council by any member uh, about understanding the environment in which we live and what we appreciate, what we try to do about that. I do think that in this quasi-judicial capacity now about this one redwood tree. Uh, I think that uh, based on the evidence by experts, which is we were told by our city attorney, uh, it's interesting to hear someone say, well, there's a river going under something. Uh, that person didn't purport to be an expert. It doesn't seem to me we can weigh that. Someone's not, a, not an expert, doesn't assert to be an expert. A lot of assertions were made. I think that what we're constrained to is the actual evidence in the record supported uh, by documentation and people who have the requisite knowledge, licenses, et cetera, uh, to weigh in on this. And for my part of this, I have the same reluctance I think other council members have. It, it, in my heart, I want to see it there. In my head, I don't see how, given the current ordinance, how we can do anything except uh, deny the appeal and approve uh, the uh, the uh, applicant's uh, application to be able to take down that tree. Sadly, uh, the city clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. No. Watkins. Aye. Brunner. Aye. Helen Tari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. And Mayor Keeley. All right, motion passes and so ordered. We are going to take a 10 minute recess. We will be back here at 15 minutes to four and we'll stand in, in recess until such time. City Council is back in session following our afternoon recess. Uh, we will now take up item number 27. This is a community-wide climate action plan 2030 one-year progress report. Dr. Wise-West, thank you and your team for very, very good work, and please proceed. Thank you very much, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council Members and Mayor. <laughs> Tiffany Wisebus, the Sustainability and Resiliency Officer for the City of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm going to be talking today with a little bit of background, remind us of our targets, um, talk about our progress update, and hit some highlights on what our work plan is for this calendar year. I want to begin by acknowledging our internal sustainability team, our external community-wide climate action task force, and a multitude of partners, both on the local and regional level, that make this work possible. Climate is highly collaborative, and we will not achieve the transformative work that we need to without these partnerships. So I really wanted to start with that and also thank you for your continued support. Santa Cruz remains a leader in climate, both amongst our peers locally and across the nation, if not worldwide. And that doesn't happen without your support and leadership. So I'm gonna share with you today uh, the highlights of our progress report. We did have a very dense um, agenda report, and I wanna thank those groups again for helping to refine them in addition to the department heads. So just by way of background, for those of you that may be new to um, the climate space here at the city, we did first adopt our climate action plan in 2012. Um, we followed that up in 2022 with our 2030 plan that we are now implementing. 
Importantly, we adopted at the same time a three-year implementation work plan, which guides us as staff, our work both internally and with our partners. Another notable uh, thing that happened this past year is that we were one of the partners that stood up. I serve as vice chair on the Monterey Bay Regional Climate Project Working Group, which last year wrote $30 million in grants alone for transformative climate work in our region. Um, and we continue to um, work this year on, particularly in the environmental justice space and electrification of uh, buildings and vehicles. I also think it's notable to mention that between 2021 and 2023, we achieved for the first time an A or an A minus rating with the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is our effort at being transparent in how we are approaching climate and what we're doing. Everything from emissions mitigation to climate adaptation is what we report on. And we stand among the top 10% of all reporting cities in the world that report. You can see, and it's not a big surprise on the right-hand side, our latest greenhouse gas emissions inventory is from 2019, where transportation by large uh, measure is the greatest source of our emissions for those sectors that are regulated. So there are other sectors, particularly around carbon sequestration and trees that are not regulated by the state, but we do include um, in our climate action plan. Um, I also wanna note that Every department does have a one-year work plan um, that we set at the beginning of the year that, again, tears off that three-year implementation work plan. In terms of our emissions reduction um, targets, we do, of course, have a legal target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 40% from 1990 levels by 2030. That's this first column you see here in orange. And also recognizing the aspirational um, uh, nature of both our leadership and our community, we do have an aspirational target of carbon neutrality, meaning no net emissions, uh, zero emissions by 2035. Right now, we're unable to say whether we are on track with meeting our 2030 target, being only one year in. We will be uh, completing our 2022 greenhouse gas emissions inventory over this calendar year. Unfortunately, the data lags quite a bit. We just got our energy data from PG&E and so forth. And so it's, we're not able to really say, are we on track for our 2030 target quite yet? But next year at this time, I will be able to update you on um, we do have 152 actions in our climate action plan, which supports 18 quantifiable measures. And uh, notably, and I know health and all policies next, I'm, I'm with you for a while today, 91% um, of our 152 actions supports health and all policies, the three pillars of public health, sustainability, um, and equity. And so that's really a testament, I think, to the process that we went underwent in developing this plan with our equity lens, our equity advisors, and our equity focus. So I'm going to spend a little time on this slide because this is really kind of where the rubber hits the road in terms of where are we making progress and where are we maybe lagging a little bit behind. So this is called a wedge diagram. And what you're seeing here are our 2019 emissions over on the left-hand side, and then where we want to get to um, make our, um, our climate action plan target, which is 181,000 uh, metric tons, which requires us to reduce 76,000 uh, metric tons of carbon. All these letters here that you see correspond to the different quantifiable measures that we've adopted. BE is around building electrification, building energy, T's transportation, W's waste. Again, these are the sectors that are regulated by the state. So starting with building electrification, we are behind on achievement of our emissions reductions from building electrification. As you know, um, we did have to suspend our natural gas ban, um, which put us at a gap where we had new mixed fuel buildings come in. Um, however, you all did adopt um, a replacement reach code um, which is, a, is good news for us. But in the meantime, we had to peel off existing building electrification, which I know is going to be you know, very challenging for us. We're picking that back up this year, and we will be adopting or bringing forward some programming or ordinances by the end of the year on existing buildings. But we are a year behind on that. So with building electrification, we're slightly behind on the achievement of uh, BE1, BE2, and BE3. 
In terms of transportation, it also is hard to ascertain progress here because of the data lags. And um, we do know that the data that we have is mostly from the COVID era where telecommuting went up and all of our different mode shares went down, biking, public transit, and so forth. However, we also know that our public works team is making so much progress on grants, um, infrastructure and programming. Our community partners are helping with that programming. And so I do expect to see shifts the next time the census data comes around. So we will report on that uh, when we have that next. Um, also, uh, measure, so those are measures T1 to T2. T4 to T6 pertain to electric vehicles, and unfortunately, we are not where we should be in the first of eight years of implementation yet. Um, we, were, we had a large grant with the Monterey Bay Regional Climate uh, Project Working Group for $15 million to try to scale up our public EV infrastructure, which is the enabling condition that we as a municipality have control over, and we found out just this month we didn't get it. However, we will leverage that grant proposal, and we're gonna go snag some of the IRA funds that are left over. So um, while we are a little bit behind here, um, we do have things in place to get that money and get that infrastructure in place to enable um, electric vehicle procurement by our residents and our business owners. Um, lastly, in terms of our waste measure, which is the sole W on the screen here, we are on track, and that's thanks largely to our food scrap collection program that Public Works has put in place in compliance with state law. Um, so I'm very happy to report on that. One other um, high point, and this is bittersweet coming um, kind of after the, the, uh, the item that you just heard, is that although carbon sequestration in trees are not part of the state regulated sector, we do have a target for those, and we are on track with that, with the 3,000 trees that Council Member Newsom mentioned in the prior um, item. And uh, I wanna highlight the $1 million grant that Parks and Rec did receive that's really gonna allow us to ramp up um, the uh, installation or the planting of those trees and the care of those trees. Um, notably, we also are building tree planting into a lot of our other grant proposals, like for example, our uh, pump station number one rehab project. Um, so to the extent, and the HUD Pro Housing Grant that you all heard um, late last year. So to the extent we can, we're trying to kind of leverage other um, grant uh, and project opportunities to, to put more trees in. So. Um, just some highlights there, you know, although we have kind of a mixed report card when it comes to the quantitative measures, from a qualitative standpoint, we have a really good story to tell here. And I'm not going to review all of these kind of key high impact activities. These are the activities that um, achieve the greatest emissions reductions. But suffice it to say that there's a lot going on here at the city. Um, we have three new P uh, solar PV stations, lots of energy efficiency work lots of act active transportation improvements. Um, we notably, and something this was council was very interested in the past, is the fleet electrification plan or roadmap. Um, we do have a big grant pending with our regional climate project working group that would allow us to procure 31 electric vehicles and all the charging, taking us through compliance with state regulations to 2030. So cross our fingers, we're gonna be getting that grant. Um, we, of course, have the new REACH code in place, and then we're doing some of this programming, like this partnership with the library on electric induction cooktops, a loaner program that people can check out so they can try them out if they're in the market to buy. And then, of course, I've already highlighted the food scrap collection. Um, I've mentioned already the collaboration um, with the Climate Project Working Group, but I also want to note the nascent Monterey Bay Climate Justice Collaborative that's launching. And I wanna thank um, Mayor Keeley and Council Member Watkins who are gonna be participating um, in an upcoming grant funded uh, project to deepen relationships with environmental justice groups and evaluate how we can bring them into decision making in a, in a more holistic kind of way around climate investments and what kinds of grants we go for and what we fund. Um, so that's very exciting happening, and thank you once again for that. And then lastly, just um, a little uh, preview on what's ahead in this year, what's on our work plans. And this is not everything, but we have the active transportation plan update coming up. We have, again, 
tons of electrification going on um, for uh, our fleet and charging. We are right now trying to get funded our municipal uh, facility decarbonization roadmap, and there's several um, kind of offshoots of that happening. I've already mentioned existing buildings. Um, we are also looking at a gas leaf blower ban, which you will be hearing more about over the next six months, and I've already mentioned planting a lot of trees. The other port part here that I really want to emphasize here is that, you know, we've picked off a lot of the low-hanging fruit here at the city. We've done it all. And what's ahead is really going to be difficult. And the change management piece is super important when it when we have kind of taken advantage of all the easy kinds of things. Um, we really need to institutionalize processes, policies, and accountability. And that's why we have, um, we through our carbon fund, we're going to be funding a change management project to really look at how can we institutionalize processes, policies, and accountability that really is going to support us and create those enabling conditions and achieving um, our climate goals. So lastly, I will say, not. I think the other really, the, the wonderful thing about this space with climate is that not only are we seeking to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions, but we know that there are so many co-benefits that go along with this. New jobs, improved indoor and outdoor air quality, which means better health outcomes, and community resilience. So again, I want to thank you for your continued support, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have um, about this report, and I do have our staff recommendation here um, for your convenience. Well, Dr. Wise-West, thank you very much, and thanks to the folks who serve on the task force that works with you in this regard. Let me open this up to council member questions, comments on this item. Ms. Bruner. <laughs> Thank you for that update. I was really happy to see where we're behind and where we're on track meeting our goals. Um, so that was really helpful. I guess my question is, um, what kind of um, communications out to the public and, and the community are we doing around this uh, progress report? And can we make sure that we're sharing wide and far these updates? We can do so, certainly. We didn't have anything planned, but um, I can work with our team to create kind of an infographic or a snapshot, so to speak, that, that would we, be great. That Thank we can you. put out through our social media. One thing we do have planned that, unfortunately, we were not able to do, even though we had committed to do so last year due to capacity constraints, is have our um, community roundtable on climate. And so now that we have some support um, from the communications team, we have our management analyst on board, we're already in the works of planning that for late summer. And that's going to be a really a time for us to showcase all of the myriad of climate work that's going on, but also have some uh, productive conversations, sharing progress, but also kind of hearing from our partners and the community on various topics. Okay, great. And is the city webpage still up with all that? Yeah, it information. is. Great. Yes, and the webpage is current. All of this will great. go on to our webpage as well. And I also encourage folks to uh, participate in our community wide climate action task force. Mm -hmm. um, folks are able to come on every other month onto that meeting where we're really getting into the meat and the nitty gritty of our work plan items. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Thank you so much for the report and all the work. I think one of the reasons why we are on the leading front of this is because of your contributions and your leadership. Um, one question I have is, and maybe you covered this and I missed it, what are the different indicators for the transportation mm -hmm. measure? Sure. So there are several transportation members. T1 and T2 pertain. T1 is active transportation. So bikes and walking. T2 is public transportation. Um, and T4 is related to things like uh, landscaping equipment and other um, off-road equipment that uses gas. T5 um, and T6 are related to electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging. So those are transportation-related measures. Well, hopefully we'll see that T2 shift tremendously with all the work the Metro is doing. Yes, Thank you. I hope so. And green, green hydrogen, must be green hydrogen. Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Watkins is recognized. Thank 
Thank you so much for the report and the work and um, also just for your transparency and, and wanting to keep it a transparent document, but also our ability to accomplish a lot of the low-hanging kind of items that we could accomplish easily, but knowing that some of the big, um, more challenging issues are before us, so I really appreciate that. Um, I have two two questions, and one's kind of a big question, so if you can just say it's complicated, that's fine. And that's in regards to, I think, what is kind of percolating around the um, concerns around the sourcing for electrification and for the batteries for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the first question, and I know there's discussion and debate about that. Obviously, a complicated answer, so only if you if you so choose to go there. Um, but I, I just, I think it's something that people are hearing about, mm -hmm. and so how are we thinking about that? Mm -hmm. And then in the other is with the environmental justice, as we're thinking about, you know, the infrastructure, and I know you said this is forthcoming, but, you know, are we thinking about building, um, you know, the, the charging stations in areas that are um, less resource mm -hmm. and how are we prioritizing those? And I think that's what I am, I know or you're um, uh, alluding to when you say that, but I think it's great to think of the tangible examples of that. So if you have any more. Absolutely. Well, thank you for asking about the batteries. We definitely have uh, an item in our climate action plan that pertains to end of life of both um, EV batteries, even uh, solar PV panels, which are considered hazardous waste at the end of the life. Um, so first of all, um, our landfill and our, or our resource recovery folks, they do deal with the solar PVs and make sure that those are dissembled and, and sent in the right way. In terms of EV batteries, it's not a well-known fact that here in California that recycling of EV batteries, is the, it, there's actually a market for that. Um, I don't have much more than that, but I can certainly bring that back. It's not something we've been focused on. Um, however, in some of these grants that we've been applying to, we've been putting that in as a placeholder of something that needs to be addressed. So for example, um, the uh, FHWA grant that we didn't get, that was written in, and then our uh, California Air Resources Board grant that has that written in as well. So we are hoping to be able to address that um, with the existing markets and try to support legislation around bolstering those markets. Um, in terms of environmental justice, you have it spot on. When we worked with our partners in the Climate Project Working Group across the Monterey Bay, understanding where there were disadvantaged or low-income communities. Technically, we don't have what's the Cal and Virus Green uh, disadvantaged communities here in Santa Cruz, but we do have low-income census block tracts. Um, we prioritize those first. Now, there is a complication to that when you think about the beach flats. You know, parking is a premium there. Mm -hmm. And so how much are you going to sacrifice parking for electric vehicles? So there's a very fine balance there with that. And that's something we've been in communications with um, both Ecology Action and Community Bridges who are working on the outreach to the Latinx community and specifically the Beach Flats. And we've kind of come to a conclusion of as they're walking fo folks through the procurement process to buy EVs, as they come on board, well, we know how many chargers are going to be needed, right? And so let's try to keep that matched and synced up. Um, so it's certainly something that's a priority for us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, tremendous work, as always. Um, and, and I'm really struck this time as I'm looking at the quantitative progress summary, the, the measurements, the, the complexity of just being trying to track this stuff and, and the work that you all have done to um, try to make that legible, right? So when we talk about transparency, it's like, how do we even present, how do we even analyze what's happening and you know what, what are what are so great just incredible work I'll just leave it there um, and I'm going to ask a question that uh, something that my students have been asking me recently in some of my classes and I hate the question but I'm going to do it anyway <laughs> um, it, it's, we've got there, there are a lot of um, areas in which there we have work to do um, and you, you've suggested that the low-hanging fruit, you know, we've done an incredible job in large part due to your leadership. Um, I'm so glad you're getting more of a team these days. Um, what's the, if there was one, like the one most difficult thing that you think would be the most impactful that we really have to work on, I recognize they're all important and you're not gonna 
dismiss any of them, but what's the one thing that we need to focus on to make the most impact? It's transportation, mm -hmm. and without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So in the realm of transportation, um, we got we have a lot of carrots um, to try to get people out of their cars. Um, we're not we can't tell people don't drive your car. I can't even tell myself sometimes when I know I'm not supposed to, uh, <laughs> or I shouldn't be. <laughs> um, so electrification. Uh, yes, if you look at this wedge diagram that's on the screen yeah. here, you see the biggest reductions are under T4. That's electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. The other two, um, uh, T1 and T2, are uh, related to active transportation. I did see Claire come on. I, she maybe was going to add some color there, and I totally would welcome that if she does um, want to. But that is where we're going to see our biggest, um, our biggest emissions reductions. But again, right, we can't mandate folks buy electric vehicles. Um, we have to create the enabling conditions, and that's the chargers, that's advocating for the incentives at Central Coast Community Energy and at the state level. It's applying for those big federal grants and landing them so that our partners like Ecology Action can do the advocacy and the engagement. Um, that's everything that we're doing, and it's just a matter of scaling it up. And I don't know if Claire has anything she wants to add, but the active transportation piece on public transportation is, is very important as well. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Tiffany. Claire Gologly, Transportation Planner and Public Works. And to tear off of what Tiffany was saying about electrification, we work a lot on active transportation infrastructure and programs to make walking and biking easier and more accessible to people of all ages and abilities. And so we've been investing heavily in the types of infrastructure that we know help people make behavior changes. You see the rail trail, you see investments along the river walk, you see us investing in our sidewalk and bike lane network. And so um, removing barriers and then having those carrots for incentives for downtown. We have our Go Santa Cruz program. We give out free bus passes. We give out um, free B-Cycle memberships. We give credit to use our bike lockers. We give people downtown dollars for using alternative transportation. And so making it as easy and accessible to choose to travel outside of single occupancy vehicle is one of our big goals. And I think our team kind of across the board has tried to make that as wraparound easy as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, one other exciting thing I think I'll mention just because you asked the question about electric vehicles. Um, the city is receiving a formula grant from the Energy Efficiency Conservation Black Block grant program. It's a federal grant program. It's only about $130,000, but um, over the past year, we've developed the concept of providing a rebate to our lower income employees here at the city to enable them to buy electric vehicles. And it's something that was an idea that sprung out of our um, energy project coordinator, Andy Shatney, had that idea. And we moved it up through our leadership and found support all the way through. So it's something I'm really excited about. And we're giving a generous enough uh, rebate to bring that cost down so that the, the monthly payment will be affordable at our folks that are at lower income salaries here at the city. Comments? Mr. Newsom. Oh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I um, yeah. just want to make a, a brief comment and just thank Dr. Wise West for all of her work on this plan and for pushing us to achieve the goals in this plan. Um, and also all of her work on the Climate Action uh, Task Force. I've, uh, I've been very happy to be on that task force and we've done a lot of great work. And it's really uh, great to see the progress that we've made on a lot of our goals and um, especially, you know, say within planting trees and planting and on track to plant uh, 3,000 new trees. And by my kind of calculations on this, it looks like we've planted around, say, 300 trees over the last uh, three years, which is really great, and hopefully we can continue that. But uh, just really great work, and I uh, just really want to thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Butler, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and sure. council members. I, I wanted to, I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the city, and just wanted to add um, one additional perspective on uh, the transportation area that Dr. Tiffany Wise West was mentioning, as well as our transportation planner, Clara Glogley. Um, from a land use perspective, we have um, both state laws and local laws that are reducing the number of parking required, the number of parking spaces that are required as part of new projects. And while we recognize that um, this is a difficult transition, 
where we're moving from a more auto-dominated and auto-centric society to one where we're promoting more biking and more walking and more public transit use. From a land use perspective, the reduction in the number of parking spaces is helping to encourage that choice of additional cost uh, to own a vehicle, uh, additional challenges to find uh, a parking space, um, a, uh, a premium that may be paid um, for uh, renting a parking space rather than automatically getting one with a uh, with an apartment. Um, all of those are also contributing to the um, increase use of bicycle transit uh, and um, pedestrian uh, transportation. So just wanted to add that land use perspective in as well because they all fit together in our, our climate efforts. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Adam. Thank you for the questions by our comments. At this point, we're going to go out and to the public and receive comments on this. Uh, uh, anyone with us today in chambers wish to comment on the report today, you would have three minutes to do so. Anyone with us? Ms. Bush, uh, please come forward. Hello, good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, uh, City Council. Uh, good to see so many friendly faces. Um, just want to remind everyone, introduce myself. My name is Ayo Banjo. Um, I do sit on the City uh, Climate Action Task Force, um, appointed by Mayor Keeley. Um, I get to serve with uh, Dr. Wise West um, all the time. Um, I just wanna say that I completely 100% support um, this package that she has proposed. Um, not only that, but um, you know, part of our job as a task force is to kind of figure out what the community like how to implement these plans the best way that really reach the community and that affects them in the most powerful way. And I think that part of what we're seeing and part of my assessment in our conversations with Tiffany is to see, you know, what are we missing in, in her team, in her office that can help her to execute these goals more effectively, to reach these goals, um, to be able to scale these goals. And so one of the things that we found that's needed is an increased staff capacity. Um, there's two particular positions that I'm really interested in seeing city council take um, investment in. Um, one of them is an energy manager, and the second one is a resilience planner. Um, the energy manager would be kind of responsible for developing sustainable energy solutions um, that would help to reduce our carbon footprint. And um, this is something that's going to be really impactful for the team in terms of understanding, you know, how do we actually implement some of these energy goals that we have for 2030 and beyond. Um, the resilience manager is really, you know, going to be in charge of kind of responding to some of these CCU fires, responding to the flooding that's going on on West Cliff, making sure that the city is always at the front edge of being the most prepared um, in charting multiple different alternatives and solutions um, to their approaches. And so these two particular positions, I think, will help to not only ensure that we have the staff capacity to meet and reach our goals, but also to make sure that we are presenting ourselves as an environmental leader um, for not just the city, but the state and the nation, um, and that we fulfill our responsibility to the community by doing that. So um, as, a, as a Climate Action Task Force member, I think this is a really important investment that the City Council should be taking into consideration. And as you're drafting your budget proposals and you're thinking about what are those investments um, that you're trying to think about in, for the next couple of months, I think this should be a critical priority um, to help us reach our goals. And I just want to say thank you again uh, to the City Council and to Dr. Wise West for all your work. Mr. Banjo, thank you to you for your service on the task force and your other good work in the community. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone online? One person with their hand raised. We'll take the person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Yes, hello. Yeah, this is good. Hey, uh, well, just, uh, you know, nothing personal, but just listen. Uh, the high up charter poison is more leftist ideology on steroids now trying to take credit for any improvement in well-being conditions without proof of correlation, actual positive net accomplishment, and missing reliable comparative data. This report notes how policies should embrace a fourth racist DEI diversity discrimination without apology or remorse and promote spending public monies to support DEI indoctrination efforts in an attempt to, uh, well, an affront to free peoples. Assigning public budget monies to spend to these ends will destroy American values and beliefs, which is the aim of the cultural Marxists. You ignore your job as providing common city services, not publicly sponsoring anti-American values via mind control and creating a defective economic system of undeserved rewards that will cause harm and be an injustice. 
Your missing baseline data makes this so-called progress report an illusion of fakery. While tracking well-being is fine, assigning high up credit for any improvement while disregarding correlation to decreased well-being would be a cultural Marxist pawn. For instance, inflationary income increases happen anyway, and the passing of ever higher undeserved living wage increases don't acknowledge the lost jobs and entry-level opportunity you destroy. When you mention your anti-discrimination progress, you admit your own of prejudice with outright discrimination intents toward white people. Racism comes in all colors and authorities. Another high up of misuse du jour is promoting the current globalist threats of humanity of climate change, existential crisis exaggeration, which will threaten the global food supply chain, energy availability, and draining the public of necessary monies for their well-being in typical totalitarian power fear-mongering. You spend public monies indoctrinating public employees at public expense with your high up propaganda when the city is in financial crisis of your doing and would benefit from a priority shift. You misuse the defective high up to justify socialist inroads into destroying <coughs> free markets and housing in the double speak of affordable housing. Uh, you explore opportunities to apply high up to compensation and hiring policies which de uh, defy a merit-based equal opportunity approach which has served the country amazingly well until its planned destruction by DEI and IOP illogic. Now, similar policies threaten our national defense and public safety, promoting unqualified and overcompensated people to positions they are not qualified for except by diversity, race, or gender. Harvard diversity hiring brought about an unqualified plagiarist president committed to DEI Asian discrimination. You throw the slur against all white people or of white supremacy around, but you don't define it or give wide evidence of it. Your faulty CO2 emissions fear mongering doesn't alter the fact nothing Santa Cruz does will ever control the climate of the planet Earth. It's all big time. Massive of people promote central Thank control you. authoritarian. Thank you. Anyone else with us? Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting, sir. Hi, my name is Cosmo, and um, I was thinking that maybe by expanding the capacity of maybe climate employees and things that I heard were just talked about would be a very good way to bring outreach to maybe younger people, college students, and everything that could maybe be talking about excluding diversity. I know that that could also be a way to kind of negate what some people think about climate and I don't know the how it goes with, but... Uh, wage disparities in terms of, I don't know, some people's reservations, bringing it to the youth is, there could be temp positions, all sorts of things like that, that could, I don't know, kind of help maybe negate, negate some of the reservations that we just heard or something like that. So I think the expansion is kind of on the right track. I don't, I don't know how to speak in terms of like how to address maybe some of the comments we just heard, but I think that could be a good like restatement to talking about maybe what some people we just heard said. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, sir. We appreciate it. Anyone else online? We do. Let's go to the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Just put the hand down. All right. Uh, anyone else with us who wish to make comment on this? Matter is back before the body. Uh, and uh, there is a recommendation, Ms. Wise West, if you, or Dr. Wise West, if you kind enough to put that back up, I believe it is to accept the report. Um, I'll make that motion. There is a motion by Council Member Watkins and a second by Council Member Newsom to uh, accept the progress report. Um, under debate and discussion, if I might, for a moment, uh, Dr. Wise West, thank you. This is, this is very good stuff. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. We know that. You're measuring it. We're managing it. We're making progress. That's great. It'll never be as much as we want, but we're always pushing hard to, to get to that net zero uh, place. Uh, as you know, you, city manager, and I have been in a bit of a conversation, given the importance of this issue, to perhaps consider uh, taking the task force, given how broad it is in terms of touching virtually every department of city government, in terms of taking care of business ourselves and 
and, and, and being good in that regard as an institution and also reaching out into the community and, and encouraging um, broad-based participation in that, the public sector, private sector, individuals, and so on. We've, we've been in a bit of a conversation that maybe it is time uh, to consider elevating the task force to a commission so that what we're doing is it has the standing inside this institution that other important subject matters have. Our planning commission, our parks commission, our public works commission, our parks, and we're going to go through appointments to those in a little bit today. But the idea of elevating this uh, to a commission, which I think underscores the city's commitment and I know that we're, we've not worked out every detail on that, but I wanted to daylight that to council members and to the public and thank Dr. Wise West for her participation in this conversation about how we take this. And uh, as a gentleman who's talking about, and people online have said, uh, how it is we make a deeper reach into the community. They know what we're doing, we're soliciting their participation and so on. So I don't believe that what we need to do is add any language to the motion, but instead to uh, thank and encourage both Dr. Wise West and the city manager to work with me to determine whether or not uh, that kind of elevation makes sense on this subject matter. And if it does, uh, we will be back to the council in, uh, in, in a month or two to review this, uh, this question with the entire body. But again, Dr. Wise West, thank you very, very much for all of your very fine work. We appreciate it. You're welcome, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any further questions or comments? And the vice mayor is recognized. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and while I was listening to you, I kind of overheard a side comment about green hydrogen technology. And I've been at, I, I don't know anything about this, mm -hmm. but I've recently learned that my sister's professor up at UCSC, Bokhtan Singaram, and some of his colleagues have been working on this development up at UCSC. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but we have an initial meeting set up with them and I, I'd love to invite you and um, I just think it's really exciting that some of this new technology is being developed right here in our own chemistry labs. So, sure, I'd be happy to participate yeah. in that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it'd be really cool. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Further questions or comments? <clears throat> Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I would just add, um, I've already said Thank you. You're amazing. Keep up the good work. We want a team for you. I think that Mr. Banjo's recommendations make sense. Um, I'm not sure how you've been working on that or talking about that in the, your task force, but um, <laughs> want to see, you know, if, to the extent that you have thoughts on um, how we can actually support you with additional staffing rather than, for example, myself just saying it every time you come here. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, I, I want to support that. Uh, uh, a specific proposal, so um, please bring it. And um, I also uh, very much support the idea of moving towards a, a commission for level for this, um, you know, for this pur the purpose of uh, determining, you know, how we how we move through cl our climate action, how we. Um, you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, all the things. So thank you for raising that. I supported it in 2017 when it didn't get passed at this council, <laughs> but I will support it when it comes before us next time. Thank you. Yes, if I may, we are updating our research on that. We have twice brought this in front of the, this body, not this body specifically, but over the last eight years. So we're updating our research and we're targeting March to bring that or to have that continue that conversation. Very good. Further debate or discussion? Seeing, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Uh, I am going to abuse the privilege of the presiding officer. Uh, earlier today, we had conversation about. Uh, about aging in the community and 
how that all works out. And mm -hmm. as somebody who's ahead of most of you in that regard, uh, it's all good. There's no it, it, hardly any problems when you get older. Um, but I will say this: I, I'm I, on a on a note of personal privilege here. Uh, I, uh, I had the good fortune. My my father, who passed away quite some time ago, uh, at the end of his life for two or three years, he had a very happy life, and that was because he, he married my stepmom, and uh, uh, I have a couple of step-siblings, and they're wonderful people, and I have a brother who is a wonderful person, and uh, my brother, who in addition to being very successful back in the day in the Silicon Valley, um, is once and always a Marine. And uh, my family has come to really depend on my brother in so many ways over the years. And my, my stepmother uh, passed away last week at 92. And uh, my brother came out from New York and he's been managing a lot of things in her life as she's gotten older and my stepsibs came to town uh, for the end of her life last week. Uh, it was pretty foreseeable where, where she was and, and how things were were uh, proceeding. So when we were discussing that earlier today, I mean, I joked around about it a little bit. That was to keep me from <laughs> probably crying during, <laughs> during that conversation. Uh, but the reason I bring all this up is because my brother's here. My brother uh, <laughs> came into the chambers, and uh, he's here from New York. And, and uh, the Marines have landed, and they took good care of everything that needed to be taken care of. And I just want you all to welcome my brother, Terry, to the council chambers. Brother, I love you every day. And because he's my older brother, I will prohibit him from speaking to you. <laughs> All right, here we go. We are, on, we are on item number 28. This is health and all policies, and we're going to get an annual report here. And we have three council members who will take us through that. Your name is listed first, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. We'll start with you. Okay. I wasn't completely prepared to kick us off, but I will. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, did you? We have a brief presentation that and that I was going to show on your behalf. Okay. Literally five minutes, and okay. then I think you all were going to jump in with comments. All right, let's do that. Does that work for yes. you? I'm happy to take it whatever That's order. That's perfect. Please. Okay. All right. Very good. Let me let me do so then. Let me share the screen here. I lost my cursor. Okay, so just real briefly, um, similar to the climate action work, um, we wanted to share a little bit of background for those of you that may be new to the health and all policies um, world, talk about the progress update, the work plan, and the recommendations. So um, this work dates back to 2019 when uh, Council Member Watkins was mayor. Um, in that time, um, we were able to adopt um, uh, an ordinance, a city council policy that prioritized equity, public health, and sustainability in our government policy making and decision making. Um, in 2021, we adopted a three year work plan, which is what we tear off of for our annual work plans. Um, and in 2021, there was a complementary anti racial discrimination resolution adopted. Um, that not only recognize uh, the existence of racism and white supremacy in our community, but revive the Health and All Policy City Council Committee that's been meeting for the past two years. In addition to that, we've adopted Health and All Policy's community well-being indicator, met outcome indicator metrics, which we update every two years. We're getting ready uh, to complete that update in February of this year, so we'll bring that at our next annual update. Um, and we do have annual work plans for the committee. Um, in terms of progress, these are just the major highlights, the specific things that we had on our work plans, but there are other things like um, the age well designation that wasn't even on our work plan, right, that we are doing that supports health and all policies. So we joined the Government Alliance for Racial Equity, and that has served for, as a wonderful resource for us for technical assistance, to be able to engage with our other um, uh, colleagues across the country. Our management analyst regularly participates in those fora um, and has helped us to uh, tailor staff training. Um, we, of course, put together the HUD Pro Housing Affordable Housing and Climate Resilience Grant, which is I'm very particularly proud of. Um, we have a lot going on with workforce development. 
Um, and we implemented the City Like Me recommendations for increasing diversity and representation in city committees and commissions. A lot of this work is ongoing, and in particular, um, this last one here. We're, we're really just sharing a sna snapshot here. Um, one thing that um, we have made just a bit of progress on is making sure that we integrate health and all policies it, meaningfully addressing the pillars in the agenda reports. Only 11% of the council agenda reports coming forward addressed health and all policies, so that speaks to some internal training that we need to do to ensure that you have all the information you need to be making decisions um, and policy. On the right-hand side, you can see some of the results of our Santa Cruz uh, City Like Me recommendations, one of which is the committee is recommending to the council adopting targets for increasing Latinx and renters uh, uh, participation in committees and commissions. So that is one of the uh, recommendations that you'll see at the end here. And we continue to explore the integration of youth into committees and commissions along with um, some other uh, committees that the city is, uh, that's really taking the lead on the youth piece. Um, so coming ahead, we have CORE. You've heard about CORE coming up. I'm really excited about phase two of health and all policies in the budget that you're gonna see this fiscal year for decision making. Really exciting and I gotta thank finance on that. HR will be working, HR has been able to ramp up their capacity to address, this has been on our work plan for some time, the diversity, equity, inclusion and adding accessibility initiative and statement. Um, again, continue the Santa Cruz Like Me recommendations, and then also exploring the creation of an equitable citywide gas-powered leaf blower ordinance, which the Health and All Policies Committee, uh, City Council Committee, really wants to see through um, over this year. So that is the presentation, and there are some recommendations here. I want to turn it over to the committee members and thank them for their support, and I know that um, they might have some words to say, and they wanted to add a motion, which is in red on the screen here. Thank you, Dr. Wise West. Back to you, Ms. Conti okay. Johnson. Now I'll jump there in, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for all the work that you've put into this. Um, I think I'll, what I want to add is that um, I had the privilege of working with Council Member Watkins when this came forward before I was a council member. And this is something, this is a framework that she and I have been engaged in for decades in this community. So, so to see it here in our community and not just a commitment to it, but to really actualize and operationalize it is really something. Um, so we are, once again, a leader in this. Um, we've been asked to present with other communities to show um, not only how did we get here to adopt the ordinance, but what are we actually doing to, again, operationalize it. So um, Dr. Wise West showed some of the actions that we've accomplished over the last year and many more. Um, what, what the couple pieces that I really want to point out is that the commission work that's being done right now and that will be done in the coming years is going to be transformational for our community. You know, the implications of this is that we are really fostering diverse leadership through our commissions. Um, so the implications and the impacts, I think, will be really tremendous. Um, the other piece about the agenda report, you know, one can look at that and say, well, okay, that's a check mark, but it's beyond a check mark. Um, when I am, have worked on some agenda reports and I need to integrate equity, health, and sustainability, it really makes me think about that. It makes me think about what is the nexus, what is the alignment, how are we doing or not doing this? So I think that's a really key and important piece to see that percentage of agenda reports go from 11% to, I can't remember now. No, from 8% to 11%. 8% to 11%. So we got some work to do, but we're heading in the right direction. Um, and then the other piece I wanted to pull out was the work with youth, integration of youth voice um, in our practices and, and policies, um, that's really overlaps and is aligned with the Children and Youth Bill of Rights that our, that our uh, council has committed to. So those are the, the pieces I wanted to pull out. And again, just thank my council colleagues and thank Dr. Diffney Wise West and Bernie and other members of the team for the work. Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm really happy that we're able to bring these recommendations forward to the full council. Um, I stepped into this role in 2021 
when uh, I worked in, on the racial equity resolution that we adopted and directed some specific initiatives um, around equity and um, our systems. And um, we're still ongoing work with that and it's in the agenda report and we will continue to keep that as a high priority going forward and we you know, had to look at taking bite-sized pieces that we could really operationalize and get at. But at the same time, I really appreciate uh, Tiffany Wise West, your, um, uh, the way it was listed out and the status of each part of this um, uh, work is ongoing versus completed. Some are ongoing, some are a one-time action, and it's it's all laid out, and um, we really, it, it's going slower than I hope, but, um, you know, there's so much, so much work, and again, I support the staff capacity and any, um, any work we can um, do, but we have to like go at the pace that's uh, realistic, and so things aren't overnight. Um, but like my colleague, uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson said, it will be transformational. And I hope everyone in our community has a chance to read through some of the action items that um, you know we've been working on. It, it crosses so much in our community that affects our people and our residents from workforce development initiatives um, to all of the kind of um, well-being metrics and, and data that we've been able to collect and, and working with the County of Santa Cruz too, who's also on some parallel tracks with us in some of the work um, to really identify and, and get the data to really help. Um, make steps forward. So um, thank you. Thank you Council, Member. Council Member Watkins is recognized. <clears throat> well, um, gosh, to add to my colleagues who've said so much, I, um, I'm just so pleased by these progress reports as much as I know there's uh, an interest to see us transforming systems more rapidly. Um, we're transforming systems in an amazing way that I think really reflects our values as a council, as a committee, as a staff, and as a community that I know we all heard and that we were just talking about in regards to sustainability, environmental justice specifically, thinking about equity in our decision making, how to really transfer what I know is a value of equity into specific tangible outcomes that will move the needle on equity is, a, is what this is. And that's what is so powerful about this framework. Um, I wanna thank the council's uh, current previous <coughs> contractor at the time, and um, most certainly wanna thank Dr. Tiffany Weiss West. I really want to appreciate your professionalism and your commitment to data as well as accountability and transparency with the outcomes we set for ourselves and when we're not meeting them. And that's, for me, um, one of the best things about having something like this in place is that when I'm gone next year, this lives on and hopefully feels like everybody's fingers have touched it in a way that feels reflective of our community. Uh, we don't do public health, but we certainly have a role in creating the health and wellness of our community, whether it be through land use, through our commitment to racial justice, uh, thinking about transportation equity, infrastructure, resilience, you name it. We have a role in that. That is also how we think about how we're transforming our systems with thinking about who's involved in our commissions, how they can be involved, and things like that and our responsibility is to do something about that to make that happen and this is what that this is what health and all policies is doing so I feel really pleased I'm really excited to see us move forward in thinking about budgeting uh, budgeting is as I know our mayor knows well is a reflection of our values health and all policies through the lens and planning our budgeting in that way 
is truly an, an, another amazing way to have a transformative uh, system here. So um, I'm really pleased and thank you to the finance uh, department, who, wherever you may be at this moment. I appreciate that they're interested in wanting to see that move forward along with the other divisions and departments also. Um, yeah, and I just want to thank the ongoing support of our council and my uh, committee members for their work. So thank you so much and I'm happy to move the recommendation when the time comes. Very good. Thank you. Further <clears throat> questions or comments at this time? Let me invite members of the public, except for my brother, to make uh, <laughs> comments if they wish to. Anyone who is with us in chambers, uh, let me see if there's anyone online, Ms. Bush. We'll take that person. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon. Person online. I, I, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Maria Cadenas. I am the Executive Director of Ventures, a nonprofit that works towards a shared and equitable economic future where zip code, race, gender, or immigration status do not dictate income or wealth. Over the past few years, we have partnered with the City and County of Santa Cruz to help paint a picture of their respective boards and commissions. The effort started as a recognition that different lived experiences can help inform and shape policy and governance to ensure our city and county are resilient, prosperous, and equitable. We're grateful for the city, the Health and Health Policies Committee, and city staff for their leadership and commitment in moving this work forward. At this time, we would like to express our support for the adoption of the Health and Health Policies recommendations to support targets to increase diversity in city committees and commissions as well as commissioner committee member compensation policies and processes. As part of this, we recommend a universal opt-out compensation stipend model, aligning with the county's approach where compensation is offered and members can choose to decline it. Compensation will lessen financial barriers that might prevent working class individuals from participating, ensuring access to a broader range of community members. This addresses economic disparities and will help the city build boards and committees that more accurately reflect the diversity of the community and allows for broader representation of community voices. Ventures fully supports this initiative. We recognize this as a transformative step to fostering a more inclusive city. Thank you for considering this proposal and we look forward to witnessing the positive impact it would undoubtedly have on our shared community. Thank you so much for calling in. We appreciate it. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Hello, uh, Reggie Meisler here. I just wanted to take this moment to just remind city council and the public that, uh, you know, while health and all policies, I mean, it's a valiant sort of thought process, but it's kind of based on a faulty assumption that the city cannot do public health. The city can do public health. Berkeley does public health, has a public health department. Oakland, um, uh, I mean, sorry, San Francisco has a public health department at the city level. This is not impossible. Like this is just a choice that was made by a bureaucracy that can be made differently. And like, uh, well, it's nice that you guys are trying to do something with health and all policies. We could be doing a lot more. We could actually, we know that we have, we're already doing a lot of public health stuff. We help do shelter programs for the unhoused. We like have our community set aside grants. Like we do like multiple things. And so this is really just a technicality that folks are like operating off of right now. So uh just a reminder this we don't need to be like super careful about this stuff this is totally just a choice that people are making thank you well thank you do we have anyone else online thank you ms bush matters back before the council motion would be in order i'm, I'm happy to move the recommendation with the added language as presented <clears throat> Our staff here. Council Member Watkins moves the recommendation with additional language that will be put up on the screen in just a moment. And I'll second. Council Member Kalantari Johnson seconds. Ms. Bruner thirds. <laughs> we will uh, 
Uh, is there a debate or discussion? We're going to put this up on the screen to make sure that everybody can see it before we vote on it. I just want to um, kind of preface. Um, I'll share my screen, but there was some changes um, or differences between the staff presentation or the staff agenda report and the presentation. I just want to know, find out what the... Okay. So I made them in red, the difference. So let's take a look and make sure that the maker of the motion agrees that that's the motion she would like to see in front of the body. Good with that? Mm -hmm. Second? Yeah. All good? Mm -hmm. Is there debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We are on item 29, economic development strategy update, downtown and east side. <clears throat> district activation and direction <laughs> we'll be pleased to hear They're both all there. about <laughs> downtown and east side district activation <laughs> Ms. Lipscomb good afternoon Ms. Eunuch good afternoon thank you for all your fine work the floor is yours <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, uh, members of the council. I, I want to actually acknowledge this is a joint um, city council and economic development item. And it was actually the three council members, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, Council Member Watkins, and Council Member Newsom, who first came to us and the city manager um, with wanting to bring forward uh, several initiatives and direction around activation activities and just some, some needed areas um, for attention. And um, after you know, some conversation, um, we decided to do a, a joint item um, and bring with it some updates uh, to our ED strategy, because uh, many of these items were directions that council in some form had provided a few years ago, but several years forward, um, additional attention's needed, the pandemic has happened, a lot has changed in the downtown. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to provide an update in these areas today and to take further direction from council. And with that, I'd actually like to turn it over to the three of you for any opening comments. I'll, 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 Ms. Watkins is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I'll keep my comments brief because I know we have a presentation. Um, I just know and want to recognize my colleagues. Um, I know the full council as well is very committed to the work that's happening in all of the different areas that there are recommendations. I know our economic development team is small but mighty, working so hard and doing amazing things, many of which are behind the scenes or we're getting little updates here and there. And one of the efforts around what this agenda report and presentation is trying to do is really to daylight the, the work that's happening to get uh, affirmation in regards to the direction we hope to pursue and, and continue to go on and have checkpoints for us as a body and as a community in regards to accountability to see those move forwards and or uh, a, sh a shift in direction if needed. So I know uh, it's it's full, but I um, appreciate the collaboration between the, my colleagues as well as our department to, to bring forward these uh, topics to this evening. And um, I appreciate the opportunity, and of course my colleagues can say what they have been listening to. Sure, and, and I'll- Council Member Colin Tari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, yes, I also appreciate this partnership and collaboration in bringing this agenda item forward. Um, and I'll just add that I think this is a really important time in our community uh, with coming out of, well, we're still, you know, dealing with uh, COVID, but coming out of the pandemic and um, ensuring that our downtown and our community is vibrant and, and thriving um, and all the changes that we're seeing with development and housing development downtown. So it's an important time for us to pause and reflect on what we've done, what's worked, um, where there may be gaps and where we see our future. So it is just bringing it all together and getting on the same page. And as Council Member Watkins said, um, setting some touch points to make sure that we continue to support our um, local businesses and that we create a really welcoming, safe environment for community members and visitors. So. Councilmember Newsom is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. My comments will be brief as well. I just want to associate my comments with uh, my colleagues, Councilmember uh, Watkins and Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. And just thank you so much uh, for your work on this and to uh, Director Lipscomb and uh, Economic Development Manager uh, Unit for their work on this. And as uh, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson said, it's 
more of a pause, look at where we are, and look at where, we're, where we can move forward. And as the report says, you know, our downtown right now is experiencing a true revitalization, but you know, there are ways that we can improve, and as well with the east side uh, uh, business district as well, we're looking into that aspect as well. So uh, very excited about this agenda item uh, being, um, uh, very excited about this agenda by item being before us, and I look forward to the presentation. Thank you. Ms. Watkins is recognized. I just want to call attention to the East Side and Midtown reference <laughs> so that everybody has, uh, hopefully, I know. That's for you, Mayor. <laughs> I just want to make sure you saw I, that. <laughs> I didn't doubt where that was directed. All right. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so wh where we're going to start out today is just some context and putting this in the, in the framework of our economic development strategy. So the economic development strategy was a, 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 a community-driven sort of participation process that council weighed in on. They were um, involved with us um, for, I don't know, I want to say six months um, and sort of vetting and looking at um, some of the strategies or all of the strategies and actions that came into this, what is basically a, a a work plan for the next five years. We started this um, in 2021, so we were in the midst of the pandemic. At that time, we thought it was almost over. So, you know, it's really interesting to have the opportunity today to do exactly what the comments that the council members just made of taking a pause and saying, okay, where are we are, where are we? Because the anticipation when we um, finalized this work with a consultant in the community was that, okay, we are, we are almost done with the pandemic and we're gonna have recovery and then we're just gonna keep on going. And I think here we are at the beginning of 2024 and um, at, you know, as you'll hear you know, through some of the presentation, I mean, there are many businesses and you've heard this earlier in closed session that have recovered fully. There are others that are still struggling. You know, the environment has changed for businesses and um, our downtown environment and our east side midtown environment are undergoing changes and changes to really help those businesses survive in a post-pandemic world is, is some of the things that we're looking at today and revisiting some of the strategies and actions that are in the economic development uh, strategy update. So um, when you look at that, and it's a, it is a very detailed report, it is attached in the staff report. And I will also say that um, as we go into the presentation, Rebecca is going to sort of give us a, a quick overview of where we are in the context of the directions that are coming today and the recommendations. We'll go through those rather quickly. Um, they are very wordy because it's, it's actually taking text from the strategy actions and updates. So, um, but all of that context is in the uh, report, which is pretty thorough. So if you have any questions, we can pause and go, pat, go back to them, but we'll probably breeze through those pretty quickly so we can spend more time on the recommendations themselves. And with that, I will turn it over to Rebecca. Ms. Unick, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you for your good work. Uh, so, as Bonnie mentioned, we'll give sort of a highlight of a lot of the progress that we've made so far. So kicking it off with our, um, strategy to develop a pop-up program in our downtown. So this was something that we had anticipated, we had tried to do prior to adoption of the work plan and the pandemic really provided the perfect environment, unfortunately, but fortunately to test this out and really get something going. So um, we have successfully ran a pop-up program, uh, it's still ongoing, and um, we've also made a lot of advances in working with our city departments to streamline some permitting requirements, modify some zoning, um, to really make it easier for these to occur. Um, so in April of 2021, I brought to the council, uh, along with Bonnie, um, a proposal for our pop-up program. This is sort of the landscape of what our downtown vacancies looked like at the time. As you can see, all of these orange circles represent vacancies. They're almost on every single block in our downtown. It was you know, a really challenging time um, in sort of the, the heart of the pandemic period. Um, and so we brought forward the proposal to create a mechanism to um, lease out some of these vacant spaces, provide subsidized rent to local businesses, um, and be able to give them an opportunity to activate the spaces um, and see if it would work. So um, through this program, we were able to place four businesses, um, Terra and Self, uh, MK Contemporary Art, previously known as Curated by the Sea, uh, Childish, and then Rev. Um, we're you know, really excited to see that MK Contemporary Art continues to be in that space. They're operating long-term there. 
Um, the businesses Terra and Self and Rev, um, you know, did a test case in those spaces, and there's now a long-term tenant there. And Terra and Self has actually got a full um, lease space uh, on SoCal Avenue. Um, and this was an opportunity for her to do some business before her long-term space was um, available. She was building out that space. So got some name recognition, was able to make some sales, and then transition into that longer-term um, space. So that was really exciting. And then Childish, um, we're really excited to see that business expand from the Midtown area. I've heard that's generational divide, so I'm going to go with Midtown. Um, and they, you know, were able to expand and, and reach into the downtown um, and have shown success. So they've been in there since November 2022. And we're actually looking at extending a longer term lease that's under review right now. Um, they've been really successful and really been a great addition to our downtown as, you know, the only real um, dedicated children's toy store in our downtown community. Uh, so transitioning to sort of a more current picture, this was an analysis we conducted in November of last year. Um, and as you can see, those colored dots have really started to change. We've had a lot of businesses open, more than have closed in the, uh, from the pandemic have opened. Um, and we're really seeing a lot of progress there um, in terms of activating those vacancies. Uh, but we do still have some areas that need some ongoing investment and, and lease out. Um, so shifting to our next strategy, uh, outdoor dining, you know, when we were working on the ED strategy, uh, we were operating our temporary outdoor dining program and seeing the success of sort of creating that more streamlined approach, giving businesses the opportunity to just expand outdoors. Um, and so there was really a dedication to make those permanent changes, streamline our permit processes and bring that forward. Um, so really excited to say that we were able to complete, you know, the parklet program ordinance and that's now in effect. Um, we launched those applications in May of 2023. Uh, we've received 19 applications and we have um, 12 of those are for the pre-approved designs that the city, you know, invested in building those out so they'd be a more streamlined approval. Uh, or sorry, invested in doing the design work for those so that the businesses could build them out more easily. Um, and then we have three applications for custom designs and four for retrofits. Um, so we've got five of our pre-approved designs under construction now, uh, hoping to see those come to completion end of February. Um, and then the custom designs, one is completed, one's under progress, hoping to be done in the next week or so. And then um, the retrofits are in between of, of being completed, but majority are done. Mm -hmm. um, so we're excited to see that come online. You're going to see some really... Uh, beautiful parklets uh, permanently gracing our landscape. A couple of pictures here. On the left is a uh, bad animal on Cedar Street. Um, they're getting close to being completed there. And then Hula's um, is fully complete, and theirs is a, an expansion of their uh, what they had pre-pandemic. They're sort of the test case. So excited to see those going forward. And then on the private property side, um, we have been working with a city council subcommittee uh, to make modifications to those private property um, permitting processes. So uh, that work is well underway. Um, we're hoping to bring those modifications to the council uh, and planning commission um, in the next couple months here. Um, and that's really looking at reducing the number of permits that are required, the cost of those permits, you know, the intensity of sort of modifications that businesses would need to make to those private property spaces so that you know, a lot of them are operating now perfectly well. Um, so looking at how we can reduce those um, permitting requirements to allow them to just keep what they're doing um, and come into that permanent approval. Okay, uh, so moving to our next strategy, this is focused on um, a lot of the downtown uh, business improvement districts. So um, prior to the pandemic in 2019, we were looking at potentially creating a consolidated improvement district in the downtown. So combining our property-based improvement district that we have now and our business improvement district into one organization um, to try to maximize our resources. Uh, we kicked off that campaign in 2020, so we weren't able to move that forward. Um, but both of those organizations um, decided that it would be beneficial to just look at modifying their existing um, district boundaries and rate structures to be able to provide those resources that we need. Um, so that has been underway um, and was completed last year. Um, and then we've also done a lot of work towards improving and um, streamlining some of the coordination for downtown maintenance and services. Um, so I'll give a little bit of an overview of that activity. Uh, so as I mentioned, last year we were successfully um, able to approve the expansion of the Downtown Management Corporation as well as some modifications to their rate structure. The property owners you know, valued that investment 
um, and that was successful. Uh, similarly for the Downtown Association, the Business Improvement District, they were able to modify their rates and um, provide some additional investment uh, that's been really beneficial. Um, and we're already seeing the results of that investment in some of the stats below. So I'm really excited to see VTA was able to provide ribbon cuttings every single month. Um, yeah. They sold a record setting $100,000 in downtown dollars last year, which is um, an excellent investment. Those can be used at a number of stores downtown. Um, so really excited to see those numbers. And then the ambassador program, uh, which is funded through the Downtown Management Corporation and operated by the Downtown Association, um, they had doubled staffing from our expansion of the district and those changes to the rate structures. And so they were able to actually triple their hospitality interactions, so over 40,000 hospitality interactions, over 3,000 business contacts, uh, over 43,000 pieces of litter removed. So that's really the heart of our clean, safe, and welcoming services in the downtown. And just uh, you know, within a six-month span of sort of having those increases, we already are seeing that pay off. Thank you. I just wanted to add that between the two district increases, between the Downtown Management Corporation and the Downtown Association, um, through those, we've added about about a third of a million to the overall budget for downtown services. And that will only increase in the next few years as more of the properties develop downtown. We do have residential and the commercial retail um, frontage that is included in those assessments. So we're pretty excited for that increase um, and investment that we'll have in the downtown over the next few years as development goes forward. Thank you. And then on the city services side and sort of where the city is um, aiding in that downtown maintenance and services, um, we've had a lot of increases in um, dedicated Santa Cruz Police Department staffing and CSOs for downtown. Um, Public Works was able to consistently keep our sidewalks clean, uh, make that a welcoming environment to visitors. Um, and then Parks and Recreation, if you haven't taken a stroll downtown, the Pacific Avenue tree wells and planter beds uh, have been really beautifully maintained and improved. And so they've been really committed to keeping those um, vibrant, just really helps with the overall streetscape uh, look and feel. And then uh, we're also excited to see the downtown design standards uh, begin implementation. So this is aligning new street furnishings um, and then paint schemes that match our wayfinding system so that we have that more cohesive look and feel downtown. Um, so the parking meter poles have been painted already last year and this year we're looking forward to seeing um, the light poles, all the street poles downtown, um, planter bed fencing being painted. Um, we'll have new benches and new trash can receptacles downtown. So. Um, those will be some really uh, tangible improvements that we'll see in the next year as well. Great. And then looking at more of the business mix downtown, um, we have a strategy that's focused on you know, improving that uh, entertainment, dining, nightlife experience of downtown, um, being able to you know, fill these vacant spaces or the new spaces that are coming online with the development with something that's you know, exciting and going to attract uh, folks to the downtown. Um, and then also looking at how we can make those permitting processes for those uses that maybe don't fit within our traditional zoning code easier. Um, and alongside that as well, creating partnerships with the commercial broker community, making sure that we have the communication around what spaces are available and uh, connecting those with prospective businesses. Um, so we've made a lot of progress there. One of the, uh, this photo that you're seeing is a broker tour that we took with um, Anton Development Corporation for the Front Laurel Pacific um, project um, to be able to look at the new retail spaces and the progress of the construction. It was very fun um, and just really exciting to see this new development um, come online. We had, I want to say, about 25 people join us for that tour. Um, just a lot of excitement in these new spaces. Um, and we were able to build out a quarterly broker breakfast meeting um, this past year to be able to do a lot of information sharing and just open that communication around what's happening in the commercial real estate space downtown, um, how we can help, and then a lot of the policy updates and changes that we've made um, that they should be aware of when they're working with prospective tenants so that we can make that process go more smoothly. OK, and then. Um, you know, we're, as economic development, we tend to do a lot of marketing uh, for the city um, and sort of promoting us as a place to um, shop and dine and, and spend locally. So that's always an effort that we take on. Um, you may have seen around town our shop local banners and bridge signage. And so that was an effort that we took on and 
Um, worked with the Downtown Association as well for an excellent holiday campaign a few years ago and visit Santa Cruz. So we're looking at um, bringing forward some new banner designs this year. They need a refresh. Um, so just keeping that messaging going and looking at other opportunities to sponsor and support those shop local campaigns. Okay, um, so we have, and these are outlined in the report, the seven council and staff recommendations. And I just wanted to, to take a brief pause again before we go into each of the recommendations and, and turn it back over to um, the council members um, to see if you wanted to highlight um, and talk briefly about any of the specific recommendations and, and direction. May I ask if the council members who wish to do that? Sure. Do you want to say something? <laughs> not sure what, first, not sure what to make something. of that. Uh, Council Member Colletari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, I'll just pull out um, a couple of these. Um, sorry, i got to straighten my eyes here. Um, yeah, okay, I'll pull out just a couple of these. Um, the empty storefront, I mean, as, as Rebecca Unit showed, we've made quite a bit of improvement in that area. I think that's a huge accomplishment and success. Um, and one of the reasons why we want to continue to assess this and look at this is because there are still some major sites that are empty and it causes challenges in our downtown area. Um, there's um, illegal activities and um, um, uh, in the beautification that we're doing um, that was pointed to, that sometimes goes out the door when there's an empty storefront. So we want to just look and see what are some other um, strategies that we can put in place to address what's remaining. Um, and then I think I will pull out, um, oh, the place, well, you know what, uh, how about Council Member Watkins, you talk about the placemaking and activation, that's been your baby for a while. <laughs> Council Member Watkins is recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and for the presentation. Yes, um, certainly placemaking and activation has been something that we've been talking about for many, many years, as long as I've been on the council, actually. And it's that feeling when you are downtown and you're in a certain area and you are experiencing something, and then say, you know, you end up in Pearl Alley and it's a different type of place. Or if you're in other communities, sometimes there's areas that are really centered around youth or kids. And mm -hmm. it's those are the types of placemaking that and activation strategies that we want to explore as we're in this transition time thinking about these investments that makes that special culture and uniqueness of um, different areas within the downtown. So um, I'm happy to see this on our recommend, recommended list. And if I may, while I have the, um, the floor for a moment, also just the east side and midtown, I know we're going to be talking about that. It's been, ex it's been really exciting to see uh, the midtown parties happening, what that brings to our my our neck of the woods in terms of um, folks from all over the the city and county to come and experience the midtown certainly also supporting the businesses and um, one of the strategies here speaks to that a bit with the assessment and thinking about that with the businesses um, and then just lastly if I may mm -hmm. you know I know that there's a lot of discussion there has been a lot of discussion around where we are with the development of the new library and then certainly conversation around the current uh, library facility. And one of the conversations that's been happening is what would that look like? And I know there's steps that we'll take, obviously, prior to any major changes or direction there. But making sure that we're really transparent with our community, that, that this is not something we're not thinking about, and certainly is something that the farmer's market is thinking about locally in terms of a permanent farmer's market potential as an option, um, and also a, just a permanent space for a public market. And so, you know, as we're thinking about these things which have come before us in the past, how are we uh, maintaining ongoing transparency and engagement with our community in regards to some of our next steps. I'll leave it there. <laughs> thank you. Councilmember Newsom, you look like you're reaching for your microphone, sir. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I just, just want to uh, uh, really reiterate what my colleague said. Uh, you know, I'm very excited to see these recommendations, especially in these storefronts. Uh, you know, as the agenda report uh, points out, the vacancy rate in downtown right now is at a historically low rate. Uh, but as Councilmember Colletari Johnson uh, uh, pointed out we still need I think we still need to look at further avenues to lower that rate uh, further than what it is uh, and also you know recommendations to help the east east side slash midtown businesses and the business association over there and you know placemaking and activation and you know continuing to further push for downtown to be a vibrant uh, spot for a vibrant place for our community 
the vice mayor is recognized. <laughs> thank you. I really want to thank my colleagues and staff for working on this super complete, comprehensive package to support our local businesses. And I really admire all the entrepreneurs out there mm -hmm. that help support our local economy. Um, I had been meeting with West Side, Lower West Side, and West Side Industrial neighbor um, business owners and building owners over the course of the past couple of years, and there has been some expressed interest in basically the exact language in, in five. And so I'm wondering if it's possible to just, and I don't want to put too much on staff, but to add East Side, Midtown, and West Side. Mm -hmm. That's the direction I just wanted to. <laughs> Councilmember Bruner is recognized. <laughs> Uh, thank you for um, laying out these um, specific directions to staff and to staff for all the continuous work in all of these areas. It makes a huge difference. And I really applaud the economic development and housing team. Um, and I just wanted to say um, the Midtown East Side uh, businesses, you know, I've worked with with many of them on different topics over the past several years that I've been on city council. And um, uh, I just wanted to share that um, in terms of resources for that general area, um, I know that some of them are very interested in forming or, or exploring what it would take to form a business association um, officially. And we call it a business district, but there's no formal mechanism or structure in place for them to pay into and um, you know, decide and have resource and funding to support what some of their um, goals are. So um, I understand also um, there was a survey that staff sent. So would that also be included in the next update coming? Or is that, do you have that information now? We're going to, yeah, we're going to go through each of the recommendations with some detail and provide that survey data. OK. Um, and um, I think, um, I think that's, a, that's it for now that I, that I just wanted to comment on. Thank you. Quick Council Member Brown's record. Thank you. I'll um, make my comments afterwards. Um, but I, I did want to ask, I, I appreciate the update on outdoor dining and all of the work that you have been doing. I it just can't thank you enough. Um, there are particular needs for you know, different configurations and different um, uh, you know, store or uh, restaurant owners. You, it's, it's incredible the amount of work that you've put in to make that work. And I just wanted to ask, uh, given the number that of uh, applications, um, are, have, do you feel like you've been able to work through the folks who want to move forward with a permanent uh, setup? Or are there still kind of problematic ones or a group of them? What kind of, where is that at? I'd love to hear a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, great question. So. Um, you know, we do still have some that we're working through. So the, um, you know, five that I mentioned of the pre-approved, those are the ones that we've got set and they're ready to go. Um, the remaining seven of those, you know, there's some challenges in terms of ADA access. And uh, we determined that all of our roads have different um, cambers to them. And that makes it really challenging to pour a four inch concrete slab and have it not be high above the sidewalk. So. Um, we've been working through that and just navigating that with the businesses and so being flexible in terms of how we're getting them through that finish line. Um, the retrofits, you know, just working through and making sure that they have the resources information that they need to make those changes. Um, so yeah, there are still some where we're, you know, seeing, figuring out what that path is for them, um, but we are making some good headway. And yeah, 19, it's pretty incredible and, and it's really exciting to see that those businesses wanted to take it on. Um, that's almost all of the ones that we had in the temporary. Um, so I think that's just been really nice to see and, and fun to work through, um, even if it's a little stressful sometimes at those road heights. <laughs> uh, if I could, uh, we have kidded around for 13 months now because it's my hobby horse about Midtown. You win. 
you win. <laughs> the reason I say that is a couple of things. I think what you have done with regard to the marketing strategy about Midtown is actually quite helpful. Uh, and so on a going forward basis, you'll never hear me again <laughs> make fun of Midtown um, for a reason. Uh, not because I decided to give up on it, but because you've convinced me that, that there is a designation in our community that makes sense with a community, excuse me, with a business community that they themselves self-identify that way. And so I, uh, I think that is quite good, but I want you to know that the 13-month running joke is now ended on my part. You win, I lose, but, but for a good reason. So thank you, thank you very much for your very fine work on this. Back to you. Okay, now we're going to go just into a little detail on each of the recommendations. Yeah, so um, starting off in terms of the placemaking recommendations, uh, I was mentioned earlier with some of the council members' comments around the alleyways. Um, you know, I think that where we're looking at with this is what are our public spaces in the downtown that are maybe underutilized and can, um, you know, have some additional activation. So this, uh, there's an image here of Pearl Alley when Stripe and some of the adjacent businesses were doing events during uh, the pandemic and just seeing this alleyway completely transformed and having people, you know, being able to enjoy it and spend time in, with it, you know, looking at where we can duplicate those types of activities in some of our other alleys. Um, they also have the festoon lighting, which is something that the city and the businesses work together to fund and install. And so we do have some funding um, available that we could look at um, adding some of that lighting into the additional alleyways. And that's something we want to, um, you know, work on getting moved forward in this year. Uh, similarly, Fraser Lewis Lane uh, had a lot of great success activating that with outdoor dining um, during the pandemic. And so looking at, you know, there's a new restaurant that's open there, seeing if they want to be able to expand into that alleyway or looking at other um, potential um, uses there. Um, and then I provided an example of sort of some more passive activations. We have excellent murals already in our downtown. Um, other cities, you know, employ sort of these photo mural opportunities. This is from my hometown. I, took a tour when I was visiting for the holidays. Um, and so they have this monarch, you can see it um, closest on the right where people can go up and take photos in front of it and look like they're a monarch butterfly. Just fun things like that um, are opportunities. And just wanted to add here that, you know, Rebecca mentioned we already have some funding in our budget. We have a downtown alley a CIP line item that we've been holding for several years. Um, we just haven't had the capacity to move that forward. The timing with some of the improvements and the coordination with the other departments is right for this year. And with your council direction, we do have that funding. At a minimum, we want to put the festoon lighting, as Rebecca mentioned, in the alleys. Um, we do, and this is also with some feedback from Council Member Bruner, want to do um, and make sure we are um, and that's where I think this mural from Riverside comes in as well, sort of right-sizing and, and doing the right activation for each alley. So some of the feedback we had is, you know, there's like a quiet zone in um, Pearl Alley and mm -hmm. Plaza Lane, thank you, Plaza Lane. And so just being sensitive to the businesses and the res residents, the different users of those areas and making sure we're doing that community outreach and have, a, you know, a public engagement plan um, prior to us moving forward with whatever activation and placemaking we're doing in each of those areas. And then we also have a specific area that we've been um, working with the D downtown association that they really brought forward as one of their priority areas, you know, next to New Leaf and that center area, that public space. So that would be another area that in addition to the alleyways that we would be looking to engage in some activation and placemaking over the next year. Uh, and then moving over to the Midtown area and looking at the city-owned parking lot, uh, it's called Lot 32, but I know that we've spoken with council members in the past around the Midtown Plaza or something, you know, that can really be a more permanent um, public space in that area. So um, we've had a lot of success with the Midtown Fridays events. Um, we're looking at bringing that back this summer, um, sort of a shorter time period, but still um, the awesome activities that uh, Event Santa Cruz puts forward. Um, and then, you know, we're looking for some you know, direction of do we want to look at some more infrastructure that would create more um, of a permanent public space. Uh, you know, this picture is an example of um, the similar parking lot that's been turned into this more town square in Hayes Valley in San Francisco. And so this is Ritual Coffee that operates out of a shipping container converted into you know, a kiosk 
And so looking at are there ways that we could do some of this um, infrastructure in the Midtown parking lot in Lot 32, um, but that would take some investment in terms of getting water and electricity and sewer and restrooms to be able to have these 24-7 you know, um, activities. So seeing sort of what those costs would be um, and, and how we can move that forward. There's been a lot of um, interest and support in that and having a daily activation rather than just the weekends from the businesses. So um, looking to explore that further. Uh, and then on the vacant storefront, uh, you know, we have had a really good um, grasp on sort of what the current landscape is just uh, because of tracking them through the pandemic. And so taking a deeper dive into um, where we currently stand, what's the current status of some of our longer any vacancies, what are maybe the barriers to getting them leased? Some of them are still in shell capacity. They don't have bathrooms or, um, you know, it maybe be a very big investment for a smaller business to take on. And so they're just waiting for that larger potential tenant. Where are ways where we could step in and maybe help reduce those barriers or help incentivize them to make those improvements so that they can be more easily leased? I think those are some of the things that we'll be exploring. Um, also, sort of the beautification side, are there window graphics that we could put up temporarily that maybe, you know, make it a more attractive and do some of that marketing messaging of shop local, shop Santa Cruz, or, you know, downtown Santa Cruz branding or things like that. Um, there's a photo here from Los Gatos. They have these really cute little cat graphics that they put up on some of their vacant storefronts um, and just sort of, you know, create some more seamless experience or maybe not as eye-catching as an empty window. It maybe has whatever conditions inside. Um, so exploring those things and then also you know, being able to support and show that there is business activity coming. Sometimes, you know, downtown on Pacific Avenue right now, you could walk down there and think that there's a lot of vacancies, but there's actually a lot of those spaces that are currently leased and they're doing their TIs or their, their tenant improvements or they're waiting for their permits or in their various stages. And so um, while they're, you know, an empty storefront now, there is something coming. And so being able to promote and celebrate these things that are coming, uh, maybe with some graphics that advertise for them, um, just some examples that we've seen, and we want to look at some more best practices there. Uh, and then a large piece of it, too, as um, Councilmember Kalantar Johnson mentioned, you know, looking at how can we address some of the maintenance issues that we have. You know, sometimes properties are not well-maintained. There's um, broken windows or graffiti or, you know, repeated issues. And so how can we strengthen sort of our code enforcement arm of things or be able to have some tools in place that can really help take care of those issues um, in a more streamlined and immediate fashion? Um, so just looking at those different resources. Okay, recommendation three is around planning for future use of the existing library space, um, including a permanent home for the downtown farmer's market. And um, some of you may recall the report we had project for public spaces with group four conduct in June of 2021. Um, and that it ended in a report to council. It was a, it was a pretty intensive um, community engagement process and it ended in a report which council accepted which basically narrowed it down to three preferred options and um, they all included uh, public space uh, affordable housing and uh, Civic Plaza Park which would also be a home for the farmers market um, but it's a concept at this point and so we kind of you accepted the report and um, you know we moved forward on the project now here we are three years later we're still we're still working working on the project, but I think it is time. We're getting a lot of questions. I know council uh, definitely fields a lot of questions about what is the status of this process. I will say, for the last three years, we last three years, yeah, actually, last three years, we have been going through a process, particularly in the last two years, with the farmers market board and the farmers market leadership, and so. Um, we did approve an MOU with the Farmers Market Board that it has us focusing first on the temporary location. So we've been working pretty actively over the last year. And I'll just show you those of uh, temporary layouts for the Farmers Market for an on-street activation and some combination that we're vetting of on-street and off-street um, for a temporary home. And when we say temporary, that's at least probably two years, could be a little longer once um, we need to start for the staging for the downtown library affordable housing project, we will need to make sure we have a home that works for the farmer's market. So we've been vetting these with their vendors, with their food trucks in various areas. We have a, a third one that we're also looking at that's a, a, you know ha has some additional challenges, but it'd be super cool. Um, but we, I don't, we're not quite ready to, to, to show that one at this point, but these are two that we're actively vetting right now. 
Um, we also have um, one of the sites for temporary and potentially also for permanent that's been fully vetted uh, with conceptual renderings. This is just one of the many renderings that we have, and this is um, on lot seven. Um, definitely the farmer's market board, while it, this will work for them, is at least while there's construction going on downtown, is not their ideal preferred site because of construction staging activity. They really are excited about being closer to the City Hall campus and the library campus and the idea of being included in the um, reuse of the existing library site is something that, that really appeals to them. And so one of the directions that we you know, have is that action two is working with the farmer's market leadership, stakeholders, and community input is really stepping up. Once we finalize those temporary layouts and figure out where they're going for the temporary is to really switch gears and go to both action one and two, where we then pick up those concept plans where we, we, we left off re-engage the community on what does the future of this, of where the library is now look like and engage the farmer's market in vetting it, including that permanent home there as well as other potential options. So those are our next steps around those. We don't have that level of specificity in our ED strategy, so that's also why it's one of the recommendations here is to include that in that work plan. And then um, recommendation four really comes in the acknowledgement of how much downtown is changing, how much has changed just even in the last couple of years. And one of the things we've noticed as these construction projects have gone forward is how important it is for us to be communicating um, with the businesses, with the developers, you know, with DTA and DMC, you know, our partners, our organizational partners in the downtown of what's happening in these changes, whether it's just from transportation, you know, construction impacts to how are we going to actually integrate the new downtown residents into the downtown environment. So we have some very specific um, actions um, that we want to work on, including making sure residents know about all of our amazing businesses and giving businesses an opportunity to have promotions for residents as well, and then continuing to communicate. It's just we realize like we can't under communicate about the impacts of road impacts, construction, specifically when we look at you know the interim operations plan for Metro for our North Pacific Station North project, how important it is to make sure the businesses understand when we're changing for two years, the direction of the traffic and that buses are gonna be on street, how important it is for them to know that. Um, so that will be ongoing, um, but we don't have, currently have specific direction or recommendations in our ED strategy, and it's just, it's very important. Okay, and then recommendation five is Midtown Business District. So um, this is something that we've sort of been building to. Um, you know, I really have to give credit to the Midtown Business Association, this you know group, very informal group of business owners on SoCal Avenue and Water Street um, that have really banded together and done cooperative marketing and done a lot of events together and really are trying to make a name for it. And I think you know making a lot of progress, which has been really exciting to define this commercial area and really carve it out as a destination in our community. Um, and so you know. They're, they don't get the same benefits that downtown businesses get. Um, they don't have, you know, the, they don't have trash cans on the sidewalk or benches or pedestrian level lighting. And, you know, so there's a lot of sort of streetscape improvements that could be made or different investments that could be made um, that are facilitated downtown through these improvement districts. So um, we want to look at exploring that. We did some initial outreach uh, with the businesses just last week to sort of present the idea and start, you know, getting it percolating in everyone's minds. Um, and sort of the process that we need to go through for this is really um, entails sort of hiring a consultant. Um, the city can do that. The districts can do that. It does take a lift. Um, there's different strategies for sort of how we fund that initial step. Um, and then it's a lot of stakeholder engagement, talking with the businesses, understanding what services they want and are the priorities for them in that area, defining the geographic boundaries. I think that's something that's always been a conversation of where do these boundaries really make sense. Um, there's an interesting business mix of a lot of auto-related uses and then the traditional retail restaurants. Um, where does it make sense within that area to have a consistent boundary um, and make sure that you've got the businesses that want to pay into this assessment? It's really a self-driven thing. It's not something that the city is bringing to them. Um, as a city tax. It's really they're voting to tax themselves um, and create this assessment on themselves. So uh, that's a, a lot of the piece. And then 
pulling that all together and deciding, is this a go or no go? Is this something that we really want to pursue? And is there support from the city and stepping this up um, and from their fellow businesses and then going forward into that petition process and doing the actual vote? So um, there's a lot of legwork that's involved, um, but we did sort of present uh, some information. We did a rough survey. It's not been out there even a week. It'll be a week tomorrow. But um, we had some good representation with uh, some of the most, um, I'd say, you know, present businesses in the uh, business association. So we've got 15 responses, uh, majority business owners, three that are both business and property owners. We asked them to rank sort of what services they're most desiring in that area. Um, they really ranked neighborhood beautification as a high. As I mentioned, you know, they don't have a lot of the basic infrastructure that a commercial district usually has. Um, so being able to have those supports, um, public safety, and then marketing sort of being those top uh, three tools. Uh, and then, um, you know, I gave the best of my ability in giving them an overview of these really complex uh, districts and just sort of asked them, you know, what is your initial feeling of what type of district do you think would be best? Um, overwhelmingly business improvement district, you know, this is heavily business, um, you know, respondents to the survey. And so, you know, but I think it's a great testament that, you know, they feel that this is something that they would want to pursue. As you can see, um, question five, you know, we did have a lot of very supportive responses, people that do want us to explore this path. Um, and I think that the group that was in attendance in our outreach are sort of the champions that would be the ones to carry this on and promote it to the other you know, businesses and, and help with that outreach and engagement. So um, it's a good sample size, I think, just of um, where they're at right now and um, something that clearly they're in favor of us looking forward to. Okay, and so just wrapping up our, our last two recommendations are just to amend the economic development strategy to include these additional actions um, in as recommended above into our EDS and then to return to council with an update on progress during the current fiscal year, including any related additional actions or recommendations needed for implementation and funding. So as Rebecca mentioned, for the business improvement district, the bid, um, you know, we need to get more uh, survey responses, more businesses, so we can work with the Midtown Business Group on mm -hmm. getting a, a more robust response and see where we land, if it's still leaning towards a bid versus a property-based. And then um, probably one of those next steps would be returning to you in the future with an action item to go out for a consultant, you know, and the project engineer to help us start drafting that uh, what that bid looks like. Um, the most of the other actions, at least for the current fiscal year, can be achieved within our existing budgeted funds, including our CIP funds. So this would be one area um, that we would need to come back to you within the current fiscal year. Well, thank you very, very, very much. As uh, quite thorough, and quite helpful. Uh, questions uh, from council members. We've done one round of this. We're going to take public comment. Then the matter will be back before us for an action. Uh, any additional opening comments? Seeing oh, oh, yes, more, please, sorry. Madam Vice Mayor. Um, right. I do have one comment. When you're thinking about the placemaking. I, other things that I've seen in other communities, and I know you and I have talked about it, is some patriotic stuff around Memorial Day, Veterans Day, Fourth of July, or even holiday lights, a, a tree lighting, a menorah lighting, something like that, I think brings people out to, and makes it a fun environment for just seasonal things. Thank you for that comment. Other comments before we hear from the public? Seeing none, we will now go out to the public. Anyone who is with us in chambers wishes to comment on item 29, this would be your opportunity to do so. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who would like to comment? Nobody with their hand raised. Very good. Last call. Please, please come forward. Welcome. <coughs> good evening, sir. But uh, as far as uh, Santa Cruz is uh, develop the, developing the uh, economy of Santa Cruz, uh, the first thing I would think is to lower the rent. I, I was talking to people today, uh, yesterday, they said if the rent prices keep going up, they're going to move to Watsonville, Scotts Valley. And if you lower the rent, like the square foot per, you know, if you lower that, I think the gas price would come down. So what's ha uh and number two, uh, you have to deal with the unlicensed uh, vendors out here. You have to have a better 
policy, how to deal with those people. Uh, I, they're, they're hurting the economy of Santa Cruz. Uh, number three, you, you need uh, more police presence on the mall. Four, uh, let's see, panhandlers, got to handle with them, deal with them. If they get too aggressive. I mean, I'm a homeless person, and there's no need for them to act the way they act. Okay, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like one of them. Mm -hmm. And there's no need for them to act the way they act. And I think what's happening with Santa Cruz, I, I think everybody knows it, Santa Cruz is turn, turning into a tourist trap, or it is a tourist trap. But you have to lower the rent, because people are moving out of uh, Santa Cruz, going to Watsonville and Scotts Valley, and Bonnie Doon even, Belton. Uh, if you want to attract business people to Santa Cruz, you have to lower the rent. If you lower the rent, it's going to lower the gas prices. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else under oral communication, uh, excuse me, uh, wishes to testify on this item? We have someone have online. A hands now. <laughs> okay, we'll take the person online. Good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. <laughs> Welcome, person online. Uh, Hi. Good evening. This is Judy Grunstra, and uh, I've got a couple of thoughts about this. As someone who um, participated in that uh, revisioning for the library site uh, process about three years ago, um, now we're going to do it all over again. <laughs> uh, so I hope you will read that report, including all the way to the end where people express their wishes for that say. Uh, now, placemaking is something I've been reading a lot about over the past years, and there's also a, an additional concept of placekeeping. Uh, that means to retain what we have here historically, and unfortunately a lot of that is getting um, mowed down and cut down and paved over. I'll always you know, think that the best place for a town commons would have been lot four, so now we're, you know, considering that on uh, the library site. Now there are problems there with the police department. They need access through that uh, street. So how much of a public space that can be, we don't know. Um, and a lot of, I totally, you know, support the farmer's market, new ventures and new directions and expanded services. That'll be really great for this town. Uh, if they want to reuse the library building, a lot of, uh, Cities do reuse their existing buildings. Um, I mean, I could see a food hall and, you know, all kinds of great food-related things there along with the farmer's market. But uh, I'm not the one making the decisions. And let's not forget the antique fair. Uh, when you're talking about the farmer's market, which was on Lot 4, I hope you'll remember that the antique fair also needs to be considered. Um, let's see, sorry for the scattered uh, approach here, but I have a lot of assorted things to say. So uh, I just read about in San Francisco, they have a vacant to vibrant uh, approach to uh, revitalizing their vacant storefronts. Uh, I know, you know, I pass the Rittenhouse building and see this brown paper in the windows. That's really terrible. Something should have been, you know, done to encourage them to put some sort of artwork in those uh, big windows. Uh, I think I'm coming to the end of my thoughts here, but I look forward to uh, a new farmer's market location, uh, some kind of common public space, and uh, thank you very much. Thank Good you, night. Ms. Gunstra. We appreciate your participation. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. Hi, uh, thanks for letting me speak. <laughs> Uh, this is Sonia McMorrin. I own Homework in uh, Midtown, and I just wanted to pop on to voice my support of uh, trying to create a business district in Midtown. I think it's um, long overdue, and uh, the Midtown Business Association has been kind of trying to fill in voids where we can, but we really need a, a kind of more organized way of um, growing the neighborhood. Um, I think, you know, Midtown has such an amazing possibility for growth. Um, there's so many opportunities there. And I think over the last few years, especially with Midtown Fridays, we've seen 
what an amazing community space Midtown can be and how it can bring together um, the locals that live not only in the neighborhood, but around the county. And I think that if we had a more organized group to create, uh, you know, real change and uh, really uh, improve the area for the community, it would be beneficial both for locals and for visitors. So I just wanted to type in with my support. And I also wanted to just say that Rebecca unit is a gem and I love her so much and she is such a hard worker and I just really, really enjoy working with her. Well, that is so kind of you. Thank you. We feel similarly. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Yes. We'll take the next person online. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. <laughs> Good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, just, uh, well, first of all, thank you for doing this plan. Um, and of course, I'm very excited to hear about the Midtown Business District. Um, as the previous caller mentioned, there's a real camaraderie amongst the businesses on SoCal and Water, and they've had to do that because they haven't really had a formal structure, but they, it's been going on for years. And um, the other interesting thing is that there's a certain vibe about Midtown from downtown. And I, since I've lived on the east side for a long time, I'm probably a little bit biased here, but I used to go downtown all the time. But a lot of times now I work very late, and uh, when I'm looking to see, you know, just to wander around or go downtown, I'll wander downtown, and a lot of the businesses aren't open, but there are a lot of businesses that are open on the east side up to 11 o'clock. So there's a lot of evening activity already happening. And also there's a lot of new restaurants and, um, uh, you know, breweries and such. And it's inviting a lot of people to walk from the neighborhoods and uh, big biking parties I've seen where people are, you know, groups of 30 people are heading over for a pizza for a big birthday party. So there's a lot of really interesting activity that's happening in Midtown that doesn't happen in downtown. Um, one thing that the businesses are very vulnerable on, though, is that because there's a lack of structure, um, you know, like as I mentioned, benches and trash cans and any kind of patrols, a lot of the um, activity in downtown was pushed into east side when they started pushing people out and the businesses weren't prepared for that. So they had to sometimes lock their doors and then invite people in to the businesses rather than having the doors open and things like that. I just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, anyway, I just also wanted to mention one more thing. When you do your plan, remember that it was originally called Brand Supporty Business District and then it was called the East Side Business District. So there's been a lot of legacy there, and I hope you can bring some of that rich um, historical context into the Midtown area and not just make it just business only. Because so I think it's a very vital, really wonderful area and a lot of wonderful business owners, many of them women-owned. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Nobody else. Last call. Anyone wish to provide input on this? matter is back before the council. Council Member Watkins is recognized. Yes, thank you. I'll um, move the recommendation as presented in the staff report. I'll second. <laughs> I'll second second. I've seconded a bunch, so I won't. Okay, there second we go. There's a second by Council Member Newsom. You may open on your motion. Great, thank you. I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to have this presentation to go through where we've been and also outline some of the direction that's being proposed this evening. I, um, I know there's immediate needs that we always have to take care of at the city level, and there's often things that come up that require a, a diversion of our attention to be fixed. Mm. But what this looks like for me is outlining what we want to see in our community, what activation looks like, and what makes Santa Cruz such an amazing place to live, no matter where you are, for us in Midtown, East Side, um, but to every district we represent, that this is outlining how to move forward. And we also know that a thriving downtown is a, a really great reflection of a community's vitality, and so we want to see all of our downtown thriving. Um, and it's so great to see how it is already and, and where we can go moving forward. So I know that this is a big lift. I also know that that we have limited resources. And so I know in, in seven we have coming up, if there's adjustments or needs, that those are shared with the council. And if this is truly a priority, then we need to have those difficult decisions at the budget level and how we want to invest in seeing some of these things through. So um, kudos to you and the work that you do. I know it's expansive. And if you need more support, I, I guess that's what I'm saying, then let us know. Um, Anyways, I'll, I'll leave my comments there and yeah. just appreciate the time and the, and the discussion. Thank you, Councilmember. 
Other comments on the motion? The vice mayor is recognized. I just would like to add a friendly amendment to um, recommendation five to include West Side as well. Yeah. Good. good. Acceptable. Acceptable. Okay. Very good. Let pull this up. Let me make sure we know exactly for Ms. Bush where we're going to insert that. I believe that it is on item. Oh, do you, do you have it? Okay, great. It's item, exactly. I believe it is at item five, correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. <laughs> it would be under E, e one E, <laughs> so it'll be East Side, Midtown, and West Side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, without objection, that'll be added to the motion. <coughs> Very good. Just, just to clarify, it would be East Town, Midtown, or if we're calling it Midtown and, and West Side, because it'd be two oh, different right. ones we'd be right. pursuing. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Everybody good with that the way it is? And the district's just mm -hmm. Very good. at the end of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Do I, sorry, do I add it up here too? In one? East Midtown. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Purpose of uniformity, since you capitalized West Side, let's capitalize. <laughs> oh, seriously, we, yeah. I mean, for the sake of consistency, East Side and Midtown need a capital in number one there, where you are. Capital E, capital M. And we'll be good to go. There we go. Good. Councilmember Brenner. We might then consider um, changing the word two to three districts. Very good. Towards the end of the first paragraph to further activate the three. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Yeah. Good catch. <laughs> Others? Are we all good? All good? Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Is there further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watson? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tory Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We're on item 30. This is, uh, this is a military equipment purchase request and policy update per Assembly Bill 8, excuse me, 481. Chief, good evening, sir. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and Council Members, Bernie Escalani, the Chief of Police. Um, so we have uh, a presentation for all of you. We have uh, Kathy Brothers, our Principal Management Analyst from the Police Department. We have Sergeant Trog from the Police Department. We also have Sergeant Burrell, uh, who will all be participating in the, in the presentation. Um, and for the sake of, of time, and uh, we're going to get started as soon as they're ready to go. Thank you, Chief. Right. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, as the Chief mentioned, I'm Sergeant Josh Trog, with the City of Santa Cruz Police Department. Uh, while we're working on getting the uh, presentation up, I will be speaking to the <laughs> AB 481 aspect of uh, our request related to this piece of equipment. Uh, that's in my capacity as the military equipment coordinator for the police department. And then Sergeant Brad Burrell will be discussing the uh, proposal uh, in more detail related to the equipment that we're requesting. Thank you, sir. So the background on uh, AB 41 was effective in January of 2022, it establishes the requirements for purchasing, uh, raising funds and for use of items deemed military equipment. Um, we have to attain, uh, obtain approval from the governing body and establish policy and posting requirements. And we must cease use of items that are not approved. Our recommendations uh, 
for this, uh, introduce publication and ordinance amending City of Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 9.90, AB 41 Military Equipment Use. If the council approves the recommendation number one, uh, recommendation number two is to adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 2024 budget in the amount of $170,942 from the police asset forfeiture 214 fund. And a recommendation number three would be to approve a five-year purchase contract with Axon Incorporated. And I uh, apologize, I have to back up slightly. Uh, we have representatives from Axon Incorporated available remotely for questions, as well as Stephanie Duck with the city attorney's office, who has worked with us in the uh, development of all the draft policies and the proposal. Uh, so our current uh, military equipment policy is covered under policy number 705. Uh, this policy includes the definition of military equipment, military equipment coordinator and their responsibilities, how we coordinate with other jurisdictions, covers the approval, annual report, community engagement requirements, uh, and the public complaint process. Uh, what we are uh, requesting to uh, deal with in this proposal is the current military equipment inventory. Uh, if it was approved, we would be updating it to include uh, the equipment that we're requesting. This QR code that is uh, on the slide is a direct link to our transparency portal and all of the associated uh, items with military equipment policy uh, and the complaint procedure. So the piece of equipment that we are discussing this evening is the Skydio X-10 unmanned aerial system. Uh, it falls under category one of uh, the requirements of AB-481 and military equipment. Um, it's, they're also referred to as drones. Um, some of the capabilities of this piece of equipment has a maximum speed of 45 miles per hour, 40-minute uh, runtime, and it can operate seven and a half miles from the controller. Uh, it's got specialized uh, software that uh, can come with it, uh, mapping software, uh, telephoto, wide angle, and thermal cameras as a spotlight and speaker as well as microphones uh, that can be attached to it for two-way communication. Uh, can be operated day or night. Uh, it has 360 visibility, meaning that when, the, when it's being operated, there's no blind spots. Uh, gives the controller better control of the device. Uh, it's got GPS sensors, uh, so we know where it is at all times. Uh, visible and infrared light sensors. Uh, this is the capability of accepting a detachable spotlight that's uh, 2,800 lumens, quite bright. Uh, it has flight as assistance and object avoidance software basically to help us so we don't crash it. Um, the cost uh, over five years would be $227,224. Uh, that includes uh, $27,708 to outfit two patrol vehicles. Uh, with the equipment required to support these uh, UAS. Uh, five uh, UAS plus software training and subscriptions. Uh, this would be funded uh, out of the asset forfeiture funds and patrol general funds. Covered in our draft policy are the intended uses as well as the prohibited uses. Uh, these are some of the reasons that we would deploy these devices, uh, natural disaster or public safety emergency, uh, in support of search and rescue or water rescue operations, uh, lost or missing persons, crime scene and traffic collision documentation, uh, mutual aid, our fire department or outside agencies needing the uh, services of this piece of equipment, um, as an aid in de-escalation, uh, it's a tool that would help maintain uh, an audio and visual connection with someone uh, who may be armed, but give us the ability to stand off a little bit and work through 
the problem without putting officers right there uh, in in the mix if we do not have to provide us some some space and time to to work through whatever the situation may be uh, in uh, the service of a search and or arrest warrant, uh, crime in progress, uh, and locating a fleeing suspect. Those would be the, the intended authorized uses. Prohibited uses, uh, this device cannot be weaponized. There is no intent to weaponize it. Uh, we will not use facial recognition uh, software in conjunction with this. Uh, we will not use it in random surveillance activities. It will not be used to target, harass, intimidate, or discriminate against any individual group or protected class. It will not be used for personal business, nor the routine monitoring of a mass gathering, protest, or demonstrations where security concerns or criminal activity do not exist. Again, this is the same QR code that uh, will take anyone who scans it to uh, our transparency portal. Uh, in addition to the military equipment policy, we have a draft policy uh, regarding the use of unmanned aerial systems, policy 607. Uh, this, I've discussed the uh, military equipment policy 705. Uh, within the military equipment uh, policy, we have to provide an annual report to council for all things covered under that policy. So uh, if the UAS program was approved and, in, and adopted and uh, put into service, all use of that equipment would be covered under the annual uh, report requirement that we have to make to, to council. Uh, in addition to all of the internal policies and procedures, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration uh, licenses the operators, so they have uh, some oversight of what is done. Uh, we would pursue getting a certificate of authorization, which is uh, basically permissions on how we operate uh, the UAS systems uh, under the authority of the FAA. Um, information related to these would be available on the transparency portal as uh, all of the equipment is. And then there is a software product called DroneSense that uh, is available to come with these devices that helps in the transparency and tracking of uh, the devices and it provides uh, data, available data that can be used uh, to know when they're being deployed, how they're being deployed, uh, and things like that. So with that, that is the AB481 aspect of our proposal for this system. Uh, I will be turning this over to Sergeant Brad Burrell to discuss the program uh, proposal in more detail. Thank you very much. Sergeant. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor Keeley, Council Members, my name is Brad Burrell. I'm a sergeant with the Santa Cruz Police Department. Um, we're excited to uh, bring you this product to see it for yourself in action. Uh, as you'll see in this video, um, the specific Skydio X10 um, is intended to be used very simply. Uh, it is versatile. It is maneuverable. The image quality is high. You get to locations that a uh, few can, and when it comes down to it, the visual acuity that provides uh, operators on the ground with um, significant intelligence is invaluable. One of the big selling points for X10, uh, if uh, council approves, is uh, the ability to have the uh, uh, highest rated technology and software related to uh, traffic accident investigations. Uh, as you all know, uh, traffic accidents uh, are significant, uh, especially if they're um, extended in nature with regards to uh, the impact they have on the public, uh, road congestion, um, and delays in people just getting from point A to point B. Um, 
what we found with the Scadio X10 is that the software that they have, you can see here in the 3D image quality, is not only done with the highest quality that we found, it's, it's also done expeditiously. Um, you're cutting down the time of which officers would need to be on scene investigating a, 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 a traffic accident, um, collecting what they need, and then getting the road clear. We're reducing uh, the risk associated with the public, EMS personnel, fire personnel, police personnel, by uh, reducing the closure of the roadway, and allowing it to be open for people uh, to drive freely and uh, get those vehicles out of the way. Uh, what you see here is going to be the uh, actual footage of an event that occurred in 2022 um, where a violent uh, suspect was uh, fleeing from officers related to an incident where officers believed him to be armed with a firearm. Um, the uh, subject was wanted for multiple felony violent crimes. As you can see in the middle of the screen, the subject is wandering through backyards of a residential area hopping fences. What this is providing is real-time live updates to officers on the ground that are containing and isolating an incident or a subject, um, trying to coordinate resources effectively to converge instead of a needle and haystack approach. Uh, the real-time live updates that the UAS would provide is invaluable when it comes down to um, linking officers with the operator of the UAS and uh, effectively and ideally safely uh, able to uh, apprehend that individual without uh, any other undue risk, unnecessary risk for the public, as you can see with residents coming out uh, on their decks in the area, uh, pointing towards officers, pointing towards the subject, um, and hopefully reducing time where officers are inconveniencing people in their daily life. This is where we see uh, if council approves the uh, benefits that we can uh, join with the fire department um, and other EMS personnel uh, during the known natural disasters uh, that we are all too familiar with in this area. Um, the UAS can go places where others can't, whether it's personnel on the ground, whether it's helicopters, uh, fixed wing aircraft, uh, the UAS is that invaluable rapid deployment um, item that can be utilized um, almost anywhere, um, pending certain conditions such as rain or what have you. Um, this is something that is giving the intelligence that is so needed for incident command to make informed, prudent decisions, uh, to deploy personnel and resources effectively to precise locations. Another example of uh, our Santa Cruz Fire Department team working uh, in the I'm assuming somewhere on West Cliff area. Um, but uh, when it comes down to the terrain of our community, whether it be the coastline, whether it be the forested area, uh, we have the full spectrum. Uh, the UAS is able to provide us that versatility and maneuverability while providing that real-time update to a rapidly evolving situation, uh, to, uh, in this case, uh, fire personnel that are putting their lives at risk uh, to gain situational awareness, uh, whether it be tides, whether it be things that the incident commander may not see or team leader, that, uh, then provide that overwatch to uh, communicate their, therefore to the personnel that are on scene, trying to locate um, people, whether it be in the ocean or wherever else. Um, like Sergeant Trog said earlier, the uh, visual uh, capabilities of these UAS devices is um, cutting edge and can operate during the nighttime as well. As you all know, we have uh, elderly people that can uh, walk away from um, care facilities and finding them in the, especially at nighttime, is extremely difficult. As we transition here to um, the de-escalation portion of where the UAS device can uh, come in handy is also addressing the sanctity of life and how we are trying to uh, utilize any strategies and techniques at our disposal to slow things down, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, we cannot assess what we do not know or we cannot see. The value of this, what the UAS can provide, is allowing officers to stay a safe distance away, 
as it maneuvers into a more high risk or threatening area and provide those officers with that real-time data to determine exactly how urgent the matter of which they're investigating really is. In this case, it's a training scenario. I should have prefaced that for you. Um, but this is a situation of what you can actually see, the clarity of which you can see it, and the intelligence that's providing to officers, incident command, uh, to, again, make more informed, competent decisions about uh, how to deploy, uh, deploy resources appropriately. Again, with uh, Council's approval, uh, we intend to um, not only um, purchase UAS devices, uh, but also outfit patrol vehicles um, to rapidly charge these devices for um, coordinate, coordinated usage with uh, multi-UAS <laughs> devices during an incident or prolonged incident operation. Um, not only will these devices be able to be rapidly charged, but they can also provide that uh, monitor for uh, incident command to be informed of uh, the real-time information that the UAS is providing and provide them the ability to make informed decisions and serve as a mobile command center, if you will. Again, if uh, Council approves, uh, the Scudio um, UAS device has proven to us that not only is it capable with its high-tech software, uh, visual um, performance, and um, maneuverability, but it also has the highest standards as it relates to its compliance with uh, NDAA, um, software, hardware, um, and the respect for people's privacy as it relates to what they are obtaining. Um, our other vendor that we are all already partnered with is Axon, uh, of which they already store our um, body camera footage, in-car camera footage, auto tagging, interview room videos, uh, etc. Um, would work in conjunction with Scadio to house those videos, house that data that um, would be collected uh, via the UAS. As you can see, the majority of the costs broken down over five years are from hardware and software primarily. Um, but as you can see in the videos, the quality uh, is very high. And um, I, I will make a point of uh, the speaker and microphone feature on the de-escalation aspect of that providing us the ability to pro uh, communicate two-way communication with uh, those involved with the incident, uh, involved potentially crisis negotiation teams, uh, mental health teams, liaisons that are already embedded with the Santa Cruz Police Department, uh, and provide that uh, comprehensive service to the community of Santa Cruz. As you can see, uh, the training and the subscriptions are also uh, embedded in the cost, broken down over five years. Um, you can see it uh, incrementally, uh, year by year, from one to five. Sergeant, thank you for the presentation. Chief, back to you, sir. So that's that's our uh, our presentation, and again, uh, we have two representatives from Axon available for any sort of like technical questions regarding the equipment. Uh, we also are, are joined by um, Chief Odie's team here from our fire department. If you had any questions specifically to how this equipment could be utilized as well, just in uh, you know the sense of public safety in general. Um, we've had many conversations about collaborating with this sort of equipment and how this benefits our community as a whole and our ability to respond to different emergencies, whether it's fire-related or, or law enforcement-related. So we have people here to answer questions. Chief, thank you very much. Let me see if there are initial questions to the chief. Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm going to try to keep the words of my uh, one of my colleagues that drones can be used for good in my head here as I um, as I've been reviewing the material and um, listening to the presentation um, I have a couple of questions about uh, retention of the data um, it, because the from what I 
the material we received um, that the data collected will be retained as provided in the established records retention schedule. Um, maybe I missed it because there were a lot of materials for this packet, but um, what, it, what is that um, retention period for drone footage? Well, Sergeant Trog answered a little more detail, but um, in most of the circumstances, the video and or audio will be evidence in a crime, so it will all go through a, a, a standard schedule that we already have in place with Axon related or body-worn camera footage as well. But I'll let okay, so it's a similar, the body-worn, the body camera rules, or the, it's, that's what you're using? Yes, the, it would fall under the same rules based on crime classification or lack of crime classification as to how long it would be stored in the already existing Axon uh, storage system. And that is, can you, do you know that off the top of your head? Is it 30 days? It, oh, it's, it's significantly longer. So for felony crimes, it can be up to forever. Uh, misdemeanors, it could be two years, non-evidentiary, two years or less. It just depends on the nature of the incident. That, I guess, yeah, so for when, where it's used for criminal proceeding, and I understand that, but I was just thinking about um, materials that are not going to be used in, so non-evidentiary. It can be up to two years that it's that stored? It can be. Uh, I don't know if all non-evidentiary items fall under that criteria, um, but it would just, it would be whatever the current axon schedule for retention is. Okay, um, thanks. Council Member Bruner. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at the policy that was posted. It just, I thought I saw something around that time frame um, regarding data retention, but I, I'm not going to scroll right now. Um, but I, it, it, you know, the. My, I have a couple questions, um, and we've received a few emails with questions, and, um, you know, I just want to uh, voice some concerns from our community as well. And our role here is public safety and, um, I, uh, you know, how, how to best support uh, the community, and um, at the same time, too, we all are also voices of the community. And so um, I know I shared um, a couple of concerns, but um, especially for black and brown people, um, we've done a lot of work since 2020 in police policies um, to you know, eliminate facial recognition software, to you know, eliminate some of the, the um, police policies that have really affected people of color. And um, this concept of surveillance is a really scary thing for people. It's, it's physiological reactions. Um, even me, I've been pulled over for my tail light or brake light being out. And it's scary experience being someone of color. and. So I just have to um, say thank you for posting the policy, and I know that's required. Uh, and I, I, how long has it been up for? Thirty days. Yeah, I think actually over thirty days now. Um, this was on the last agenda, but we moved it. So. Yeah, and um, I know I reached out to you with some questions prior to today's meeting. So thank you for answering and and incorporating like the uses of. Um, why we need these. What is the benefit to community over community concern? And to me, um, seeing uh, so many of those examples in terms of car crashes and in terms of um, de-escalation with our mental health liaisons and um, really creating safety, especially with our low staffing in the police department, this is essentially another body, but it's not a human body that can be killed. Um, this is um, a, a, in place of a police officer that has a lot more capability. And, um, you know, it's, it's 
it's something that um, I think that similar, some of those aerial views to a helicopter maybe that I've seen other places use in certain situations. So I appreciate all those examples of, of how to use it. And I see fire here, so I know with our natural disasters and even our wharf crew um, having the ability to utilize um, some type of drone equipment um, going under the wharf and seeing the pilings and you know there's so many shared cross departmental uses that that this can be used um, and. Um, I just want to know, my question is, how, like, have you used drones before this purchase, and um, um, do other jurisdictions share across, not only, um, like, across our departments, but I know that other equipment is shared across jurisdictions. How does, how, how does that? Yeah. Um so the sheriff's department has, uh, I think, 24-ish of, uh, of these. Um, and actually, I could give you an example. Just this last Saturday night, we requested them uh, their mutual aid and, and their, the request of their drones for an, a high-risk situation that happened over on the west side of town with somebody that was armed and had shot the, the firearm uh, from inside the house. And we were able to use a drone to be able to sort of see around the house and, and before we start sending uniformed personnel towards the house, uh, we're able to assess for any sort of risks that are waiting for us potentially. So um, we just used the drone on Saturday night, I think it was. How um, can someone speak to um, how you would best um, address the concerns of, of abuse of drones in terms of surveillance and, and um, loss of civil liberties and, you know, targeting black and brown people. There's already this distrust and unsafe feeling that exists um, just by your uniforms. And so how would you um, address some of those concerns? Well... Specifically in the policy 607.6, it, it lists some of those specific examples out as far as prohibited use to conduct random surveillance activities or to target uh, any sort of uh, anybody based on the perceived um, gender, uh, race, uh, and, a, and a number of factors right there. So it's all called out for all of those prohibited uses to, you know, prohibited to use to harass, intimidate, discriminate. Um, all of that is, is spelled out here, so. What's the consequence to violating prohibited use? What's to stop someone from? Well, it, it would really depend on the severity of the violation of policy. We typically uh, use progressive discipline in, in our department, but there could be examples of something that was so grossly negligent that it could lead to termination. Um, but if it was a smaller violation of, of policy, then it goes through the process. We also have the independent auditor that participates with us and, and reviews uh, our investigations related to any sort of violation of our policy. Thank you. Councilmember Kalantar Johnson is recognized. Thank you, um, Chief, uh, for the presentation. I just wanted to know what's the ongoing cost. So there was a cost breakdown in one of the slides to get us get this program launched. Should the council approve? Um, but once we've done the sort of the software and the training, do we have a sense of the ongoing cost? Uh, Kathy Brothers, PMA, <laughs> PD. The ongoing costs, uh, what you see here, the $254,932 covers all of the costs for hardware, software, training, vehicle, uh, outfitting the vehicles, and subscriptions. So we shouldn't see any extra costs when it comes to maintaining the hardware. 
Um, we are already have an Axon contract that we where we store all of our evidence, so we shouldn't see any extra costs there. Uh, the only other cost would be basically just, well, this also covers licensing for the pilots mm -hmm. and the cost to maintain that license over five years. So just putting out officers in the field to operate these and the time spent, that <clears throat> technically could be a cost, but uh -huh. that would be folded into our just regular operational costs. So it's really one time, it sounds like. Yeah, we tried this. What's nice about Axon and Skydio is they've really packaged this really well and it's very comprehensive. And so we're able to forecast over five years and um, we don't expect to spend any more than this. The warranties cover in case a drone becomes defective or damaged, we have warranties that will cover replacement at no extra cost. Perfect. Thank you. And then just one last question. Um, Chief, you mentioned that we've collaborated and partnered with the Sheriff's Office as they have, I think you said, 24 drones. Um, what are the constraints or challenges of continuing that type of collaboration rather than um, uh, owning our own drones? And, and I can maybe answer part of that question is that then the benefit I would see is we have our own trained officers, but I, I'd like you to, if you could just expand on that. Yeah, just a few challenges. One is is response time, obviously, uh, depending on whether they have an operator, a trained operator on duty, and where that person is coming from is, is a challenge sometimes, or could be a challenge. I would also say if you had uh, multiple incidents uh, occurring at the same time, um, I could think of something similar to a, a school threat. Typically, we are very concerned about um, multiple threats coming in at the same time in different jurisdictions. That would be another uh, example where um, their resources obviously are going to focus on their jurisdiction. Um, and I can also think from a fire perspective, um, you know, I'm sure during the CZU fire, there were multiple drones being used in multiple different locations to give the fire personnel intelligence of the you know different areas of of that fire so that would be another challenge okay thank you, thank you. for the questions or comments by council members this would be the uh, chief thank you we're going to take some public testimony now this would be the opportunity for anyone who is with us in chambers this evening who wishes to testify this on this item to do so up to three minutes. Is there anyone with us who wishes to make such comments? Welcome. Hello. Um, good evening. Good evening. My name is Megan Goltz. I'm a local filmmaker here and I've flown drones, seen drones, seen a lot of them crash. And I'm also just kind of curious and concerned about who would be operating this. There is a lot of time that goes into setting it up, getting it in the air, getting it going. Battery life's maybe 40 minutes, I think you guys said. So that's maybe 30 minutes of usability because it also needs time to come back to its original place and land. If they can operate it from up to seven and a half miles away, what's gonna happen if there needs to be somebody on the ground? Also, cameras are very limiting. As we can see, like the cameras, the positionality gives you a very limited perspective versus somebody on the ground who can make distinguished judgment calls on, on what the need is, what the, what the other problems are happening, other you know, impacts from a car accident or, or what have you. Um, so I feel like that's very, very limiting as far as response to public safety. And my concern also was I heard a little bit about um, not impacting the public by being able to fly drones over like neighborhoods to see if there's somebody you know lurking in a backyard but what about those bystanders who are also being uh on a camera and staying in the system for maybe up to two years maybe longer based on uh their perspective of what's evidence or what's not um and that's really concerning to me because there's no way to check that there's no way to honor like our fourth amendment right of privacy because if we were to make it publicly available for people to cross check, that would eliminate the privacy. And also it would, you know, if there's supposed to be some level of transparency and uh, 
provisions about how this data is being used or not, how are we able to cross check that? How are we able to know that? Um, so I'm very concerned about the use of this because of you know problems with profiling and also as somebody who's flown a drone, you're operating it from sometimes a screen as small as your telephone. It is very, very, very easy to mis ID something or misjudge something and not know what you're really looking at, especially if you're in a cop cruiser trying to like chase the drone. Also, if the drone's flying 45 miles an hour, what if it hits a bird or something like that? And you're wasting all this time and resource to try to capture something on camera when you could just be boots on the ground. Um, I just think that that seems like a very expensive and costly use of resource and time, uh, especially if time is limited in a case of a crisis, in a case of, uh, of a flood or a fire or something like that where you might not be able to see other things going on um, and other factors at play. So I, I just urge city council to, to reject this, this uh, ask for a purchase of military equipment and further <laughs> militarizing uh, the police here that are, are meant to be our guardians and not warriors. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. What we're going to do is we're going to toggle back and forth. So you'll be right after the next person online. Next person online, good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Liz Fitzgerald, Santa Cruz resident and local psychotherapist. Um, I am really concerned um, about the militarization of our police as an answer to any of our issues and that, some, that it's something that could bring peace. Um, you know, hearing that you all passed this peace resolution vis-a-vis -vis the ceasefire in Gaza, um, really kind of sharing, okay, like January, let's have that be peace month. And now there's this proposal to militarize our police. I don't see those going together with Santa Cruz values. If our Santa Cruz values are to bring peace to this city, into this county, into this world. Um, also as a mental health professional, I'm disgusted and horrified to imagine these being used, these weapons, these, um, this militarization, the way that, you know, the council member was speaking to BIPOC being especially triggered and traumatized, understandably, by police presence, by police weapons, that, that to de-escalate a mental health crisis using this kind of, um, this kind of technology would cause more harm than help. Um, I'm also just, the idea of you all spending our money to both militarize our police force and to violate our privacy at the same time. I mean, that's just the, the devil violation um, is, is unspeakable. Um, let me see. Also, I, I just have a lot of concern about the piece about protests where the, the statement was made that they would be used for protests and other demonstrations if security concerns existed. Um, how will those be assessed? Aren't, wouldn't there always be security concerns? Will these always be used at protests? Um, and there's clearly, it sounds like there's really no policy in place to reinforce if there's a, a violation of the use agreement being made here in terms of how the drones are used. And that is extremely concerning to me. It sounds like there's, eh, there's not really a plan for that. Um, and so I am not in support of this resolution of the militarization of our police um, and with that, I yield my time. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Welcome. My, uh, my name is QZ. Uh, the Bearcat didn't decrease the uh, crime rate in Santa Cruz, and the drone is not going to do the same thing. And uh, I don't like the cost. That's all, that's all I want to say. Thank you, sir. We'll take the next person, then we'll be with you in just a second. We'll take somebody online back to you. Next person online, good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello. Um, I've got some questions. Uh, my first question is, when was the last time the sheriff was using all 24 drones simultaneously? That seems like an excessive amount of drones. Um, although with a wildfire, I could see that being used. So I'd love to know the answer to that. I know that uh, council doesn't respond to questions generally, but um, if we could ask that, that would be great. Um, also, when was the last time a simultaneous use of drones was done? by the sheriff and Santa Cruz Police Department, how many drones were involved with that. It seems like 
with the sheriff being such an integral part of our kind of joint law enforcement team and then being so loaded with 24 drones, it's it seems like this is a huge amount of money to invest in a drone policy that is completely redundant and uh, potentially pretty wasteful and something that uh, so far the public comments have spoken, you know, that Santa Cruz is uncomfortable with. Um, I generally, you know, I support the idea of using tools for police other than guns. I think it's great to have uh, more eyes and more angles and more intelligence, but it seems like we already have access to all of that. And this is just um, something to eliminate that partnership and pretend that that partnership doesn't exist and a, a great use of tax dollars in a wasteful way. Um, I yield my time. Thank you so much. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Irene O'Connell. I've lived in Santa Cruz for 15 years. <laughs> And since then, I've seen an increase in militarization of our police departments. I remember the Bearcat. I remember uh, the uh, assault launch um, shotguns. And even though this is not that, I want to just uh, uh, lift up that this is, sets a precedent for increasing the military, militarization of police and increasing that um, AB 481 just continues to uh, set the precedent for increasing the budget. Um, I also echo uh, the comments by Councilmember Bruner. I think there's a psychological impact to the community for having these drones. Um, I also echo the comments earlier of like, why can't there be more mutual aid uh, on part of the sheriff to share those 24 drones if they're really that useful and they really have that many, um, you know, 225 upwards, thousand dollars. I wonder what else could that that funding be for. There's so many issues for this city, and I really could imagine that funding being used for housing, for public education, for safety, in ways that don't require further militarization of the police. Another thing that's disturbing is seeing the same technology um, being used in Gaza on the US-Mexico border. Um, it's hard to trust that this isn't going to be used for surveillance, and it's hard to trust the judgment of police departments uh, when it comes to determining what mass action or protest is dangerous or criminal, because I think that part of the institution of policing is to protect private property, status quo, and when people use their First Amendment rights to mobilize and practice free speech, it becomes dangerous. So. Just want to encourage this, the council to um, question, do we need to further militarize the police? We are not the enemy. Residents are not the enemy. And I hope that the police department can use good judgment and that the council can use good accountability in making sure that that, um, uh, that QR code of, of checking to see how these are being used if they are approved. But I want to urge you to reject this uh, amendment increase and um, to encourage more mutual aid, as they say, between the sheriff department and the police department. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Ms. Bush, we'll take the next person online. Good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. Uh, hello, my name is Ani. Um, I'd like to start with, I strongly oppose the bill 481 PD. I see this as a major expense for our county and the long-term agreement is you know, something that needs to be taken very seriously. The use of military, you know, grade face recognition drones goes against our right of privacy as civilians. This is not a violent or dangerous city, not really. And the extreme use of this technology is honestly egregious. I personally find it incredibly hypocritical as well that the Santa Cruz City Council officials refused to pass a ceasefire resolution, specifically item 29 a few weeks ago, as it was, and um, altered some things in the name of peace, and here we are. But, you know, you all are eager to accommodate more police gadgets at a military level. Um, these are the same drones being used against Palestinians as we speak. And using such extreme force to survey us as civilians is honestly frightening. This is a huge opportunity for major problems to arise and abuse of power. This is an excessive amount of drones, and it's very expensive. 
I see this as honestly inciting more fear and distrust of the SCPD with these drones. What, you know, what are the consequences for officers abusing the use of them? Um, there is just such a need for community stabilizing to be done that almost $200,000 of allocation of funds can go to instead of drones. Um, I honestly urge every one of you to reflect on what this means for Santa Cruz. And I honestly don't see it having a positive effect on the public. So that's my piece. I reside the rest of my time. Thank you so much. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, I missed some of the presentation. I heard a couple minutes before the police chief took over. And, um, I was present during a demonstration on January 11th, I believe, at the Capitola City Council where they were going over their drone operations and such. Uh, my comment to the police chief is that, that I hope that the equipment that the videos you show, the equipment is actually much better than what the videos show. So I'm not sure about the equipment that's going to be used. But I think that um, for public safety, it's probably quite useful. I mean, I know it would be quite useful. I can think of countless examples. But um, the community seems to be concerned about their privacy and stuff. I mean, I have two of the latest 2023 weapons in my hand by Motorola. These are great freaking tools. Um, what brought me into this room more than four and a half year, years ago was why are we allowing military weapons in civilian locations? And at the time, Mr. Tony Condotti and Ms. Wat Mrs. Watkins and Sandy Brown are the only ones besides the two clerks that were here four and a half years ago. And uh, it just seems there's no time. Got a minute and 40. Just because regulations have been passed, like the 1996 FCC 702, that the only complaint people can make about the control devices, the frequency devices, this is one, um, is the way they look. Now, a lot of things have happened since then. Uh, once the scamdemic started, what was I forget that day? I was here on a Monday and got a paper piece of paper saying it'd be a live meeting, and then I unfortunately witnessed some real panic in Mr. Andy Mills, and I kind of picked my battles. It was a rainy day, but this building closed down for two years to the public. But the next day, extensive public works operations. Matt, you shouldn't leave. Oh, no. Excuse me. Come here. Stay with me. He's the one that's no, no, in charge of this me. group. Stay with me. Yes. So... I'll reiterate, the use of the drones, I think, can be used for many positive purposes. But the frequency weapons that have been rubber stamped through this room and the county are of real concern that none of the public is bringing that up. So I'm not quite sure what else to say, but I was asking Matt not to leave the room because he's the one that controls you guys, like you guys are little helium balloons being held. Whether or not you think you have control, this is not a city for the citizens. This is a corporation, and you protect your stockholders. And those stockholders seem to be organizations like Verizon and the FCC. So what? I got 14 seconds. So I'm all for law enforcement being peace officers and doing the best they can. And if this equipment it puts them in a safer position to do that, that's great. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Next person online, good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi. Um, I am chiming in to say that I um, strongly oppose the increase in the budget for this drone. I feel so unsettled that no one could even answer how long the data would be retained, even if the or whatever footage does not even contain any evidence. Um, and also in the slide, at one point it mentioned routine monitoring of mass gathering protests or demonstrations where security concerns or criminal activity does not exist. This is listed as a prohibited use. But who gets to decide 
what is and is not criminal activity or what is and is not a security concern. I do not trust that the Santa Cruz Police Department can distinguish with no biases and judgment what is a security concern and what is not. Also, as a local volunteer firefighter, CAL FIRE has their own drones. They do not need support or mutual aid from Santa Cruz Police Department to get the surveillance that they need. And like someone previously said, if there are 24, 28 drones that a neighboring department has, in what situation, in what disastrous reality are we living in that all of those need to be used as at once? This just seems like a toy that the police department wants to use for whatever quote unquote piece they're creating in town. This money could be used to serve the houses community that is routinely criminalized. That money could be used for so many things that the community actually needs. And this is not one of those things. And like Councilwoman mentioned and other people mentioned, black and brown people already do not feel safe in this town, rightfully so. And this is not helping public safety. I love that whoever did the marketing for the police department is great. You put the natural <laughs> disaster first and the criminal activity at the bottom. That is propaganda right there. <laughs> You will not be using this for any natural disaster. It is a shame that you are marketing this as that. These are lies. Please do not show up for the community in this way, especially after you oppose the ceasefire resolution. That violence is not happening somewhere else. That violence is happening right here in our community. Please wake up to that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We are going to take... Um, we have, uh, we're going to take public comment up until seven o'clock on this item, and that will be the end of our public comment on it. Is there anyone with us in chambers who wishes to make a comment? Seeing and hearing we, none, we will go to the next person online. We're going to the next person online. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, my name is Stacy Garcia, and I'm so deeply concerned about this item. And I'm calling you all to urge you to vote no on item number 30. Militarizing our police department with this kind of equipment will not make our community safer. What makes our community safer is investment in food, housing, health care, and education. Please invest this money in resources that actually help our community instead of harming it. This military surveillance equipment will surely result in the unjust and disproportionate criminalization of black and brown people and peaceful protesters exercising their First Amendment right to end violence, discrimination, and an end to the ongoing U.S. funded genocide. This month of January, you all declared to be, quote, peace month. And just today, you talked about wanting to make more equitable policy decisions. So I ask for you to just take a minute to consider equity in your decision making. Does militarizing the police bring more peace and equity to our community? If you answered yes, then I want you to think about who it brings more equity and peace to. Who does this decision actually benefit? Does this benefit your black and brown community members who are disproportionately criminalized, killed, and arrested by police across this country? Of course it doesn't. It actively works against racial equity and against peace. This particular surveillance equipment is so dangerous to everyone in our city and has proven that this particular racial recognition surveillance equipment disproportionately harms and actively targets black and brown communities. You can say it doesn't, but the evidence of this equipment's use proves otherwise. A racist policy as defined by Dr. Ibram X. Kennedy is, quote, any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups, end quote. You have a responsibility to make an equitable policy decision for our city. If you want peace and you want equity, a vote yes will not achieve that. It will actively work against it. And as somebody who teaches and studies racial equity and justice for a living, let me be clear. A vote yes is a racist decision. A vote yes is a racist policy. I urge you to take actions that reflect your words and vote no on item number 30. Thank you.
Well, thank you, sir. Good evening. Welcome. My name is um, Victor, and I've worked uh, here in Santa Cruz County for close to 10 years. Before that, I was a student here. And uh, after receiving my graduate degree, I returned back to the community. I've been working with youth. But before that, I worked and lived in uh, Beach Flats. So when I was living there at an earlier age, when I was younger, I never really saw or heard from the community members who were my peers that more policing made us safe. I never heard that. What I did hear was that everybody wanted more uh, recreational activities for the youth. They wanted more soccer team uh, uh, equipment, that they wanted arts programs for our youth. And I, I'm fortunate to say that I was participating in such things. Um, I saw a lot of those things as preventative measures for crime. And I saw those opportunities as being opportunities that created more um, relationships between youth that perhaps would not get to know each other. Um, recently, we saw uh, reporting again about what happened in Uvalde. It was a huge tragedy to our nation, to the world, really. And um, it took uh, enforcement, I think I heard it was over an hour to act. Now, I know that our nation has become more militarized in our police departments, so I question why that took that long a time, right? I know that the equipment was there, and yet there was no action. So what I'm trying to say is that we need more human um, interaction, not more technological integration into our departments. Now, I'm one that to say that I never had a good relationship as a child with police. But to this day, as an educator, I say two of the most important, uh, I say, institutions in our communities. I do, I do see a role for safety. Maybe policing the way it is right now, I don't see it. But I see uh, that that could be a resource but to help build communities. They want to say education and teachers. So we had that more integration of humanity and providing resources for children that would be now. Going back to Valdi, if we had more resources and training, that would have been, uh, that would have allocated more, um, let's say, uh, opportunities for the police officers to act appropriately, right? And for some reason, they froze. That wasn't happening. And I think technology has taken away our humanity to ability to communicate with each other because we are always escalating because we put this thing in front of us in the middle, says so it's gonna take care of you. Now, I think North Dakota in the 2015s, they passed a bill for drones to weaponize drones, right? And in 2018, I remember watching television, the first death in Dallas, when they armed a bomb and killed an individual. That was horrific for me to see in our own country. I don't want that to happen to us. Thank you, and I, I hope you oppose this. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Next person online, good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. So I, I want to um, say that I am against the request to purchase military equipment. Um, I'm looking at a database um, that has information from the California Department of, Just of Justice. And um, from the years of 2016 to 2021, there have been four reports of police discrimination, 25% uh, ruled in favor of civilians. And um, in those years, there, there was also 90 complaints of police misconduct in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, so that already tells me that we shouldn't really trust the police department. And in the... Um, I believe it was in the year 2022, there was a Santa Cruz cop who killed a man and he didn't face any charges. So that's also concerning. Um, and um, there have been many claims of racial bias against uh, Santa Cruz police. Um, and I just want to say that um, kind of to repeat what other people have said, there's nothing natural about using these kind of technologies, especially on native land. Um, and um, it's just very shameful. Um, I think that you are all like white liberal hypocrites because you talk about all this peace. Um, peace is a white man's word. That's typically what white people like to say. Um, 
and there's nothing peaceful about this. It's very hypocritical because of what you, uh, the, the resolution that you recently passed. And then we just have the MLK march. So it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I understand that you are all, most of you, if not like the majority are white people, you will never understand what it feels to be discriminated against. Um, and this will, what this would allow, what, uh, it would make people feel scared, um, uh, black people, and um, because of police brutality, uh, um, Hispanics, people that are undocumented, um, because this is used at the border, and um, and even um, people from the Middle East, um, Palestinians, a, a lot of people are in fear right now, so um, this would make it worse, and, um, and I understand that uh, the council member Golder, she has uh, dressed as a Native American in the past um, for a costume party, which is very offensive. I understand that um, she wants to be oppressed really, really bad, but um, unfortunately, you will never experience that, and I hope you don't. And because of that reason, um, I don't think you guys understand um, what it means uh, to be in fear of these kind of things. Anyone else with us in chambers wish to provide testimony? Next person online. We're gonna take uh, two more people online, this person and the next person. Good evening, person online, welcome. Hello, my name is Isabel, I'm a Santa Cruz resident, and I'm speaking to ask the council to please not use a quarter of a million dollars to purchase five new surveillance drones. Cops should not be at war with the residents of their town, so why is the city council trying to arm them as if they are? Instead of spending money on housing, on life-saving services for our homeless neighbors, on building and repairing climate change resilient infrastructure, we instead want to give expensive military equipment to our police. Santa Cruz PD already has an armored attack vehicle, chemical agent launching shotguns and grenades in its arsenal, and as other people have mentioned, the sheriff's office already has 24 drones. These new drones will be equipped with high-resolution camera and audio equipment. We already know Santa Cruz PD has a track record of surveilling and intimidating private citizens, including during the wildcat strike at UCSC. And we are handing them the very expensive tools to do the same things at greater scope and scale. The summary report claims that the drones will allow Santa Cruz PD to quote, de-escalate and or communicate with individuals during high risk situations. Santa Cruz PD doesn't know how to de-escalate and care for the community even without the added distance and empowerment of military grade surveillance drones. We can't kid ourselves into thinking that adding technology will magically make the police an ethical and well-functioning organization that is truly in service of the well-being of all Santa Cruz residents. That this item appears on the agenda after the city council shot down a ceasefire resolution, after hundreds of people shut down the UCSC main entrance to protest the ongoing genocide in Palestine, and after the city council declared January to be, quote, peace month, is no accident. Santa Cruz seems to be gearing up for more aggressive suppression and intimidation of public speech, and, em and a municipality truly at peace would not need to wage war against its own residents. I urge the council to vote no on all components of item 30. Thank you, and I yield my time. Well, thank you. Let me see if there is anyone in council chambers. We'll go to the last public speaker. We'll be the person online. Good evening. Welcome. Hello. Uh, I'm Douglas Filiu, and I'm speaking to also ask the council to vote no on item 30. I've been listening to this council today for the past couple of hours, and I saw some really inspiring topics being discussed, such as climate change, acts on homelessness, and so on, topics which I think we should be discussing and investing our energy in as a community. So it really seems to me a little astonishing that while there are people in this community who struggle to put bread on the table or find a roof over their heads, that we are discussing whether or not to give military-grade surveillance technology to the police. We have seen in several other states and in California as well how this technology can and has been unlawfully abused by the police, both in the Black Lives Matter movement of a few years ago and in the recent protests for Palestine to target the constitutional right to assemble and unlawfully arrest and intimidate protesters. This regardless of the fact that doing such a thing would be, like the speaker explained, prohibited. I find it very concerning that the speaker says that the drone will not be used in protests where security concerns do not exist, and security concern is precisely the justification that has been used over and over again 
in cases of extreme police violence and abuse of power. I don't know what possible good for our community could, could be in further militarizing the police. They already have armored vehicles, shotguns, and grenades. It would be far more useful and work a great deal more towards the reduction of crime in this city if this money were to be spent addressing the causes of crime, such as poverty, food insecurity, employment insecurity, and the complete absence of affordable housing options in this city where living in someone's backyard can cost more than $1,500 a month. One dollar spent on any of these topics would be, in my mind, worth several hundred spent on giving the police department yet another way in which they can spy, wound, or even kill someone. If you are serious about actually making this community a better place, then we should be constantly thinking of those which this community has failed and the policies we can enact to help them. I do not see how buying spy drones does any of these things. To me, it seems to be yet another step towards a mass surveillance world and the naive surrender of our personal freedoms to an organization known to abuse its powers and authority. I therefore, again, urge the council to vote no on item two. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. The matter is back before the council. Mayor would be glad to introduce entertain rather a motion the vice mayor is recognized i would like to move the staff recommendation there's a motion is there a second second there's a second by miss contar johnson madam vice mayor you may open on your motion so um i think despite the rallied uh public comments from um the people that organized this evening the majority of the people in Santa Cruz that I speak to um, are really excited about this and they've reached out and said that this public safety tool is long overdue and if it can save one life in a water rescue, a fire, or by one of our armed, I'm sorry, um, uniformed personnel not having to go into a situation where they um, could possibly die, then this is something that we absolutely must purchase. Thank you. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I, um, I'm not going to make a lot of comments. I don't think my powers of persuasion will be effective here, so I'm just going to say that uh, to the some of the folks who uh, called in and are present here, um, I, I agree with you about concerns related to privacy, um, surveillance technologies. Um, I have mixed feelings about the potential good that drones can do. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, but I also share the concerns. And so I wanted to see if my colleagues might be willing to um, entertain uh, an amendment to this motion. It is a request for some specific information in the reporting that comes back to us. I appreciate that you've included an annual report. Um, I hope that the city council will get some information out of those reports. And so um, I sent it to Bonnie and I'm just gonna, it, it's, it's wordy, it's, it's not a lot, it's not a lot. It's just asking for some specific concrete information to come um, in those reports. And the place that this language would go would be in policy 607, uh, I think it's section B, hold on one second. Um, no, 607.4, it would be after the last bullet, which is the bottom of, or the top of page three <laughs> in our packet. Um, and so what it, it's asking to uh, provide information on the efficacy um, if, it's, if, if the drone uh, foot, it, it, having these drones actually achieves the identified purposes, um, the total annual cost. Um, I, I think that you've shared that and it feels pretty clear to me, but I think it would be good to have an assessment of that. Um, a description of how it was used um, and um, whether and how often that data um, was shared because there is a question about sharing among agencies. It, it seems like that would be pretty simple to let us just include that in a report so we know if it's being shared um, and with whom, um, what other agencies. Um, and then I think, um, and this one, this one I feel very strongly about, uh, a breakdown of where the technology was deployed because um, I do think that the concerns that people have expressed about uh, 
you know, potential profiling, the way that people experience surveillance in our community is different depending on who you are. And that breaks down, you know, race, class, um, you know, all kinds of ways. And so I, I do think it's important to understand where um, it's being used. Uh, and then a summary of if, if there are any complaints or concerns that have been shared um, directly related to the, the use um, and any other information. So I know that's very long, but it, it's actually quite simple. It's just so providing some specific second. information. Hold, hold on for just a second. Are you asking that to be accepted as a friendly amendment? I am. Okay, is that agreeable to you? I'd like to call on the chiefs to speak to what the feasibility of this. Um, I don't. Chief, somebody, sergeant. Or somebody from either department is fine if this Thank seems you. like feasible. So AB 41 already covers a majority of the uh, items listed in here that are requirements for us to report in our annual report for all of the equipment. Um, there are things that um, are not specifically named in AB 41 at the, with the same terminology, but in essence, this is capturing what AB 41 already requires. Um, not entirely. There are there are things that are not in AB 41, but uh, the large majority of it. And then I would also like to add that, uh, with reference to uh, the ability, council has the ability to deny use per AB 41 of any of the equipment that's listed on there uh, as a um, check and balance to the equipment. Sergeant, if I could, if I could ask, would you? enumerate those items A through G which are not in the report that would otherwise come to us. What are the unique items that Council Member Brown is asking for? Uh, the item D uh, is not specifically covered in AB 481 uh, as far as to how we would be able to report that out. I, I don't have the answer. Um, the specific geographical locations of where uh, the items are used, that's not in uh, AB 481. Um, specifically, uh, community complaints are in AB 481. Uh, we, we, are, we have to uh, report on those. And internal audits are required uh, for reporting in AB 481 uh, in our military use policy. So would I be right in thinking that items D and E would be unique adds to the report we would receive otherwise? That is correct. And let me ask if D is possible for you to gather and report on that information. Chief, Can good I evening, sir. Can I ask a question about that clarifying yes, sir. question? So it says, um, how often the data is shared, or were you referring to how often the equipment is deployed to outside agencies? Councilmember Brown. The data. Okay. Yeah, that would be separate than outside of AB 481 at this point. But is that a knowable fact? Well, we would track how often it was deployed to an outside agency, and at that point, I would guess probably 99.9% .9 of the time it would be evidence in a criminal matter, so we would share that. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I think since we're tracking how often and where it's deployed, we'd be able to capture the information uh, if we shared the data with a different agency. So D and E both are knowable to some extent. I mean, the extent to which you can gather that information and report on it. Okay, I'm seeing that there's a lot of conversation going on. I want yeah. to make sure we okay. give you time to answer this question. Ms. Brothers or Sergeant, let, let somebody get to the... My question again, I'll restate it for you, is on D and E, as I understand it from the chief, that are, that is not currently required in the report that would otherwise come to us. So on D and E, is that knowable information or the best effort you could make and you could add that to the report? 
Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. I, I need to offer one clarification, Please sir. Do, sir. Uh, item A. Yes. Uh, we, we do have to report on how often we use it. AB 41 is not as subjective as it's a governing its effectiveness in the report. So that would be sort of, yes, partially addressed, but not totally as worded in this amendment. Okay. I wonder if a way to go here, Ms. Brown, is to check and see with the vice mayor if adding D and E only because the others appear to be covered in the report that would otherwise come to us. Is, is that an offer of a friendly amendment yes. from you? Would that work for are you? you? Are you prepared to support the motion with the amendments? Yeah, oh, I, okay. I, this is not a weapon, so yeah. I have yeah, different good. feelings okay. about this. Okay. <laughs> good. <laughs> then absolutely, I'll, and it's, if it's okay. feasible, okay. I want these are, these are now added, Ms. Bush, not A through G, only D and E would be added. That's agreeable to the makers, agreeable to the second. Where was the second? I lost yes, track of it. Yes. Thank you, agreeable to the second. All right, matters uh, still before the council for debate and discussion. Let me ask if there is further debate and discussion. Two points here. One is, if I understood it correctly, some have been characterizing it as a weapon, some haven't been. There is no capability for this to have a weapon on it attached to it, added at some later date, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, you also indicated that there would not be face recognition associated with this. That is clearly prohibited. That is and, correct. Uh, and the, the entity with whom we have a contract, they're clear on that? That is correct. It Thank is you. in Third our policy. Uh, there is no general fund money going into this. If I'm correct, it is asset forfeiture funds. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Is there further debate or discussion? Seeing, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and is awarded. We are going to take a seven minute break until 7.20. Santa Cruz City Council is back in session following a brief evening recess. We have a quorum established. We are now on agenda item 31 through 39. These are appointments to various boards and commissions, appointments made by the City Council. Ms. Bush. You are going to lead us through this, Thank you. and uh, <laughs> okay. because you do such a fine job on it, and uh, let's do this. Uh, I am going to uh, take any council member questions, then we'll have public comment, then Ms. Bush will take us through step by step, commission by commission. So let me ask if uh, council members have any questions first before we begin. And hearing none, let me ask if there is anyone with us who wishes to provide any public comment on any one of the appointments that we will have in front of us. This will we'll do this all at once. So if there's anyone who wishes to provide testimony or comment, this would be your opportunity to do so. And while you're approaching, let me, come, please come forward. Uh, let me check with Ms. Bush to see if we have anyone else online. Nobody with their hand raised. On that one. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rebecca Acosta. I have submitted an application for the downtown commission. I have worked downtown for the past 18 years. I think that I would offer a perspective as a mom, but also as a manager downtown that would be beneficial to our current commission. Hmm. Thank you for the consideration. Well, thank you. Good evening. Hello, good evening, mayor and council members. My name is Lola Quiroga. I'm a resident of the West Side, and I've applied for the Transportation and Public Works Commission. A little bit about why I'm interested. 
as a UCSC Transportation and Parking Services employee and student organizer. I feel strongly about building more walkable and bikeable spaces as well as accompanying transit around development. I've been living off campus since my second quarter at UCSC and since then I've moved four different times, each time in a different neighborhood so I have a lot of experience moving around um, different parts of the city and county via biking, walking, and transit. And I have a good idea of the strong and weak points of Santa Cruz road design. I'm eager to work with the community and my fellow commissioners to create the built environment we all wanna see for the future of Santa Cruz, like working on proposals for bike and pedestrian improvements around existing housing, as well as upcoming housing projects. For example, a proposal to improve bike safety on Upper Laurel and King, to accompany the new food bin housing project that just went before the Planning Commission. I believe my perspective as a car-free UCSC student and lover of Santa Cruz make me a good candidate for this commission. I look forward to listening to the community and working with my colleagues to make sure that the voices of disabled, queer, low-income, people of color, and other minorities don't go unheard. Thank you for your time and considering my application. Just say, I, I I'm an old man, so I don't hear well. <laughs> J say your name so I can identify you oh, with it. It's Lola Quiroga. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very much appreciate Thank your you. testimony and your participation here. Bodie, good evening. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Bodie Shargell, mm -hmm. um, and I'm here speaking in support of one of my absolute favorite people in Santa Cruz, uh, my good friend Lola Quiroga. Okay. Um, and in support of her application to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, I'll give just a few of my thoughts on why I think she'll be a, a fantastic commissioner. Um, first of all, as uh, personally myself, a member of the City of Santa Cruz's uh, Climate Action Task Force, I've learned that the single greatest step that we can take to combat climate change is to build institutional momentum to getting people out of cars, and Lola will make great progress towards that as a commissioner. Um, some people might use the fact that Lola is studying computer science as evidence that she's smart. I would say that she's smart um, despite that, but that's just my own, that's just my own um, <laughs> opinion. Um, regardless of that, she may be uh, coming into the commission with a background in transportation advocacy, um, but with how um, inquisitive, intelligent, and, and committed she is, um, she'll know as much about our city's public works projects as anyone by like her third meeting. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I'll say that Lola's identities as a student, a worker, and a woman of color go along with a strong value for equity, which will lead her to ensure that the city of Santa Cruz's transportation system um, and built environment serve everyone, especially those who have historically been underserved. Um, Lola's gonna make a fantastic commissioner, and I hope um, that you will give her your support today. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thanks for all the good work you do in the community. Zenon, good evening, sir. Welcome. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. Um, my name is Zenon Elliott Crow. I'm a commissioner or outgoing commissioner on transportation and public works uh, with the city of Santa Cruz, um, and I'm here today to speak in favor of Lola um, and her uh, application to be appointed to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. I wanted to first extend my appreciation to the council for my term on the commission. It's been a wonderful experience, and I'm really proud of the work that we've done uh, on the body um, and in the respect that uh, with you guys giving me the opportunity as a student uh, to be on that body, we've been able to make significant progress in a lot of mobility projects that um, are affecting students in ways that we might not otherwise have seen those protectives. For instance, um, when we were on commission, uh, I was able to speak about the experience of uh, um, cyclists coming from campus down Spring Street to High Street to get to downtown. And as part of the uh, new signalized crossing crosswalk from Spring Street over High, um, we were able to discuss and actually include a specific bicycle button uh, mm -hmm. for cyclists to activate that crosswalk as a more safe way to get across the street, especially for the students that were coming down from campus. And I know um, it's, I really value the perspective that I was able to bring in that discussion as a student, and I think I really value as well that the incredible perspective I know Lola will bring to the commission as well. I know that she's smart, she's very, very um, intuitive, and she also has a deep knowledge and understanding of these issues of transportation. Um, and so I think it's really important that uh, Lola is the perfect candidate for fulfilling this position and that we continue to have an active student voice on the council or on the commission uh, where 55% of Metro riders are students um, and where there's a 
whole host of uh, safety issues related specifically to how students interact with the city. And I also do want to echo the fact that um, with the recent council reforms, originally my term was uh, going to be a four-year term, but then it got cut down to a two-year term um, as a result of those reforms. Um, and so there's also an imperative need to make sure that that voice remains to be filled um, by a student's role uh, in, in making sure those, those perspectives are heard. So I think Lowe's a fantastic candidate for this position. I really support her, um, and I really support uh, the vision of making sure we can have um, a wide range of viewpoints represented on the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Thank you. Don't go away. I'd be remiss if we didn't thank you for your service. As I understand it, you're going to be graduating in a couple of months and maybe leaving the area, going doing something else. But while you were here, thank you so much for bringing the vo exact voice you're talking about uh, to the commission. Thank you, Zenon. I appreciate it. Thank you. Certainly. Good evening. We'll take you and then we'll, we're going to take somebody online back and forth, but good evening. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and council members. My name is Elizabeth Madrigal and I am a Seabright resident in support of appointing Lula Quiroga to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. I, ever since I've moved to Santa Cruz, I've lived in this wonderful city, car free, and have made it a mission of mine to traverse all the way from Rana Gulch to the west side on weekends. So very much familiar with the condition of our streets and the improvements that need to be made. And ever since I've met Low Life, just really um, valued how much that is also at the forefront of her thinking um, and how passionate she is about those subjects and just the interconnectivity of one place to another. I'm also a member of the Link 21 Equity Advisory Council. I don't know if you all have heard of that, but that's a mission under BART to connect the Northern California mega region with one another, of which the Monterey Bay region is a part of. So I, I've also really just valued the way that Lola thinks not just about the city of Santa Cruz in of itself, but also how we connect to places like Monterey County, um, the Bay Area, specifically San Jose, but also in the future when we get better train connections, um, San Francisco, Oakland, other places of that sort. So yeah, really just want to um, be here to support Lola and hope you all appoint her. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to take the next person online, then we'll be right with you. Good evening, person online. Welcome and please proceed. Good evening, Council. Um, this is Ryan Meckel. Um, before I talk about myself, I'd like to second what you've all heard about Lola uh, and how important it is to have a student voice on the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, having been in, on the commission has been a great experience, and more broadly speaking, having a student voice on that commission has been fantastic, especially an active student. Um, it, it, both of them, uh, Zenon has brought and Lola would bring an incredible energy that uh, the commission desperately needs, and this the, the campus makes up such a large portion of our community. I think it would we would be remiss to not have a student uh, on this body. Mm -hmm. Personally, uh, I've been on the body for the past year and a half. For the past year, as vice chair, and prior to that, very engaged with the commission and being a bike rider and non car owner myself, very uh, engaged with the needs and wants and risks that come with not owning a car in the city. Uh, during my time on the commission, I've seen great progress. I think it's been amazing what we've been able to do, and I hope to continue that. Uh, being a resident of District 4, I am especially aware of the growth we're going to see over the next few years in our city, especially in the downtown core. And I think that it's important that we, you know, responsibly and respectively uh, grow out our transportation as well as, as our housing at the same time. These things are inextricably linked. Um, I believe I'm a good voice to do that. Many of you know I'm very engaged with housing policy in the city and the broader region. Um, and it's just been great to be able to tie those two things together while on this commission. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I hope to be reappointed. I thank you for your time. And if I'm not, I thank you for the time that I've had on this commission. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you for your service and thank you for your testimony. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Council. My name is Keith Diggs. Uh, I'm a Seabright resident, um, hopefully driving the last car I will ever own, knock on wood. Um, a, want to uh, express my appreciation to the Council um, and whoever else in city government is responsible for the e-bikes here. Uh, they're, they're fantastic. I love them. So a big round of applause for that. 
Um, and then second, just want to echo uh, what everyone has been saying in support of Lola Kiroga uh, for the at-large seat on the Transportation Council. Um, I also know her and she's fantastic and I uh, think she will serve the community very well. So thank you. Well, thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good evening, welcome. Good evening. Person online, good evening. Okay, uh, three, two, one. Sorry that we didn't connect on that. Do we have another person online, Ms. Bush? Anyone else? Okay, the, uh, Ms. Bush, we're now gonna turn this exercise over to you, commission by commission. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to remind council and the public, in 2020, at the beginning of 2023, you guys um, approved the sort of migration to directly appointed commissioners to a handful of commissions, um, those that have seven members on the body to align with each council member. And there is the need to um, uh, stagger those because you can't have every member terming out at the same time or you're not going to have a quorum. So this is essentially phase two. Um, that's why you're going to see some people who have um, three-year terms, some people who have one-year terms. That the one years are going to get them to the next round of new districts um, council members that are appointed next year. So, um, with that, if nobody has any questions, questions, please, Ms. Bruner. Two of the speakers spoke as if they are not applicants in our binder, and so. Um, I do have a note about one of them. Okay, I was just curious about that. How, when do we, how do we get clarification? Did someone withdraw or? Yeah, if you, um, Zenon, um, he did apply and he withdrew from the Downtown and okay, Transportation and Public Works Commission. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Because that is an option in our binder. Five seconds, go ahead. I, I should also note that, um, yeah, I'm, apologies for applying for a reappointment, but I withdrew recently um, because my graduation plans changed and it didn't make sense to continue on in the role. Um, and then also I noticed in the agenda that it said I was a part of the downtown commission, which is news to me, but <laughs> I, in which case I am very clearly out of order with all attendance requirements. So, <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Are there further questions of Ms. Bush before we begin? Ms. Bush, back to you. All right, so the first um, commission up is the arts, and that is one seven-member commission that is going to be transitioning to districts. Um, so we have the, these are two at-large um, appointments with terms ending in January 2025. Um, and for the at-large appointments, I will start from one direction and move my way. That way, everybody gets the first go-around. So Council Member Bruner, you, have, you can nominate up to two. Um, I nominate Linda Cover and Rebecca Guzman. Councilmember Calentone, no new. No. Do you have any? No new. No. All right. Then by consensus, it would be Linda Cover and Rebecca Escobedo Guzman. Okay. Okay, the next we have is the County Library Advisory Commission. The city has um, membership to um, that commission. These are two at-large um, openings with terms ending for four, full four-year term, term ending January 31st, 2028. So two openings, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, up to two. Raina Dubin and Vivian Rogers. I just realized there was only two, though. <laughs> Um, <coughs> no, no others, I take it? Okay. By consensus, Raina Dubin and Vivian Rogers. Up next is the Downtown Commission. We have um, uh, Mayor Keeley's appointment for his direct appointment ending in January 31st, 2027. Joe Ferraro.
All right, and then we have one at-large opening, um, Vice Mayor Golder. Rebecca Acosta. Anybody have anyone else they want to nominate? And then uh, by consensus, approve Joe Ferrara for a nomination. Okay, so we have Joe Ferrara as Mayor Keeler's direct appointment and Rebecca Acosta. The Historic Preservation Commission is next. That's another one that is um, direct appointments. And we have two openings, which are um, Vice Mayor Golder and Mayor Keeley's appointments, with terms both ending January 31st, 2027. Um, the selection in 2023 determined the order in which um, they are chosen this time. So Vice Mayor Golder gets the first okay. pick. William Schultz. Mayor Keeley. Sean Wilson. By consensus, we have William Schultz as Vice Mayor Golders appointment, and Mayor Keeley has Sean Wilson. And the Parks and Rec Commission. We have one opening, that's Vice Mayor Golders direct appointment. Leo. Leo Cruz. <clears throat> no, it's okay. I could sign it. Um, okay. Any objection to Jorge Leonardo Cruz? No? Uh, what? Um, by consensus? No, but it's her direct appointment. Yes. Um, up next is the Planning Commission. Two openings. We have Councilmember Newsom has a direct appointment and one at large. Um, so, Councilmember Newsom, do you have? Uh, Rachel Dan. And then Mayor Keeley, um, for the at-large, do you have someone we could start with you for one nominee? Just me. I'm sorry for delaying the process. I apologize for this. <clears throat> Bear with me. Mr. Thompson. Joe Thompson? No, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Matthew Thompson. Oh. Oh, Matthew Thompson. Member Watkins? No new items for you. Oh, Council Member Brown? No new ones? No. Member Bruner, do you have anyone else? I had Rafa Sonnenfeld. Member Kalantari Johnson, no new ones. Vice Mayor Golder. So we have a nomination for Matthew Thompson and one for Rafa Sonnenfeld. So we will go through and um, do a, a vote count to determine who gets that. Um, Council Member Newsom. Uh, what am I voting on? Do I just You're say the name? Vote or? For either Rafa Sonnenfeld or Matthew Thompson. So just say the name? Yes. Matthew Thompson. Councilmember Bruner, um, sorry, Brown. 
Matthew Thompson. Watkins. Same, Matthew Thompson. Councilmember Bruner. Rafa Sonnenfeld. Alan Tari Johnson. Matthew Thompson. Vice Mayor Golder. Matthew Thompson. And Mayor Keeley. Matthew Thompson. So just to reiterate, we have Rachel Dan, who is um, Councilmember Newsom's direct appointment, and Matthew Thompson, who is the at-large appointment. Up next is Sister Cities. Um, we have two at-large appointments. Starting with Councilmember Watkins. Yeah. Hang on, sorry. Um, let me make sure I, sorry, just one second, excuse me. I wanna make sure I wrote it down correctly, my notes. Okay, um, Carola Barton. And Andrea Ryordan, and I apologize if I mispronounced either or both names. <laughs> Councilmember Brown. No, no. Mayor Keeley, do you have any new nominees? Bes oh no. Okay. So by consensus, we have. Um, okay. Now I see where you are. Carola, Carola Barton, or Andrea Riordan? Riordan? Um, thank you. Riordan, okay. Riordan. Oh, it's spelled, it looks like. Yeah. Okay, Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, we have four open four openings here. So we have Vice Mayor Golder's nomination, Councilmember Newsom's nomination, and <coughs> two at large. Um, so starting with Vice Mayor Golder, who would you like to appoint? Oh shoot, I had all four of them in there because I didn't know that it was mine. Mine is Scott Harriman. 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 Yeah. Okay. Councilmember Newsom. Ryan Meckel. And then we have um, the two at large now, starting with Councilmember Brown. Um, Candace Brown and Lola Quiroga. Councilmember Newsom. Okay, Councilmember Bruner. Ron Goodman. That's it, okay, Councilmember, okay. Uh, Detlef Adam and Ron Goodman. That's fine, so just Detlef Adam, okay. Mayor Keeley. Councilmember Newsom, did you want me to come back to you or you have no note? Okay. So we have um, one, two, three, four. Okay, we got four. No. We had two, 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 one, two. Who? No. No, we have Who? Detlef, Candace, Ron, Scott Harriman, Ryan Meckel, Lola Kiroga is what I marked. Ron Goodman, Detlef. Oh, sorry. So the other one was his direct. Oh, okay. So yeah, there's four. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we have two at-large positions that we now have to go through and vote for. So you can vote for up to, actually, it'll probably be easier for me to go one at a time. Um, for Ron Goodman, actually, no, that's not going to work either. <laughs> um, Councilmember Newsom, out of the names, we have Ron Goodman, Detlef Adam, Candace Brown, and Lola 
Who would your two be? Ron Goodman and Lola Quiroga. Member Brown? I'm going to go with Ron Goodman and Lola Quiroga. Member Watkins? Ron Goodman and um, Detlef Adam. Mayor Keeley? Ron Goodman, Lola Quiroga. Vice Mayor Golder? Ron Goodman and Detlef Adam. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Ron Goodman and Detlef Adam. And Councilmember Bruner. Ron Goodman and Lola Quiroga. Okay. For the two at large, we have Ron Goodman and Lola Quiroga. <laughs> I'll practice that. Um, And just to reiterate, we have Scott Harriman for Vice Mayor Golder and Ryan Meckle for Council Member Newsom, Director Brown. <coughs> and then last but not least is the Water Commission. There are two openings. We have Vice Mayor Golder's um, appointment and then one at large. So Vice Mayor Golder, who would you nominate? Okay. Um. Julianne Rhodes. Any objection to that? No? Okay. And then we have one at large opening. What was that? Is it you want me to say it or what? No, it's Councilmember oh. Newsom's, yeah. Sorry. Uh David Baskin. Councilmember Bruner? Hmm? No new. Um Kalantari Johnson? Anyone besides David Baskin at all? Okay, so by consensus, David Baskin is appointed. You could, well, we can empty it if you want, yeah. Are we, uh, Ms. Bush, do you need any other action by the council? On this side. Good. No, thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, not an easy thing as we work for a couple of years here to get everything reconciled. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Bush, for tracking all of that and helping us through this. Uh, we are on item 40. This is an impact report on the effect of the proposed housing for the people initiative, Measure M, on the March ballot. Uh, we will have a presentation by the planning director and his staff. And uh, <coughs> Mr. Butler, good evening, sir. Welcome again. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and council members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the city. And with me, I've got Bonnie Lipscomb, the Director of Economic Development and Housing, as well as Matt Benoit, our Advanced Planning Principal Planner in our Planning Division. And we also have on the line Kathy Head. She is president of Kaiser Marston. She prepared the third party report on Measure M. I'm gonna give a quick summary of uh, our review of the report and then I'll turn it over to Kathy. So the Kaiser Marston report found that Measure M has broad applicability throughout all areas of the city. It triggers a vote of the people anytime a change to the zoning ordinance, zoning map, general plan, or general plan map would result in an increase in floor area ratio or height, thereby having the potential to add time and cost to a wide range of projects, including 100% affordable projects. The report found that Measure M will constrain housing supply, resulting in less affordable housing and less market rate housing. The decrease in housing production coupled with the additional housing costs that the measure would add, it would result in a higher cost of housing. Measure M would constrain the, the city's ability to comply with state laws and make it more challenging to implement the housing element. 
that the council just adopted and that HCD, the state housing De department of housing and community development just certified. And finally, Measure M would have a significantly negative fiscal effect. With that, I will turn it over to Kathy Head for the details on her analysis. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Oh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, I'm not in control of the PowerPoint, so I'm counting on Lee to, or Lee or Bonnie to advance the slides for me. We can go past the first two. Here we go now. Okay. So just to give you um, just a background before we get started um, in how this, the genesis of this process was the city received a six cycle reg regional housing needs allocation target of approximately 3,700 units. Um, to assist in fulfilling this obligation and future obligations that will likely come in seventh, eighth and ninth, um, et cetera, um, RENAs, the city commenced work on a downtown expansion plan. So this triggered um, in some respects, the um, putting of measure A forward on, on the um, ballot or to put it on the ballot. Um, because of proposed increases, in, stated reasons for proposed increases in downtown building heights and floor area ratios. Um, I think that it's, it's very likely that that was the objective of the initiative. Just the pesky part about initiatives is if they're not very, very carefully worded, they're left up open to a great deal of interpretation. So what we're going to talk about tonight in this first part of the presentation is just the various um, issues that could come up as creating a vote of the people where the initiative probably doesn't in, didn't anticipate that or didn't plan on that, but could very well come to pass. Um, the first thing is that while the focus was on the downtown, Measure M would actually apply um, citywide. And then another just key factor of the initiative is that it would be retroactive back to June of 2023. If we could go to the next slide, please. So the term development projects is a defined term in your municipal code, and it means any project that requires a discretionary permit other than just a use permit. And so in effect, it applies to any change of your general plan, be it the map or the general plan itself, the zoning ordinance or the zoning ordinance map, anything that increases building height and or floor area ratio for a development project, which again, just to emphasize development project is a very broad term in your municipal code. So the table below just presents a, a number of examples of things that could potentially be subject to votes of the people due to Measure M. Um, not all of them would be. Um, it clearly increases in building height and or floor area ratio, but just Again, inadvertent changes could cause these to, to come to a, a vote of the people. Um, I'm not going to read them all to you so you can see them all, and we'll just um, move on to the next slide. Um, changing the land use um, designation, um, or these are the triggers, um, changes in planning documents that could trigger it. So changes in the general plan land use map, land use designation, zoning designation, general plan or zoning ordinances such as so changes to setbacks could create the need to have taller taller buildings. Coverage ratios, again, could result in taller buildings. Changes to the limitation in the number of stories could then create an FAR issue. And there are a number of other FAR and height issues um, that could impact a broad array of, of the potential projects. Uh, next slide. Okay. so. State law requires, this is part of housing element law, uh, the state legislature has been very busy for the last few years um, trying to put their hand into the middle of local zoning decisions. Um, so one of the, the things that has come up in this process is the city's required to align development standards and use allowances so that the development can achieve the maximum intensity permitted by the greater of the general plan or the zoning ordinance standards. Um, a couple of examples of that um, are the Ocean Street area plan zoning standards that need to be made consistent with the general plan development standards and minimum lot size requirements for RL zoning properties. A few examples of specific projects that were, are likely to be subject to this is 125 Coral. The reason it might be subject to it is because it may, it may or may not include housing 
and um, that may sub that may subject it and when it's too tall or when it's taller than the general plan that it may subject it proposed affordable housing project at um, the northeast corner of highways one and nine the development of the north side of mission and center streets and the downtown expansion plan especially the four corners of front and spruce streets to 140th center street so i'm sure you all know those projects very well so we don't need to spend a lot of time on that uh, if we could go to the next slide um, this one's a key um, issue that the this city and every other city is facing with their housing elements and that is the no net loss requirement that's been put in place by the legislature so that means when you put your best efforts in on your housing element to identify sites that would be developed in this in the seven year period and then would also include affordable housing as you've defined as targets in your housing element when development actually occurs on any of those identified sites if it doesn't meet the the standard that you put or the target that you put in your housing element whatever that shortage is is then a net loss and then the city has to identify a substitute location to fulfill that loss and so the idea is since you've identified in your housing element far more units than than your arena requires as those sites get developed you wouldn't necessarily have a no net loss but um I just I've looked up a number of places I mean this happens everywhere that I work with with no net loss I just thought I'd use Encinitas as an example since it came up in a lot of the public comment um, Encinitas had a significant buffer in their housing element it was nearly twice the number of requirements this is in their current housing element in their current uh, approved housing element for the sixth cycle they had almost twice as many sites and units identified as were required um, development has actually occurred on a number of those sites. The, pro the um, projections were very aggressive for what could happen on those sites. And so instead of being 60 to 100% affordable as projected in the housing element, um, they um, have been coming in at about 20%. And just as a point of reference, the um, Encinitas inclusionary requirement is a 15% very low income requirement or a 20% low income requirement. So the, the unit, the projects have come, been coming in at about 20%. So they are in a position now where with the sites they have left, they don't have that they've identified in their housing element. They have a shortfall. Um, so they have an absolute net loss situation that they're going to need to resolve. The point being in, in that belabored discussion is that as you lose sites, then you have to identify new sites. And even if you had a really big buffer like they did then what's likely to happen is also you're going to need to have in many cases either and or greater height or greater FAR and that that's where a vote of the people would come in um, into play on this um, just as another point of reference of Encinitas um, they have an initiative that requires a vote of the people that um, twice um, turned down their housing element so I think that plays into the constraint to housing issue associated to some extent with voter initiatives. Um, anyway, back back to no net loss. So um, in fact, I'll just leave there that there is a, a strong likelihood you'd have to increase height and or FAR to then fulfill net, no net loss that resulted by projects not being developed. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, the legislature every year for about the past 10 years has taken new actions that um, impact how cities can zone their property and, and the standards they can apply and how and when they can deny projects. And the city obviously has no ability to override these requirements, but in some instances they may very well trigger Measure M requirements. And some just some recent actions that they've taken is authority to construct residential on commercial school and religious sites. Um, they have this one's almost impossible to understand, but um, you can't create a situation. The short answer for this next one is you, you can't stop a project with 10 or fewer units by creating artificial minimum lot size coverage or FAR minimums. Um, another interesting one is that the state decided to um, increase the maximum height limit for ADUs. And then um, we have SB9 that allows lot splits for um, single family homes can be split. 
So those could all, each and every one in their own way, could, could trigger a vote, a measure M vote. Next slide. So the density bonus, I'm not going to, I'm going to go over this more in the inclusionary section, but right now, um, the thing that's just interesting about density bonus, is, and I do a lot of density bonus work, is that height and floor area ratio increases are really actually the most requested concessions in any of the projects, certainly that I've worked on. Um, they either come in as incentives or they come in as development standards waivers. Um, in, in places that have inclusionary housing ordinances, um, developers will tend to use the, the state density bonus as a means of mitigating the financial impact associated with the affordability standards applied by, by the inclusionary requirement. And, and, and that, that's actually absolutely been the case in, in um, Santa Cruz. Um, so what it does is it allows developers to significantly modify development standards, and that won't trigger an amendment to the general plan or the zoning ordinance. So in and of itself, state density bonus will not trigger an M, a measure M vote, even though heights and FARs will likely um, come to pass. Next slide. Okay, so developer risk. Developers, when they're attempting to do projects and when they're looking for locations on which to do these projects, one of the key factors they consider is minimizing uncertainty. Um, in fact, I, I, and much of the work I've done, that developers are sort of, they'll accept affordability requirements as long as they know what they are in advance and as long as they know what they need to do. And so the addition of a voter approval requirement throws a significant level of risk into the process for developers. The, the obvious one is it increases the risk that proje the project itself won't be approved, and then the developer will have spent a lot of money trying to put that project in front of the, of the voters. Even assuming it does pass, it prolongs the development process, which increases the carrying costs. I'm just going to give you an example um, uh, of Costa Mesa. Costa Mesa in 2016 um, had a voter initiative passed that limited growth, um, very stringently a limited growth in terms of if, if traffic was increased or the number of units was increased beyond general plan, specific plan, zoning code. Um, it passed overwhelmingly. Development then stopped in Costa Mesa. And so in 2022, the city council put an initiative in front of the voters that said, can we carve out um, areas in, in the industrial and commercial areas, not in residentially zoned areas, but can we carve out those things to allow for development of residential with an with a affordable component, um, assumed, not explicit, but assumed, um, that would be at a higher density than is allowed anywhere else in the city. And that also passed. And so in 2022, Measure K was added to, to Costa Mesa, and now their develop, residential development can happen in those places. And the reason for that largely is because Costa Mesa didn't have a chance of meeting the arena because all residential development had essentially been halted by the initiative. So that's just one example. Um, but I think it is reasonable to conclude that, that Measure M will discourage some developers and to some extent developers even of 100% affordable projects from pursuing projects that require a height or FAR increase. Um, and and I, I've worked on a number of 9212 reports for initiatives. I've done a lot of research in the scholarly literature and it does, black, it does back up that conclusion. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so talking about your arena, and I understand that you have in your housing element, you have a significant buffer to, to your allocation. Um, but I think the Encinitas example should be taken seriously. Um, those buffers can go away quickly as development is progresses. And you can't stop development just because it didn't meet what your, what your targets were in your housing element. So as long as the development meets your your zoning standards, then then you have very little latitude in denying it. So the Measure M impacts, as I mentioned before, is it may it 
it may discourage or constrain market rate and affordable housing development. It extends entitlement and period periods. And again, it could be voted, any project could be voted down in a Measure M election. Um, if you don't meet your housing element targets in a timely fashion, then developers can use streamlining that's been again provided by the state legislature. And again, if you have to measure, implement measures to increase housing production, those changes would likely require Measure M improvement. And if you lag or in, in meeting these standards, it's, an, it's possible that HCD could come and threaten to decertify. Not to be labor Encinitas, but actually in 2022, the um, attorney general threatened to decertify their housing element. So these are real examples of what can happen. Next slide, please. So the key impacts of not having a certified housing element for your, particularly your affordable housing needs, but also for development premises is Builder's Remedy. Um, I imagine you've all seen Builder's Remedy. It's been quite the topic in California this year. Is any jurisdiction that didn't have a certified housing element, um, Builder's Remedy could be invoked by developers. And then as long as they provided a defined amount of affordable housing, they didn't have to abide by your general plan or your zoning ordinance standards. That's up in the air in the courts. Um, I think there, there's more to be heard about Builder's Remedy. Um, if you don't have a housing element, you can't get state funding to assist those projects. The city has a pro-housing designation, which makes it more competitive for getting grant and assistance sources. That would be revoked if you had a decertified housing element. And monetary penalties have, have come into vogue with the state in terms of decertified and, um, or folks not meeting their housing element. Next slide. Fiscal impacts. Um, this came from the County Board of Elections. Um, the costs are estimated to range from $115,000 to $185,000. That depends on how many registered voters come out to vote, the number of items the city would place on the ballot, and whether this is being done at a regularly scheduled election or at a special election. Another fiscal impact of reduced supply of housing is more demand than supply is one of the causes that housing costs keep going up all over California is there's just way more demand than there is supply. Um, given that Measure M, I believe, will can create a constraint to future development, um, the city will be in the position where you'll be looking to increase your ho affordable housing production and, and by creating new programs and those cost money. And since redevelopment, you know, redevelopment was the largest funding source for affordable housing in the state. And so when it was eliminated in 2012, we were left with, with cities being forced to use general funds a lot to provide affordable housing. And so that's the idea here is as, as if you have fewer affordable housing units developed, and if you want to fulfill your need for affordable housing, then you'll have to look for other resources to fulfill those requirements. Next slide. And next slide. So um, I'm just going to go over these quickly, but I think they're important. Um, so that this part of the presentation is about the proposed 25% inclusionary housing requirement on projects with more than 30 units. So there have been a number of cases and pieces of legislation over the years that have guided how inclusionary housing programs must be set up. The two key requirements that came out of the BIA case against San the city of San Jose at the California Supreme Court was the requirements cannot be confiscatory and they cannot deprive a property owner of a fair and reasonable return on investment. The courts did not define what that means. And so over time, each jurisdiction looks at their programs and attempts to prove that they are not, they, they comply with both of those standards. AB 1505 came in, it allowed jurisdictions to go back to doing rental inclusionary, you hadn't been able to do it since 2009. When, when that was passed, then it allowed jurisdictions to, to do it. Um, at the time, HCD and the legislature suggested that the standard should not be more than 15% of the units at 80% of the area median income. It used it as an example, but they subsequently, HCD subsequently wrote a technical memorandum 
that said basically they meant it. And so you're in a position with your housing element and, and the progress you've made with above moderate income that HCD can't come in and make you do a feasibility study. But moving on to the next standard, which is constraint to housing development, what they can do at any time in any place is they can reach out to you and say, we think your inclusionary housing program is a constraint to housing. You need to prove to us that it isn't. And I will tell you, I've had that happen in multiple cities, including West Hollywood and Palo Alto. Um, and so then the burden of proof goes on you, the city, to prove that, you, that your obligation is not creating that constraint to housing. So based on the analysis that, that I'm gonna go over next, I think there's a serious consideration to a 25% requirement could instigate that, that request from HCD. And again, um, if it is deemed to be a constraint and if it's not changed, then the housing element could be decertified. Next slide, please. So we prepared financial analyses based on um, affordability gap analyses, which are effectively just the difference between the market rate rent or sales price and the affordable price at the affordable level being required by the program. Um, we tested um, to see the, the results at a 20% requirement as it stands now and a 25% requirement for projects over 30 units. Next slide. So the prototypes that I created for this analysis were based on the actual types of projects that are being proposed in Santa Cruz. So we looked at active planning applications and we looked at the housing element. And so I came up with three apartment prototypes and three ownership housing prototypes. Um, they range on the apartments from high density to medium density to SRO, all types of projects that are being developed in the community. And ownership, which is much less, much less development of ownership housing um, going on in the, in the community in, in recent times. High density, con or not even recent times, over a, kind of a long period. High density condominiums, low density condominiums, and townhomes. So those were the prototypes. We ran financial analyses on all of these prototypes, um, development costs, um, net operating income or net revenue, developer return, um, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. And then what we did is we looked at the impacts created by an increased inclusionary housing requirements. So the first thing that happens when there's an increase in, in any requirement like this is anybody who's already purchased property, the profit they are going to receive on their project is reduced from what they thought it would be reduced from. And then for folks who haven't purchased property, then they're going to attempt to buy property for less money um, because to, to take on that impact. But um, as you would expect, some property owners are reluctant to accept that their property value is increased. And so they'll just hold. And that's particularly true in a community like Santa Cruz, where most of the development of housing that's gone on in, in recent past has occurred on improved properties. And so property owners who have improved properties are going to take into consideration what the value of their property is if they, if they just leave it in their, its current state. And um, just as a point of reference, your housing element is based on the assumption that that trend of housing being developed on approved properties will continue. So factors to be considered in terms of, of Measure M itself is developers who purchased uh, property after June 2023, but have not entered the approval process yet, there's a likelihood that some or a few or all will attempt to challenge the retroactivity um, clause in Measure M. I don't have an opinion, I'm not a lawyer, but um, in my, it's been my experience that retroactive clauses have been challenged. Um, developers who've completed the application or have SB 330 preliminary applications prior to June 2023, they won't be subject to the, the Measure M requirements. So based on these factors and based on what I discussed at the top about what happens with land and, and, and developers and property owners is, we looked at the reduction in property acquisition cost that would need to be available to 
the purchasers of land in order to make the 25% inclusionary housing obligation viable. And then as a second test, we looked at saying all things staying equal. So development costs don't increase, um, the increase in market rate rents and sales prices that would be needed to offset the proposed requirements. Next slide, please. So normally when I do inclusionary housing analyses, I like to, to look at um, both of those conjunctively. Um, but in this case, I, I decided to be the, the most liberal to, to making the 25% work. I looked at them both separately. But the thing to keep in mind when you're looking especially at property acquisition costs is residential development has to be competitive with the other potential uses. That, you know, because unless it, the residential development exceeds the value that the property owner is currently receiving or could receive from another use, the property owner will not sell the property for residential development. And I already discussed the rents and sales prices, so I'll just jump over that. Next slide, please. So the benchmark standard is just that, it's a benchmark. Every single project embodies unique characteristics. And so these standards that I looked at was in fact that a reduction in the property acquisition cost of no more than 30%. Um, that's a standard I've used for years. I've been doing inclusionary housing analyses for 20 years. It varies to some extent from city to city just based on underlying land values. Um, but it's, again, we can't be confiscatory. We can't deprive a property owner of a fair and reasonable return on their investment. And we have to want proper, have property owners want to sell their land. The second test was, um, again, with no development cost increases, the a 4% increase in market rate, rent rates or sales prices, if it's over that 4%, then it will take longer for the market to absorb it. Absorb it. Those are the two standards that we used. Next slide, please. These are the results of the apartment development analyses. Um, in the report that you have, there's appendices with all of the full pro forma analyses for these projects. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these. I think as you can see by this table, if the first scenario is a 20% inclusionary housing requirement, assuming base zoning, assuming not using state density bonus. As you can see in all three cases, the neither of the benchmarks are met. And in fact, in the case of the high density apartment project, you'd need a reduction in land value that was two times the actual cost of buying the land. So in order to do this project at a 20% inclusionary requirement at base zoning, you would have to be able to give the property to a developer and give them money. Um, that's the, the basic premise there. But the reason that your 20% requirement appears to be working at, at this time is because a lot of developers are able to use the density bonus. And so the 20% requirement with density bonus being applied is the reason that, that you can get to the point where 20% can potentially be supported. But as you can see, again, in the high density scenario, it doesn't meet the property acquisition test. It does meet the rent in test. And then the other two meet, uh, then the medium density one meets both tests. And again, the SRO meets one of the tests. So that's an important consideration because not all projects can effectively use the density bonus, but so far the projects that have been proposed are using it to get to that 20% requirement. So when you add on to that another 5%, I understand a 5% increase doesn't sound like a lot in a vacuum, but when you're at a percentage that's already marginal in terms of feasibility, and then you add 5% to it, you merely exacerbate the constraint to housing that you potentially have. And so as you can see on the 25% inclusionary requirement, we're in a situation where, um, again, with a high density project, it's over the cost of buying the land. And in the SRO, it's 70% of the land cost. And then in the medium density one, it's nearly 50%. All of those render the acquisition of property infeasible given existing improvements on those properties and or other potential uses. Um, 
only the SRO project meets the um, the percent percentage rent increase. It, it doesn't meet either of the other standards. I think it's. I just have to reemphasize the notion of property owners don't have to sell land. It's really important that they be incentivized to sell land if you want to see housing being developed. Next slide, please. Okay, I did that. Let's go to the next slide. So the ownership housing development prototypes, I think if you look at this and you just look at the top line red numbers on, on the, the chart, what you'll see is that each of the prototypes analyzed at each of the affordability levels all generated negative profit or in other words a loss and so as a developer when you're looking at providing ownership housing in santa cruz as we sit right now you're looking at negative profit and we could go to the next slide please so the conclusions from the ownership housing development analysis is Really, right now, ownership housing development can't support any affordable housing requirement. Just under current market and financial conditions, and even for the past few years, market and financial conditions. So it's not just a matter of the, the recent increases in interest rates. Um, some of the developers um, have mapped their project, their apartment projects, and it's possible at some point in the future they'll choose to exercise that, that prospect of, of selling them as condominiums. Um, however, that opportunity is constrained and will be pushed out further by the existing inclusionary housing requirement and it'll be pushed out even further if that requirement went up to 25%. Next slide, please. So just things to remember, um, inclusionary housing requirements cannot be confiscatory. That's the BIA case. Inclusionary housing requirements cannot deprive a property owner of a fair and reasonable return on investment. That's the BIA case. And inclusionary housing requirements cannot act as a constraint to housing. That's a government code requirement. And last slide, there's one more. So the proposed increase in occlusionary housing to 25% for units with th projects with 30 units or more doesn't meet the standards of any of those three criteria. And those three criteria are the linchpins. Um, so the financial impacts created by the proposed increase in the inclusionary housing obligation are property acquisition for residential development will not be competitive. And if Measure M passes, significant potential exists for legal challenges from residential developers and, sorry, my cat's coming, um, <laughs> residential developers and or an HCD constraint to housing. And so those, those could potentially result in housing element decertification. And I'm sorry I went so long. Um, that's the end. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Let me ask if council members uh, have questions you would like to ask the consultant. We'll start here with Ms. Kalantar Johnson. Thank you. Um, thank you for the work and the presentation. There was one slide, the state legislation slide, and um, I'm not sure I fully understand, so if I, I, I don't even know if I'm asking the question right. Um, my understanding is that state legislation prohibits uh, cities to deny certain projects, and for example, there was um, housing with schools as part of that, if we can put the slide maybe back up. So it's slide eight. Slide eight, okay. Um, so let's say Measure M passes and this type of project is brought forward and it requires a change in zoning so it has to go to the vote of the people and then the people uh, deny the project. So then what happens? If city councils don't have the right to deny these projects, what happens if the vote of the people deny these projects? What are the repercussions? What will the state do? What, what are the legalities? Again, I don't know if I'm even asking the question right <laughs> or if the question makes sense. No, you are right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at it, but then I'm going to let um, Lee jump in on this as well. So the situation is, and it's a, no, it's actually exactly the right question. But the situation is that you're required, you the city are required to follow state law. And so by definition, you have to allow 
residential development on these properties. So that in and of itself is true, but state law is limited where it says you don't, you have to, then you're the developer, you have to comply with zoning and general plan, general plan as a residential project. Now, the problem is there's probably no residential zoning or general plan that, that actually imagined that would happen. And so it requires a change in the general plan and zoning plan to allow just the basic residential to happen. You have to do that. And so now I'm gonna let Lee jump in in the middle when I left him in the middle of the sentence. Thanks for the question, Council Member Calantari, ah, Council Member Calantari Johnson, <laughs> excuse me. Um, there are several instances where I could see something like this playing out. Kathy was alluding to one of them. Um, actually, she, she was alluding to what I see as two separate um, issues. Um, one could be an instance where um, we need to change the zoning or general plan of a property to um, facilitate its development um, at um, a, a level that's feasible or just in general. Um, so, for example, if uh, a property were um, not able to have residential zoning uh, or residential uses, there's a, a public facilities property, for example, that um, we've been looking at. It's not a, a religious assembly use. It's not a school use. And so the recent law changes that allow for residential on those types of public facilities wouldn't be allowed. And so if we needed to change our general plan or zoning to allow for that project, and that resulted in an increase in um, floor area ratio or height, that would trigger a vote of the people. Similar things could happen on industrially zoned properties, um, like the northeast corner of Highway 1 and 9. Um, similar things could happen for um, properties where we are looking at doing a, a shelter use, like 125 Coral, where we might need height increases, um, where we do need height increases, and um, where we wouldn't be able to use the density bonus because we might not have residential. It might be the medical facilities and the, the shelter uses. So there are a series of instances where a, a uh, rezoning or general plan amendment could be required. Also, um, there are instances where there's a community commercial designation, um, and those have a, a height limit that would likely need to be exceeded in order to have a project that actually works. All of those could trigger uh, a vote of the people if you're rezoning those properties, and it includes height uh, or FAR increases. <clears throat> the other. The other point, and, and some of those, you know, we could be in a position where um, we need to get additional um, uh, housing produced in order to meet our, our arena targets. And so if we're not meeting our regional housing needs allocation targets, then we have provisions in our um, housing element that you all are aware of that say we need to start doing things that um, facilitate the production of housing and some of those things that we would be doing to facilitate the production of housing would also involve either reduced setbacks, which could trigger a vote, increased FARs, trigger a vote, increased heights, could trigger a vote. Um, and so it, may, it would make it harder for us to comply with our, our housing element and uh, meet state law. Um, the second thing that, um, uh, that Kathy Head was referring to there was an instance where um, Projects come in, we're required to approve them. You know, they let's let's say, for example, our housing element anticipated that we were going to have a hundred units on a particular property, but those that that project comes in, and let's say it it only has eighty units, we still have to approve that project if it complies with the applicable objective standards. So we approve that project. If that happens and we get to a place where we need to, where we have not enough capacity in our our housing element, which as, as is the case um, in Encinitas, as you know, Kathy Head was referring to, then we would then have to come in and rezone additional properties and that would likely involve increases in height and FAR and that would trigger a vote of the people. 
And so in both of those instances, you know, two separate paths, but they could trigger votes of the people and both have housing element compliance implications. That was a lot, I recognize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Essentially, we could we could um, support a project, but the vote of the people would deny the changes in zoning, and we would just be at a standstill. There, there, there could be a situation like that if the project was uh, proposing, say, a, a change to the zoning and the uh, and or the um, or change to the zoning or general plan mm -hmm. that increases height or floor area ratio that would trigger a vote of the people before that could come into effect. Got it. Thank you. For the questions, comments, Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you. I have two questions, hopefully just the two and no follow-up based on what I hear next that might confuse me further. Okay. <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask, uh, in the general area of the, the concern around affordable housing, which is my concern. That is my one... 100% my concern. Um, so the um, cons the assertion that this could affect 100% affordable housing projects uh, concerned me. And so I wanted to ask, though, because as I was reading through the Kaiser Marston report, um, you know, I, it got me thinking, um, since ministerial projects are, are not included here, they would not be included, ministerial project automatically means no general plan change or zoning change, a ministerial approval. And that is that is a policy that we have at the city that we approve ministerially 100% affordable housing projects. So they don't even come to us anymore. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could help me understand how affordable housing would be affected, um, th those 100% projects, given they appear, at least from what I see, to, to not be covered here. Sure, I'm happy to tackle that. Um, so first, um, we we vetted this um, not only with um, Kathy, but also with an affordable housing developer to make sure that you know, we were um, actually um, conveying accurate information about the potential risks that a developer may or may not will be willing to uh, pursue. Um, and the way that a affordable housing, 100% affordable housing project would be um, most likely deterred is if they needed to come in for a rezoning or a general plan amendment. When we've talked with um, that developer and when we have uh, vetted that through our consultant, they have said, if there is the risk of not getting the vote of the people and if there is the time associated with the vote and there is the carrying cost associated with the time it takes then they would likely bypass that site altogether and not even seek to develop that site with affordable housing so so they may have a connection with someone where they have, let's say, a community commercial general plan designation, um, but that community commercial des general plan designation um, may not work for for a, a project in, in making a pencil, or maybe it's a, a a site that is a public facilities designation, or um, as we mentioned before, an industrial designation. So, if they have to go through that process of a vote they likely just won't pursue that project at all. So just, I, I think I, I understand. So it would be for, for projects that wouldn't meet ministerial requirements anyway, right? Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Got it. Okay. And then my, did you want to, I thought I saw Bonnie. Yeah. I, I don't want to cut off. Thanks. I just wanted to add as far as um, the developer and some of the, the risks inherent is, is the cost is the delay of what, funding round they're applying in for tax credits Absolutely. as well. And each funding round, in certain funding rounds, there's more funding in one round, less in another, some are more competitive than others. And so developer is assessing that every time. And so when there's like an uncertainty or a delay in the in the process, that could throw them out of a critical funding round and then they can't even do the project anymore. So that that level of uncertainty is is really problematic for affordable housing developers. And it's something, you know, there's different financing risks for market rate, but for affordable 
those kind of situations are, are really dire. Thank you. Second question. Um, I'm, I'm still really trying to understand what the effects of this might be. Um, and and I, we have voluminous information now, but it's still not clear. Um, so one of the ways that I thought might be helpful would be to just ask um, how many projects that have been approved over the past, you know, I don't know how many years, a little while here, um, would have triggered a Measure M vote had it been in effect at the time of approval? Are there, can you think of any, or I'm, I'm just trying to envision a, like an actual scenario, not hypos, hypotheticals. I can think of two recent ones that would have, and I can think of four or five ones that we have in the pipeline that potentially would. Thank you. And that's just <laughs> off the top of my head. There could be uh, more. I'm there, just there <laughs> that's just what I want. Yeah. There are Council Member Watkins is recognized. I just have a question of kind of a follow up, but I was wondering if if that many projects did require a vote of the people, would that require a special election every single time or would that be on a general election or, you know, primary time frame? Yeah, th thanks for that question. I, I also want to um, be clear about my last response. Those are development projects. There are many, many more changes that we have made to our zoning ordinance um, or general plan through legislative actions that this body has taken uh, that would so i just want to be clear that that you know there are there are projects and then there are our policy changes to the code itself and and either one could trigger so um and then um council member watkins um i, I apologize uh, could you repeat that question Sure, no problem. Maybe it's for Tony, but it was around if there's that many projects that are going to require a vote of the people, would that require a special election every single time, or would that be on the kind of the election cycle or both? It really just depends on the timing. If okay. the timing of the project is such that it can be added to a consolidated election, that would be the desirable way to go. Otherwise, um, a special election would need to be called. And do you anticipate, if I may, would that also then have like campaigns or is it just sort of a perfunctory kind of vote I, I mean it would be um, I mean whether or not campaigns materialize materialized around that type of an issue is an interesting question but it would be conducted in the exact same fashion as Any a sales other? tax measure or measure M for that matter okay. thank you thank you other questions or comments <laughs> Mr. Newsom is recognized. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, I kind of want to, um, I guess, jump off that. I have just a couple questions, but I kind of want to jump off this talk of votes, votes of the people um, and projects, but also see in the uh, report that there's a good bit of state legislation that would trigger votes of the people. It looked like there was um, uh, parts of our housing uh, element that would trigger votes of the people. And I was wondering if you, if you could say just on average how many votes of the people you think Per year, this measure would would bring about, or uh... I would expect a minimum of at least one um, vote. Okay. I mean, we have we have regular zoning ordinance updates that we aim for every 18 months or so, um, and we have um, the, the required updates that we have pursuant to state law. Um, uh, we also have updates pursuant to state law that we um, have to follow, but um, are uh, behind in, in making our codes match those. And so, um, and, and then we've got the projects, right, that are, that are separate. Um, and so, it, yeah, I, I would say it's going to vary, but in, in general, a minimum of one per year. Okay, so a minimum of one per year could be two, could be three. Sure, yeah, it could be more. Easily. Absolutely. Okay, and what I'm trying to understand, would those votes of the people, would they change state law? Would they impact, say, the density bonus that's granted to a uh, developer? And I think that was kind of answered in the presentation, but just want to kind of clarify on that. It would not um, affect a density bonus. It would not um, affect state law. So, so we have to follow state law. Um, even if our codes are inconsistent. So if, what that does is it creates confusion amongst the general public, amongst applicants, amongst 
everyone if, if there are inconsistencies. So we, we aim to, to update our, our codes to match, but um, you know, there are a lot of state laws, hundreds over the right, right. past couple of years alone that, um, that uh, are hard to keep all of our codes up to date on. Okay, thank you. So, uh, okay, thank you for that. So I'm just trying to do um, some kind of quick math here. It looks like, so say over say a 10 year period, this measure could cost somewhere in the ballpark of a minimum of $1.8 million and somewhere as far as $3 million, $4 million, $6 million and have no real impact on what developers can do per state law or what's granted to them per state law. Uh, it w the, the numbers you cited are correct um, and um, it would not affect what they could do per state law. Right. Um, there could be some that affect um, what they're allowed to do if, if it were a project proposing a, a rezoning or a right. general plan amendment. Right, um, right. But not like, say, a development, uh, a density bonus, say, such as right. you know, that's, projects that's, that we currently have that have density bonus that go well above our zoning and... Absolutely planning. correct. Yes, the density bonus can be utilized without uh, pursuing, uh, without requiring a vote of the people. Right, okay. Um, my next question, this kind of gets to um, uh, the impact this will have on housing in our community and affordable housing. And I'm, I'm glad that it seemed like there's clarification. It, it, uh, it does seem that this measure could impact 100% affordable housing projects and, and result in those projects not moving forward. Um, but I did, it, I did also uh, gather from the uh, presentation that this measure in general will result in less housing and less uh, affordable housing being built, especially in our community. Uh, and that's from raising the, um, the uh, affordability requirement, inclusionary requirements to 20 to 25%. I was wondering if there are any examples you can provide of say 25% affordable, affordable housing inclusionary requirement being a barrier to housing uh, being built in California or say 25% or higher? Yes, um, I'll, um, I'll cite a couple of examples and I'll, I'll offer the floor to Kathy who, who deals with these up and down the state. Um, so San Francisco, um, for example, um, had a uh, substantially higher um, uh, inclusionary rate um, just six months ago. Their, their inclusionary is incredibly complex. It had a 96-page uh, a implementation document. Um, and very specific, um, but but some of the levels were certainly um, at 25% and higher. Um, they recently, uh, about four months ago, actually reduced their inclusionary to uh, around um, 12 or 13% um, because they were finding that their inclusionary was representing a, a barrier to housing. Um, I um, was not following it at the time, um, but I believe that Watsonville also had a higher inclusionary rate in the around 25%, and I, I see Matt nodding here, um, our city manager, back in the late 90s or early 2000s, and they subsequently changed that inclusionary rate to a lower one to, um, uh, to address the, the lack of housing production that they were seeing. So. There are certainly examples. Um, I, I know, Kathy, um, you deal with this all over the state. Um, do you want to add some other examples to that? Sure. Um, so just staying in the Monterey Bay, um, unincorporated Monterey County has um, had inclusionary in the books. And actually, Salinas has um, a very similar policy, but Monterey County is what I'm going to talk about. They have a t currently have a 25% requirement that's comprised of 6% very low, plus 6% low, plus 8% moderate, plus 5% workforce, which goes up to 150% of area median income. For the past several years, they've work, been working on modifications to that program um, to make it feasible. And what's currently um, being considered, and, and an ordinance has been written but has not yet been approved, um, is to go to a requirement, developers can choose a 15% requirement that's 7.5% very low plus 7.5% low, or a 20% requirement that is 10% low plus 10% moderate. Another example is the city of Santa Monica. A number of years ago, 
they created, they've had inclusionary for decades, but they created a policy for the downtown area of Santa Monica, which had been seeing tremendous amount of development. They had a community benefits program for if you went above the allowable FAR and or height, then they had a community benefits that translated into, generally translated into additional affordable housing requirements on top of that, um, on the ba on top of the, the base inclusionary housing requirement. They subsequently, because they were doing them all by development agreements, they subsequently did a 30% inclusionary housing requirement for the downtown. Um, and then what happened, and even I didn't do the feasibility study, another firm did the feasibility study, but very respected firm. Um, they said it wasn't feasible and it wasn't. And so no one proposed any project in the downtown at the 30%. And instead, what they did is they went down, there were three tiers of zoning, and, and developers just went down to tier two, which could be administratively approved at the existing affordable housing requirement. And okay, so that's another example. Um, Ventura, um, a couple of years ago, they had a very complicated inclusionary housing program. There were any number of options for the way to fulfill it, but basically it was a 20% requirement after a study that, that I did actually do. They reduced that requirement to 5% very low plus 10% low for rental units and 10% moderate for ownership units. Um, and just one more example, this is, this is more based on general economics than anything else. The city of Claremont adopted inclusionary housing in 2007 and then the economy crashed. And so in 2011, they completely revamped the whole program to make it usable. I, oh, just as one more thing before I before I stop talking. Um, so I have a survey of 100 jurisdictions in California that have inclusionary that I update regularly. There are fewer than 10 jurisdictions in my survey that have a 25% requirement or higher. And we've discussed a couple of those here. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would just ask... Um, Kathy, for those um, that do have that higher um, inclusionary requirement, are there any at 80% um, AMI? I would anticipate that in order for those to be remotely feasible, that they have a uh, higher um, area median income um, limit. And is, is that uh, part of your um, analysis? Is, is that what you would say is accurate? They tend to have a range. So they tend, like, like Monterey County has all of those different where you add them up to come to the to the requirement so and then like for example davis has a requirement that ranges from 10 percent to 25 percent so oh, wow. I, I would say yes i mean the, the low income requirement at the 25 percent level is, is generally there's more nuance to it thanks I, I just wanted that clarification because i believe that um that our 20 percent at 80 percent ami is already one of the highest inclusionary requirements in the state, given both the percentage and the level of affordability. And just um, looking to you, Kathy, to see if that um, is accurate. Right, it's at the high level. And I think another thing to keep in mind, especially with more recently proposed inclusionary housing ordinances, is that jurisdictions are paying attention to the HCD guidance on rental. You know, you lost the ability to do rental from 2009 to 2017 because of the Palmer case. And so um, between what the state legislature is trying to do with, with zoning and, and just what HCD has decided with their guidance, I think uh, it, it's just 20% is starting to be less and less common. I mean, it was never common and now it, it's not, it's just not being considered as often. I, I just wanted to clarify on our ordinance, we do have the ability to run that 20% for rental developments for five to be available to tenant-based vouchers up to 120% of AMI. And then for ownership, it is a combination of low at 80% and up to moderate at 120%. So I just wanted to, to add that. Um, right, and the analysis I did on ownership was based just for just for everybody's reference on the inclusionary. I did it as though they could do all of it at moderate. So I took again, I took the most liberal approach. Uh, just kind of a, a follow up question that are kind of building off, uh, say, this measure resulting in less housing being built, and less affordable housing being built. Uh, what 
what will be what will be the consequences of that unless housing be built and particularly what consequences will that have on uh, say our community having more or less uh, say land use control and ability to manage growth and say have a say over say a particular aspect of a particular project and I'm thinking here of SB 35 which has been replaced by SB 429 I believe now and the Housing Accountability Act and the associated builders remedy with that and the impact that might have on us, say, determining something as simple as the size of a driveway, which we, uh, that will associate with the project that we talked about with 1800 SoCal Avenue. Right. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll, I'll tackle it in two parts. Um, first, you asked about the uh, what's what are the implications of less housing. Right. Um, so when we're producing less housing, we've got higher housing costs for all. We've got less economic diversity. We've got uh, less racial diversity. Um, we've got greater challenges for businesses trying to hire staff. We heard about the economic development strategy earlier this evening. Um, uh, we've got um, more regional traffic when that happens because people are driving greater distances to reach the job center that we have here in Santa Cruz. Um, and we've got greater environmental impacts um, because our city's compact nature makes Santa Cruz the most sustainable place to grow in the region, particularly in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And all of that leads to a less equitable community. So it's critical that we work to promote policies that encourage housing production, and the council has done a great job of that um, in, in recent times. Um, the second part of your question was related to um, SB 35, SB 429, and the builder's remedy. Um, <clears throat> if we are not meeting our um, RENA, our prorated share of the regional housing needs allocation targets, then um, SB 35 and SB 429 um, can kick in. Um, just for the members of the public, um, SB 429 is just the new SB 35 and has broader applicability in the coastal zone, for example, um, whereas SB 35 did not apply in the coastal zone. Um, so if we're not meeting those housing production targets, then those streamlining efforts would kick in. Um, those are um, similar to what we saw. It is you know, what we saw with 831 Water Street where we have very little discretion to do anything. Um, we uh, have to approve a project that um, meets all of the objective standards. There's no CEQA, it's a, it's a ministerial process for that. Even if the process comes before the decision-making body, it has to be solely focused on objective standards. So to your question about would we be able to um, make tweaks to the project um, uh, based on the driveway. We'd not, we would not be able to make such requirements happen. Um, you know, we could ask, but we certainly couldn't require any of those things. Um, and then you asked about the builder's remedy, um, and the builder's remedy would kick in if um, we do not have a certified housing element. Um, <clears throat> then the the builder's remedy would kick in and. The builder's remedy um, allows for um, projects meeting certain state affordability standards to um, ignore the city's zoning and general plan and build the housing project at whatever uh, development intensities um, the, the developer uh, desires. And um, there are, are many, many examples of that. Um, if, if the council is interested in a few of those examples, I would invite Matt Benoit up um, just for a few of those, because I know he's been he's been looking into that. Matt, would you like to speak yes, to some of those? I'd love to hear some examples. Yeah, sure. Good evening, Good Mayor, you. Vice Mayor, Council. Thanks, Matt Benoit, Principal Planner. Um, so yeah, as far as those uh, those uh, there's recent builders remedy projects in the Bay Area, I can speak specifically to, uh, and I'll cover some of the largest ones. Uh, right now, Menlo Park has a proposed project uh, proposed uh, uh, builder's remedy project of a uh, 421, 371, and 305 feet. That's currently across the street from uh, an existing single-family neighborhood. Um, Palo Alto has one of uh, 17, 11, and seven-story uh, seven buildings in a 37-foot height limit zone. Uh, Santa Monica. Uh, like Kathy had mentioned, uh, 
they had 16 builders remedy projects uh, come in when their housing element uh, was not certified. And uh, they've since narrowed that down to, there's currently one of those projects going through that's 18 stories uh, in a zone that currently allows three stories. Um, so th so those, those, are some, uh, those are some of the larger examples, smaller examples. Cupertino was recently in the news. They have a 70 foot project going in in a 45 foot zone. And that's their first builder's remedy project. Thanks for and that, there's, Matt. There's about, there's 47 jurisdictions right now that have builder's remedy projects going through. And, and how many projects overall that you saw? Oh, I don't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's at you, least double that. Yeah. yeah. So, so I just wanted to point out that um, the work we did last year, um, how critical that was, right? I mean, we did not want Builders Remedy to apply here, and the work that we did as the Housing Element Subcommittee um, with Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Kalantari Johnson and Councilmember Newsom, we all worked really, really hard to get that document certified, certifiable with HCD, and then to the full council for your adoption on time. Um, I believe. I believe, I'm not positive about this, but I believe we were the only city in the region to get it done on time. And um, that was so, uh, a big reason for that was because we knew that as a community and as a council, um, we wanted to have control over our destiny. And, and when Builder's Remedy is applicable, we do not have control over our destiny. Thank you. So the consequences of less housing being built could be what you're talking about? Yes. In this measure? And I wanted to add one more thing thing on uh, SB 35 and, and SB 429, the streamlining. Um, one key thing to the state, there's two tiers of that streamlining. And 831 water, for instance, uh, because we had met nearly all of our arena affordability categories, just not very low at that time, it still had to come in at 50% affordable to qualify for that streamlining. Um, if we're not meeting our above moderate, for instance, the state comes in and says it's 10% affordable or whatever our current inclusion area is. So that'd be 20% right now. So every single project, if, if we're not meeting that uh, above moderate market rate unit count in our arena, every project that comes in would be available for that streamlining. So as, as much as it's super important to get affordable housing, the state cracks down even harder if we're not meeting that uh, market rate housing production. Okay, so that could lead to less affordable housing in projects. And um, also, and this is going back to the builders' remedies, does that also, does that waive CEQA analysis as well? So there's no environmental analysis on those? The builders' remedy does not waive CEQA. Um, okay. There's actually a, a court case that's uh, related to that, and um, it actually uh, spurred. Um, spurred additional legislation this past year okay. because San Francisco was attempting to hold up a builder's remedy project due to CEQA and the, the legislature responded with specific um, requirements for cities to proceed with processing CEQA so that they couldn't avoid the builder's remedy. Okay. Thank you, Thank sir. You. No. Yes, Ms. Brunner is recognized. Couple questions. Um, can you list all the ways housing can be affordable besides building straight up an affordable unit? Sure. I think I think Bonnie and I and and probably Matt could all speak to that. Um, you know, uh, I, I had an interview yesterday with uh, the news about uh, the, the city's ADU production um, in BC Bay Area. And, you know, I was mentioning that um, a lot of our accessory dwelling units are actually rented to family and friends. And what we found through our surveys is that those um, rentals to family and friends um, are at substantially lower rates. Um, so that's, uh, that's one way in which they can be affordable. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, we say this, we say this sometimes, uh, the best time for housing to be built is 40 years ago, and the next best time is today. Because um, if we continue to produce housing at a rate that 
meet the demand, then older projects will naturally become more affordable. And so older developments are um, typically more affordable. That isn't always the case, particularly when the supply and demand is out of whack the way that it is in Santa Cruz and so and, and frankly throughout the state, right? I mean, it's not just a Santa Cruz problem. It's, it's an acute problem here, but it is uh, an issue throughout the state. And so uh, the production of sufficient supply helps that. Um, but there are other ways. So it might not be a deed restricted affordable unit, but there may be um, assistance, home buyer assistance programs that um, can help. And, and Bonnie's team um, has um, things like that that she's worked on um, with uh, the home buyer assistance programs. I'll let you want to speak to some of those. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would just say that there is the what Lee was saying about just the number of units on the market, right? The more that we're able to produce the housing units, overall, the, the rent and the cost of those units is going to be less. The fewer of those units, those costs of those units will be higher. Um, the size of the units matters as well. You know, the smaller the unit, the more affordable it is um, on the market. And um, tenant-based vouchers, you know, provided through the housing authority, and I know you're very familiar with those, are also ways to make a unit affordable. So a developer can provide and have a market rate rent um, and still have someone who qualifies for a lower um, lower affordability le level in those units. So those are some of the, the most readily available ways of making um, housing more affordable um, to projects. Obviously, the SROs are some of the most affordable, and that's just the you know size of the unit being very small or much affordable by design. So those are some of the most frequent um, frequent you know, programs that we have. We do have had in the past a first time home buyers that is a program it is pretty challenging um, to be able to for the cost of the leveraging that you put in there definitely the larger um, rental projects affordable projects are, are much better value overall um, but we have worked with habitat for humanity um, in making uh, projects available and aging in place projects as well with Habitat for Humanity um, that does allow uh, a senior to either live in the main house or build an ADU um, at sufficient cost savings. So those are a few of the programs. Thank you. I find that a lot of times when I speak to community members, um, the perception is that affordable housing is only on a new a build of affordable housing and and kind of you know taking a step back and looking at the whole and the stock and um, how much housing has been built since the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake over the last 30 years for example and um, you know it's definitely seems to be one of the reasons why um, housing is so expensive um, because the supply is so little and you know having served on the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners for for so many years um, you know we we oversee the programs there and and the federal the HUD programs all the different types of programs whether you're a single parent or a vet um, uh, whatever you're eligible for, those subsidies, those vouchers from those different programs were able to be increased. And there were times when we'd have 300 voucher holders out there not able to get a, uh, find a place because there weren't enough units to rent. So increasing subsidy needs to come in line with increasing stock. And... Um, and then my next question is, can you, um, do you know off the top of your head how many affordable, like actual <laughs> um, termed affordable units are in process right now? Yeah, well, roughly we have eight or nine hundred eight or nine hundred affordable units of about twenty six or twenty seven hundred um, so in in that ballpark um, if you give me a moment I can we have the map yeah I, I would say in about 400 420 of those are 100 percent affordable projects three of those are city one is a 65 unit project under development 
867. And then one of the questions I, I've gotten a lot recently is, the city doesn't build affordable housing? And can you, so there's just kind of this understanding um, of how housing is built and why we're always referring to private developers. Um, I think we need to stop and go to square one for people to understand. What, what does it take for the, for the city to build housing or for any developer to build housing to understand those steps and process and why we don't do more housing? Yeah, I think for a city and a, a city our size, it's not very typical that a city is in that development role. Um, but I, I will say in our community where there's such a commitment to housing and the cost of housing is the highest in the nation, um, there is a commitment to building it. And the challenge of what it takes, it either ta takes a city owning land where they can underwrite, just as uh, Kathy Head was mentioning earlier, there's a subsidy required mm -hmm. in order to actually build um, units in this town, particularly affordable units. So as a city, we can really leverage the funding by providing land at, f at, at no cost or less cost, as well as having a funding source, which we no longer have since 2012, um, to be able to leverage that to be competitive for state and federal funding sources. So as a city, we have been successful either through the former redevelopment agency in building over 1,800 units, and those are a, a largely over the last you know 20 years, um, those were, or 30 years, largely many of the affordable units that were built in the city. But since 2012, and we've lost that funding source, it has been a real challenge. And so we've been able to leverage in lieu fees that developers have paid um, to the city um, under our inclusionary ordinance. We've been successful in applying for state and federal grants um, in order to um, partner with affordable housing developers using city land, acquiring and assembling additional land, and that's another challenge in Santa Cruz is actually getting a site that's large enough for a housing development project because to do a multifamily housing project, which are those only ones that really are going to pencil and make sense to leverage the city funding, is you need to have roughly 20,000 square feet or a half acre. Um, and as you all know, there are very few sites in Santa Cruz that are that size anymore. So it's a matter of acquiring other sites. And many developers, you know, when they come to Santa Cruz, the cost of real estate is just too high. They don't have the ability from the profit side to look at Santa Cruz as a good risk or even to look at Santa Cruz as having opportunities unless the city or the public can come in in a meaningful way and underwrite that value for them. And I, I think one of the challenges um, that we have for developers, particularly with this next RENA cycle of 3,700 units, is that any additional sort of stress we put on our current housing environment is, is going to, you know, for a developer, when they're looking at, do we develop here or do we develop in another city? They're going to be looking at what that cost is. And if we have a higher, and this is for market rate de developers, you know, as they're looking at projects, you know, when they have other cities to choose from, it's already incredibly high uh, to build in this environment. Um, they're gonna choose another city, unless we as a city have a funding source to be able to subsidize regular developers, market rate developers coming in to meet their inclusionary requirement. Unfortunately, we just don't have that funding source now. And I would say, unless we had a meaningful funding source, like a, a substantial funding source, I would say we should be leveraging that for 100% affordable projects, then subsidizing market rate projects, meeting their inclusionary. But there's just not a way they're gonna be built otherwise in the current environment, particularly if the inclusionary rate is increased. One, one more question. How many um, how many projects would you say at the tw are, ha that we have at the twenty percent inclusionary? Right now, we have had one project that has been built at the twenty percent inclusionary. Um, the twenty percent inclusionary kicked in uh, in uh, February of 2020, I believe it is. Uh, so all the other projects are under the prior 15% um, uh, inclusionary. I, I will say, however, that we do have a number of projects that are pursuing building permits at the 20%. The so presumably, they will be moving forward um, and will have more 
Um, but um, it, there are there are still entitlements happening, um, and you know most of the projects that you see before you now um, have have come in post that 2020 change, that February 2020 change. So we are still seeing entitlements, but you know the the entitlement and the the building permit process and, and getting the financing takes a while, and so so in terms of projects, when you say how many projects have we seen. Um, we have seen a number of projects come in for entitlements, a couple more that I can think of that are, are pursuing building permits, but only one that I'm aware of under the 20% that's actually been constructed. Can I just add something to that? I'm sorry, just one comment. Yeah. And those projects are largely density bonus projects. Almost exclusively, we are seeing density bonus. Um, I, I will say, um, there's a project that um, used accessory dwelling units instead of the density bonus. It was a small project, and they used uh, three um, accessory dwelling units, which um, was almost a 30% increase. So they, while they didn't use the density bonus, they, they got additional units to help make that pencil. So thanks for that clarifying point, Kathy, because that's, that's an important one that it's only working with the density bonus or with another way to um, get additional units so that the, the actual inclusionary on the project plus the bonus or the project plus the ADUs is less than the 20%. Otherwise, um, as Kathy pointed out in her analysis, it would not be close to uh, actually being financially viable. And I just wanted to further add that that change to the 20% inclusionary coincided with AB 2030-2345 to change the density bonus to 50% from 35%. So we're also starting to see developers take advantage of that increased density bonus to, to further make up for that change in the inclusionary rate. I might, I might add one more thing to that, which is there's additional density bonus that is allowed as of this year, and um, our consultant did run the analysis based on the additional dis density bonus as well. And Kathy, if, if you wanted to speak to that, I know you looked at that and you also said that it, it did not work from a financial perspective. Right. So what I did, this is the stacking density bonus that just went into effect on January 1st. Um, you can add, um, you can get up to 100% density bonus if you fulfill, as Matt was just saying, if you get to the 50% density bonus, the most efficient way to do that is a 15% very low income requirement. If you add in a 15% moderate income requirement, you can get 100% density bonus. But the analysis I ran, there's another component of the stacking which is you can get up to approximately a 38% additional density bonus if you add 10% very low income on top of the 15, which brings you to 25%, which is coincidentally, um, it really is coincidence, it was just legislation, brings you up to what the Measure M standard would be. So I ran that analysis as 25% um, very low income using the state standards for rents which are lower than, than the standards for, the rents are lower than the standards allowed for your inclusionary requirement. I also ran, uh, with the what then became an almost 89% density bonus, I also ran a 25% scenario, which was in the presentation, where I took 15% very low income to get the 50% density bonus, which is the most efficient way to do that, again, because of the differentials in rents between the state and the city's density bonus ordinance. So I took 15% very low plus 10% Santa Cruz inclusionary low. And that 25%, while not viable, was more viable than the one with the stacking density bonus, if that makes sense. But neither of them were. What, uh, so to, to summarize, the things that you have in your report are actually more viable than going with additional density bonus. Right. I only showed in the report because uh, because the other option you had was to do 24% low income to get a 50% density bonus. But because the Santa Cruz inclusionary rents are so much higher than density bonus rents, 
that's just worse than 15%, very low, plus 10%. So I didn't want the report to be 300 pages long. So I ran them all and then gave you the most efficient ways because, again, I was trying to be as liberal as possible to getting to viability. Right, and I, I just want to be clear when I say that it's more viable, um, it was still clearly not viable. <laughs> Council was Member less Bird, bad. Further questions? Yes, I will wrap up now. No, no, I just um, don't know if you have further questions. Yes, I am. Um, to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I know the intention with this is to have more affordable housing and um, to be able to have a say on heights. That seems to be something that pe some of the people in the community. Um, really want to be able to have a say on are the heights. Is there currently a way to vote on zoning changes or heights as as um, we currently are without Measure M? Yes. All legislative acts, I'll, I'll turn to our city attorney, but uh, I'll ask him to confirm. All legislative acts of the council are subject to referendum when it comes to changing uh, uh, height um, uh, or uh, floor area ratio in our general plan or zoning. Tony, is that accurate? He's confirmed that that is the case. So um, uh, right now, you can vote on heights, uh, on changes that the council um, uh, and acts related to heights or um, FAR or, or rezonings, um, you know, any legislative act related to land use, the, the charter allows it and the state election code also allows it. And I, I, I just also wanted to say too, we, you know, we heard in some of the correspondence about democracy and things like that. And, um, our process right now is is you all, and that that is democracy. So, I just wanted to clarify that too. For the questions, Ms. Brenner. Not at this time. Good. Thank you. For the questions by members of the council, please ask your question. Quick, just to clarify the cost of the elections that my colleague was asking about. Who burdens that cost? That is the city's cost. Thank you. What we're going to do now is we're going to take 30 minutes of public testimony. We will alternate between folks who are in council and folks who are online. Is there anyone with us in the council chambers that wishes to provide testimony on this item? Good evening again, sir. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into making this report. I think it is exactly what we needed as a city to see what the financial feasibility of housing is at the current state uh, in Santa Cruz. And I really um, am grateful for the work that has been put into this. And I think it really shows a lot of the data and the numbers behind what we've been talking about uh, for, for many, many years now when it comes to housing production uh, in Santa Cruz. And one thing I did want to add in there is that um, I think when we look at affordable housing, and especially when it comes to inclusionary, we need to be making sure we can build the greatest number of affordable homes possible. We want to make sure we can get as many people in a home as possible, many families with a roof over their head. That's, that is the goal here. The goal is not to have a higher percentage, which is just a higher percentage, because you, you know, if you set the inclusionary too high, you get 25% of nothing. The goal is to build the greatest number of affordable homes. And so, I really want to stress here that maybe there's an opportunity to even um, look at updating how we calculate our inclusionary zoning policy to say on a rolling basis every two years, we should do a study like this. And we should say, what is the percentage that we should set that would generate the greatest number of affordable homes so we're not inadvertently ended up causing there not to be any homes being built at all. And because we know part of this is obviously there were projects that we're penciling at 20% uh, based on the applications, but the conditions today are far different than they were three years ago. Um, and those conditions will continually change, both with rents potentially increasing, um, both with material costs maybe going down, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different variables in what these costs looks like. So if we could, on a rolling basis every two years, find some way to calculate what that ideal percentage is to get the greatest number of affordable units, 
we could actually reflect the current market conditions every single time, make sure we don't have a situation like this where our current policy means that it is infeasible to build any housing in the city of Santa Cruz right now. So I appreciate you guys' work on this. This is a really impactful report, um, and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. We'll take first, first person online. Person online, good evening and welcome. Uh, good evening, Council Mayor Keeley. Uh, thank you for taking my comments. This is Eric Rodberg. It was a great presentation, both uh, by staff and the consultant, and great questions from council members. Um, you may or may not know, but last week, the city of Fullerton reached a settlement with uh, HCD and the attorney general because they had a they had a non-compliant housing element, and uh, basically they capitulated. And I, I would hate to see Santa Cruz be put in a similar situation. And it's really apparent from the presentation that Measure M would uh, put the city in conflict with state laws, and you know that the state's going to win. So I wonder if the city itself, because, it, it, I mean, in many ways it seems like Measure M would be illegal under state housing laws, if the city itself could challenge M judicially, maybe the city attorney could comment on that. And the, one other comment, I am so grateful that council is dealing with a very important local issue tonight in contrast to the January 9th meeting. This is your job, this is what you should be working on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good That's evening. Hello again, Mayor Keeley and council members. Elizabeth, live in the Seabright district. Um, and you know, this is very important to me because then during my day job, I actually work on affordable housing development and affordable housing policy. Um, so just coming at this from that perspective, it was really refreshing to hear the impartial analysis from Kaiser Marston. Um, it's clear that the passage of Measure M will stop all types of, of housing from being built in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, creating barriers to housing development will not magically result in more affordable housing in our city. If anything, it will lead to more displacement as the demand will still be there, but the only difference will be that the demand will be within the existing supply. So there's obviously going to be a demand supply um, shortfall there. And two, I really wanna say that effectively the passage of Measure M will serve to benefit only those who the status quo already favors. Um, there's a reason why no affordable housing developers that operate in the city of Santa Cruz are in favor of this measure. So I really think that you all should greatly take that into consideration. And it really just pains me that every single day there's people commuting an hour or two to Santa Cruz just to work minimum wage jobs here because we cannot house them. That is simply not, conscien not conscionable for our housing crisis, for our environmental crisis, our climate crisis, and just as humans. Those people deserve to be able to spend time with their family, with their children. So I strongly urge, to you, urge, urge you all to accept this report. And if you all are also voting on that tonight, to um, also recommend you to vote in favor of not supporting Measure M. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take the next person online. Good evening and welcome to the council meeting. Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor Keeley and council members, Rafa Sonnenfeld. Um, uh, like Elizabeth, I would encourage you to um, oppose Measure M or take a position from in opposition to the measure. I think we've heard loud and clear tonight um, why Measure M is bad for our community. It's a poorly thought out, poorly constructed, poorly conceived policy that frustrates the city from uh, planning for, for housing at all levels of income. Um, and uh, unnecessarily uh, uh, makes market rate housing in our community less feasible than it already is, which is not particularly feasible today. Um, we've heard about how it's likely that, um, that it would increase the risk of our community losing control of our zoning and land use altogether. Um, I think if people uh, want the city to have control over its own uh, land use and, and uh, land use authority, uh, they should be opposing Measure M. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, soon to be commissioner. Hello, 
Uh, good evening again, council members and um, Mayor Keeley. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for appointing me to the Transportation and Public Works Commission earlier tonight um, and my friends for coming to support me. Um, I want to urge you to um, take a formal stance against Measure M. Um, the measure does two things, but I'm going to speak regarding the uh, citywide voting for height limits. Um, I think having a citywide vote for mundane things like ADUs and ADU height um, limit changes and fence limit changes are a waste of taxpayer money. I think um, it's ridiculous to be making ADUs harder to build and delaying development even further when ADUs are beneficial for homeowners and renters alike. They're usually affordable. I've lived in an ADU in Live Oak and um, I really loved it. So I hope that that can be an option for students going forward, but we need to make it easier to build them, not harder. Uh, we need to increase the demand, increase the supply and the demand will go down. Right now I'm looking for housing and my options are on Craigslist and, <laughs> and um, Facebook groups and there's really like nothing out there because Zillow has really unaffordable housing that's just not realistic for me. And so I think um, once these new buildings are built that have 20% affordable housing rates and we encourage more developers to build those types of housing, I think it would give students a lot more options. And um, regarding the affordability um, rate increase, we, I think we should do a study to determine if the 25% affordability rate is feasible. I think just check generally, like, um, I don't know if yearly or just routinely to um, inquire about what the right affordability rate is for Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz City, because it could always be changing. And whether it's above the current affordability rate or below, I think we should find out so that we can make sure we're not disincentivizing developers from building more housing. Yeah, thank you so much for conducting the study. I really think that it echoes what a lot of us already felt about Measure M, and now we have evidence that um, it is not great. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take the next person online. Good evening Good and evening. welcome to the Good council evening, meeting. Good uh, evening, Mayor and Council Members, uh, Brian Meckel. Um, <laughs> Thank you for doing this study. I, like Lola just mentioned, I, it's good to put data to what all the affordable housing groups in the city already know um, and what many of us already know. Uh, like others have said, what matters here is the number of units that we produce. Getting people in housing is what we care about. If that means 10% inclusionary, great. If that means 75% inclusionary, great. This report shows that 25% just doesn't add up. Uh, math is math, and this report showed that the math for Measure M just doesn't add up. I like the idea of checking the inclusionary rate for feasibility routinely so that we are producing the maximum number of affordable housing units for our city. It's something that is incredibly important that's personal to me as a renter and many of my friends, some of who, some of who have spoken here this evening, that we're able to continue to afford to live in this city and not get pushed out. Measure M increases that possibility. For those who have said that we don't have a democratic process for determining zoning and FAR, uh, we do. I am speaking to that democratic process right now. Uh, both yourselves and staff have done an incredible job in producing and planning for housing in our city. Uh, I appreciate the engagement you had with the community during the housing element process. Again, both council and staff, uh, I believe that is something that is really important. Uh, that being engaging with the community during that process and planning for a city that can actually house people over the next eight years. Measure M would spoil this work. Measure M would have us lose local control and lose our power to actually plan for a city that we want to see here. We're in a housing crisis and Measure M would dig us deeper. Uh, I encourage you to accept this report. That's a great report. I also encourage you to oppose this measure personally so that we can continue to make real housing progress in the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Don Lane, <laughs> welcome back. Thank you very much. Thank you all council members and Mayor Keeley. Um, I really appreciate having a chance to both talk with you but also to hear that excellent presentation. 
I, as some of you know, um, I've served on the council for many years, and the city has worked with Kaiser Marston for decades mm -hmm. on affordable housing policy and affordable housing projects. And I think it's really important that people in the community understand this isn't just somebody who the staff found, oh, let's find some random consultant to tell us some story. This is, these are people who know Santa Cruz and they know affordable housing. And beyond that, what they did is they didn't just talk in broad strokes. They did the rigorous financial analysis. And that's what we need right now. Um, we can't just have, you know, I'm part of a political campaign. I'm going to talk in platitudes. But this report does not do that. Mm -hmm. This has the facts. This has the data that I think people in the community know. Um, and one of the main things that this report did was provide absolute clarity about having too high an inclusionary level is the last thing we need if we want to build affordable housing for people in this community. And as has been mentioned before, not only has Kaiser Marston take, you know, raised these concerns, several affordable housing organizations and affordable housing, nonprofit affordable housing developers have weighed in and found similar flaws with Measure M. So I just hope that voters will review this analysis and not simply accept the, the um, claims of advocates, but actually um, read this important data. Um, we have real information from people who are not political advocates. And then lastly, as was mentioned before, even if the council as a council does not choose to weigh in on this, I hope each of you, now that you've heard this information, can be really great communicators to the community about the problems that Measure M prevents and presents to this community. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you for doing, bringing Kaiser Marston in to do a great study. Thanks. Mayor Lane, I'd again be remiss if I didn't thank you for all of your good work over the years on this topic and your continuing good work with Housing Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much. We'll take the next person online. Good evening and welcome to the council meeting. We do not have anyone with their hand raised. We will welcome you, sir. Good evening. I think you might be the one we're looking for here. <laughs> good evening, council and... Uh... Good evening. Everybody else, thank you for the really great report. Uh, my name is Mike Polhamus, and uh, my wife went to uh, the new Mean Girls tonight, so I get to go out and party. Um, and here I am. And I'll keep it short so that you guys can do the same. Um, as you just heard, there is literally nothing positive about this measure. And um, it's bad from a fiscal perspective, from an environmental perspective, from an affordability perspective, from an availability perspective, there's literally nothing good about it. And I'm not going to belabor the point, but I will add um, something that doesn't usually come up in our housing conversations here is that um, Santa Cruz City Schools is projecting a 25% reduction in student attendance um, due to the loss of um, families in this community. And one of the big reasons for that is housing availability. So if Measure M was to pass, um, it would pretty much put the nail in the coffin on that. And we would not only see a major reduction in students, a major reduction in funding, but also employment, and then also all of the different structures in our community that serve youth. And so I just wanted to bring that uh, to the council's attention and also to the public. And um, again, if you can privately um, take a position against this measure, um, it would serve us not only in all the areas that I've uh, mentioned, but also with public schooling. And uh, to my knowledge, in the last housing element, Lee, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, our last housing element, we built over 50% of the units of, in total as affordable on some level. And so, you know, what we're doing is working. And since 1980, last time I checked the county housing dashboard, we added roughly 80,000 new people, but only 26,000 new units. And that is, in my eyes, the crux of the problem. So again, um, I would just really appreciate, uh, you know, the public and the council and uh, everyone opposing this measure because um, there's literally nothing good about it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul Hammers. The matter is back before the council. I'll recognize the vice mayor. 
I am pr prepared to move the um, accept the study and I would like for the council to take a formal position um, to oppose Measure M. And there's a motion. Is there a second? A second. I'll second. A second. Oh. Uh, there's lots of seconds. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I heard this one to my right first by Council Member Newsom. Madam Vice Mayor, you may open on your motion. I don't really have a lot to say that hasn't been said already. I just want to thank the members of the public that came out. And I also just would like to say there are the people that aren't in the room. Um, there is a large number of people in the community that don't want any more development. And the idea that we're trying to build more affordable housing scares them. And they don't like that. And they don't want big buildings downtown. And they don't even like the ones that have been built so far because they want Santa Cruz to stay a small town. Mm -hmm. We live in the city of Santa Cruz, not the town of Santa Cruz. And development is inevitable. And I think supporting this measure would be misguided in the evidence um, that Mr. Van Waugh brought forward with some of the cases in the local jurisdictions where builder's remedy kicked in. It would have the exact opposite effect. So whether you want affordable housing or you want Santa Cruz to stay the same, either way you want to vote no on this because we want to keep some of our local control, the little bit that the state is allowing us to have, and that is having that certified housing element, not to mention the waste of money, the, all the other things that everyone has said. So thank you. Thank you. Let me ask if there are questions, uh, excuse me, if there is debate or discussion on this item. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, well, first of all, I, I um, was, I, I guess I'll just say I'm not, uh, I'm speaking to the report because that's what's on our agenda. I'm not speaking to the measure and whether or not it should be supported or not. Um, I want to make a, and I'm going to give us a history lesson because I've been here for a little while. Um, Kaiser Marston did a similar study in 2017, at which time they persuaded the council on a 5-2 vote, I voted no, uh, to reduce the inclusionary rate in our city to 10% because that was what would pencil out. At which point the city was sued and had to settle that lawsuit. Um, it, it stopped the development of the project that zero affordable units, <laughs> unit project at Anton, the Anton project, Pacific and Laurel, uh, slowed that down considerably. And at, at the end of the day, the city council voted to increase the inclusionary back to 15%, which was the will of the voters in 1979 with um, that measure O. And, <clears throat> um, Kaiser Marston said that 10% uh, was the sweet spot, and they'll, they'll continue to say that. Um, and that's based on uh, assumptions about the cost of development, the land cost, um, et cetera. It's based, and it's based on assertions made by developers uh, without any economic um, evidence, right? actual evidence. This is all models. Um, and models are not always correct. And supply and demand is real, but supply and demand is also uh, dependent upon, I mean, th there are other factors, right, outside of just simply supply and demand. We will never build our way to affordability in a community where um, there is this, the world's largest economic engine and people making massive salaries in the private sector who can keep filling those $3,000 one-bedroom apartments that are going to get built. So I feel very strongly that um, to suggest that it cannot be done is just factually incorrect. Models may tell us this, but um, I have not seen any actual evidence other than the assertions of developers and their behaviors, which are not, that's, that's their assertion. So I just feel so strongly about this. I had to say it. Um, we then, this city council then, uh, a different city council, <laughs> for sure, um, uh, uh, increased that inclusionary to 20%. And we continue to have uh, projects in the pipeline, projects being applied for, as has been said, because of the density bonus. At a 35 to 50% density bonus, um, we get, uh, with 15%, we get like 11%, right? Somewhere around there, somewhere 9 to 11, something like that. Now we have 100% density bonus. So our 20% inclusionary means 10% inclusionary. So um, an additional 5%, I don't believe, 
I just don't believe this model is telling us the truth. So I am not in a position to support this motion. I am not speaking to the measure itself, but I, I just, I cannot, I've said it, I've been consistent about this, and, and I'm not gonna support something that says something I don't believe. So I'm sorry about that, but it's the inclusionary thing. Thank you. Would you accept that if we divided the motion? I'm not gonna support, I'm not gonna, no, no. Just don't worry about that. I'm not taking a position. Got it. For, okay. Further debate or discussion? Seeing here none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. For the business come before the council, Mr. Condotti. For yes, the, sir. For the business come before the council, Ms. No, Boyd. thank you. Seeing hearing none, a motion to adjourn to be in order. The vice mayor moves. Council member Watkins having shown up late and wanting to leave early. <laughs> second. I second that. Uh, Non-debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those motion carries and so ordered. We stand adjourned. Thanks for that. All right, I'm gonna <laughs> Yeah, I know we will. <laughs>